Chapter Seventeen of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Seventeen, in which David Thring meets an enemy. The next day David gave his attention to the letters which he found awaiting him. One was from Dr. Hoyle in Canada. He had but just returned from a visit to England, and it was full of news of David's family there. "'Your two cousins and your brother are gone with their regiments to South Africa,' he wrote. "'They are jubilant to be called to active service, as they ought to be, but your mother is heartbroken over their departure. You stay where you are, my boy. She is glad enough to have you out of England now, and far from the temptation which besets youth in times of war. It has already caused a serious bloodletting for old England. I have grave doubts about this contention. In these days there ought to be a way of preventing such disaster. Write to your mother and comfort her heart. She needs it. I was careful not to betray to her what your condition has been, as I discovered you had not done so. Hold fast and fight for health, and be content. Your recuperative power is good. David was filled with contrition as he opened his mother's letter, which was several weeks old and had come by way of Canada, since she did not know he had gone south. For some time he had sent home only casual notes, partly to save her anxiety and partly because writing was irksome to him unless he had something particularly pleasant to tell her. His plans and actions had been so much discussed at home, and he had been considered so censurably odd, so different from his relatives and friends in his opinions, and so impossible of comprehension, which branded him in his own circle at being quite at fault, that he had long ago abandoned an effort to make himself understood by them, and had retired behind his mask of reserve and silence, to pursue his own course undisturbed. Thus, at best, an occasional perfunctory letter that all was well with him was the sum total of news they received. Thring had no money anxieties for his family. The needs of his mother and his sister, not yet of age, were amply provided for by a moderate annuity, while his brother had his position in the army and help from his uncle besides. For himself, he had saved enough with his simple tastes and much hard work to tide him over this period of rest. David sat now and turned his mother's letter over and over. He read and re-read it. It was very sad. Her splendid boys both gone from her, one possibly never to return. Neither of them married and with no hope of grandchildren to solace her declining years. Stay where you are, David, she wrote. Dr. Hoyle tells us you are doing well. Don't, oh, don't enter the army. One son I have surrendered to my country service. Let me feel that I still have one on whom I may depend to care for Laura and me in the years to come. We do not need you now, but some day we may. David's quandary was how to give her as much of his confidence as filial duty required without betraying himself so far as to arouse the antagonistic comment of her immediate circle upon his course. At last he found a way. Telling her he did not know how soon he might return to Canada, he requested her to continue to address him there. He then filled his letter with loving thoughts for her and Laura, and a humorous description of what he had seen and experienced in the States and the country about him, all so foreign and utterly strange to her, as to be equal to a small manuscript romance. It was a cleverly written letter, so hiding the vital matters of his soul, which he could not reveal even to the most loving scrutiny, that all her motherly intuition failed to read between the lines. The humorous portions she gave to the rector's wife, her most intimate friend, and the dear son's love expressed therein she treasured in her heart and was comforted. Then David rode away up the mountain without descending to his little farm. He craved to get far into the very heart of the wildest parts, for with the letters 
the old conventional and stereotyped ideals seemed to have intruded into his cabin. He passed the home of Hope Ballou and stopped there to see that all was well with them. The rose vine covering the porch roof was filled with pink blossoms, hundreds of them swinging out over his head. The air was sweet with the odor of honeysuckle. The old locust tree would soon be alive with bees, for it was already budded. He took the baby in his arms, and saw that its cheeks were growing round and plump, and that the young mother looked well and happy, and he was glad. "'Take good care of them, Hoke. They are worth it,' he said to the young father, as he passed him coming in from the field. "'I will that,' said the man. "'Can you tell me how to reach a place called Wildcat Hole? I have a fancy to do a little exploring.' "'Well, it's sort of roundabout. "'I don't guess you can find it easy.' "'The man spat, as if reluctant to give the information asked, "'which only stimulated David all the more to find the spot. "'Keep right on this way, do I?' "'Yes. You keep on for a spell, "'and then you turn to the right and follow the stream for a spell, "'and you keep on following it off and on till you get there. "'You'll know it when you do get there.' but the stills all broke up. Oh, I don't care a rap about the still. Nah, I reckon not. Better light and have dinner before you go on. Azalee, keep the doctor dinner. I'm coming in a minute, he called to his wife, who stood smiling in the doorway. David willingly accepted the proffered hospitality, as he had often done before, knowing it would be well after nightfall ere he could return to his cabin, and rode back to the house. While Azalea prepared dinner, Hoke sat in the open door and held his baby and smoked. David took a splint-bottomed chair out on the porch and smoked with him, watching pleasantly the pride of the young father, who allowed the tiny fist to close tightly around his great work-roughened finger. Look at there now. See that hand? He ain't bigger than a bumblebee, and see how he can hang on. Yes said David, absently regarding them. He's a fine boy. He sure is. They ain't no finer in this mountain. Azalea came and looked down over her husband's shoulder. Don't do that away, Hulk. You'll wake him up, bobbing his arm up and down like you are doing. Hulk, he's that proud you can't touch him. You hear that, Doc? Azalea, she's that sot on him. She'd like to turn me out in the house for just looking at him. She allows he'll grow up a preacher on account of the way he can holler and thrash with his fists. But I tell her it ain't nothing but madness and devilment that gets in him. With a mother's superior smile playing about her lips, she glanced understandingly at David and went on with her cooking. As they came into the table, she called David's attention to a low box set on rockers, and taking the baby from her husband's arms, carefully placed him still asleep in the quaint nest. Hoke made that hisself, she said with pride, and Cassandry, she made that cover. Thring touched the cover reverently, bending over it, and left the cradle rocking as he sat down at Hoke's side, and began to put fresh butter between his hot biscuit, as he had learned to do. His mother would have flung up her hands in horror had she seen him doing this, or could she have known how many such he had devoured since coming to recuperate in these mountain wilds? The home was very bare and simple, but sweet and clean, and love was in it, to sit there for a while with the childlike young couple, enjoying their home and their baby, and the hospitality generously offered according to their ability, warmed David's heart, and he rode away happier than he came. With mind absorbed and idle rain, he allowed his horse to stray as he would, while his thoughts and memory played strange tricks, presenting contrasting pictures to his inward vision. Now it was his mother reading by the evening lamp, carelessly scanning a late magazine, only half interested, her white hair arranged in shining puffs high on her head, and soft lace, old lace, falling from open sleeves over her shapely arms. And Laura, red-cheeked and plump, curled feet and all in a great lounging chair, 
poring over a novel and yawning now and then, her dark hair carelessly tied, with straight straying ends hanging about her face, as he had many a time seen her after playing a game of hockey with her active, romping friends. His mother and Laura were the only ones at home now, since the big elder brother was gone. Of course they would miss him, and be sad sometimes. But Laura would enjoy life as much as ever, and keep the home bright with youth. Even as he thought of them, the room faded, and his own cabin appeared as he had seen it the day before, through the open window, with Cassandra moving about in her quiet, gliding way, haloed with light. Again he could see the picture of another room, all white and gold, with slight French chairs and tables, and couches and cushions, and candelabra of quivering crystals, with pale green walls and gold-framed paintings, and a great three-cornered piano massive and dark, where a slight fair girl sat idly playing tinkling music in keeping with herself and the room, but quite out of keeping with the splendid instrument. He saw people all about her, chatting, laughing, sipping tea, and eating thin bread and butter. He saw, as if from a distance, another man, himself, in that room, standing near the piano to turn her music, while the tinkling runs and glib, expressionless trills wove in and out, a ceaseless nothing. She spent years learning to do that, he thought, and any amount of money. Oh, well, she had it to spend, and of what else were they capable, those hands? He could see them fluttering carelessly over the keys, pink, slender, pretty. And then he saw other hands, somewhat work-worn, not small, nor yet too large, but white and shapely. Ah, of what were they not capable? And the other girl, in coarse white homespun, seated before the fire in Hope Baloo's cabin, holding in her arms the small bundle, and her smile, so rare and fleeting. He saw again the handsome, sullen youth in Bishop Tower's garden, regarding him over the hedge with narrowed eyes, and his whole nature rebelled and cried out as before, What a waste! Why should he allow it to go on? He must thrash this thing out once for all before he returned to his cabin, the right and the wrong of the case, before he should see her again, while as yet he could be engineer of his own forces, and hold his hand on the throttle to guide him safely and wisely. Could he succeed in influencing her to set her young lover's claims one side? But in his heart he knew if such a thing were possible she would not be herself. She would be another being and his love for her would cease. No, he must see her but little, and let the tragedy go on even as the bishop had said, go on as if he had never known her. As soon as possible he must return and take up his work where he could not see the slow wreck of her life. A heavy dread settled down upon him, and he rode on with bowed head until his horse stumbled and thus roused him from his reverie. To what wild spot had the animal brought him? David lifted his head and looked about him, and it was as if he had been caught up and dropped in an enchanted wood. The horse had climbed among great boulders and paused beneath an enormous overhanging rock. He heard off at one side the rushing sound of a mountain stream and judged he was near the head of Lone Pine Creek. But, oh, the wilderness of the spot! and the beauty of it, and the lonely charm. He tied his horse to a lithe limb that swung above his head, and dismounting, clambered on towards the rushing water. The place was so screened in as to leave no vista anywhere, hiding the mountains on all sides. Light green foliage overhead, where branches thickly interlaced from great trees growing out of the bank above, made a cool, lucent shadowiness all around him. There was a delicious odor of sweet shrub in the air, and the fruity fragrance of the dark, wild, wake-robin underfoot. The tremendous rocks were covered with the most exquisite forms of lichen in all their varied shades of richness and delicacy. He began carefully removing portions here and there to examine under his microscope when he noticed almost crushed under his foot a pale purple orchid 
like the one Cassandra had placed on his table. Always thinking of her, he stooped suddenly to lift the frail thing, and at the instant a rifle shot rang out in the still air, and a bullet meant for his heart cut across his shoulders like a trail of fire and flattened itself on the rock where he had been at work. At the same moment, with a bound of tiger-like ferocity and swiftness, one leaped toward him from a near mass of laurel, and he found himself grappling for life, or death, with the man who fired the shot. Not a word was spoken. The quick, short breathing and scuffling of feet among the leaves, and the snapping of dead twigs underfoot were the only sounds. Had the youth been a trained wrestler, David would have known what to expect, and would have been able to use method in his defense. As it was, he had to deal with an enraged creature who fought with the desperate instinct of an antagonist who fights to the death. He knew that the odds were against him, and felt rising within him a wild determination to win the combat, and thinking only of Cassandra, to settle thus the vexed question, to fight with the blind passion and the primitive right of the strongest to win his mate. He gathered all his strength, his good English metal and nerve, and grappled with a grip of steel. This way and that, twisting, turning, stumbling on the uneven ground, with set teeth and faces drawn and fierce, they struggled. And all the time the light tweed coat on David's back showed a deeper stain from his heart's blood, and his face grew paler and his breath shorter. Yet a joy leaped within him. It was thus he might save her, either to win her or to die for her, for should Freyo kill him, she would turn from him in hopeless horror, and David, even in dying, would save her. Suddenly the battle ended. Thring's foot turned on a rounded stone, causing him to lose his foothold. At the same instant, with terrible forward impetus, Frail closed with him, bending him backward, until his head struck the lichen-covered rock. The purple orchid was bruised beneath him, and its color deepened with his blood. Then Frail rose, and looked down upon the pallid, upturned face, and inert body which lay as he had crushed it down. As he stood thus, a white figure, bareheaded and alone, came swiftly through the wall of laurel which hid them, and pausing terror-stricken in the open space, looked from one to the other. For an instant Cassandra waited thus, as if she too were struck dead where she stood. Then she looked no more on the fallen man, but only at Frail, with eyes immovable and yet withdrawn, as if she were searching in her own soul for a thing to do, while her heart stood still and her throat closed. Those great gray eyes, with the green sea depths in them, began to glow with a cruel light, as if she too could kill as if they were drawing slowly from the deep well of her being, as it were, a sword from its scabbard wherewith to cut him through the heart. Her hand stole to her throat and pressed hard. Then she lifted it high above her head and held it, as if in an instant more one might see the invisible sword flash forth and strike him. Frail cried out then, Don't! Don't curse me, Cass! and lifted his arm to shield his face, while great beads of moisture stood out on his face. "'It's not for me to curse, Frail,' her voice was low and clear. "'Curses come from hell, like what you've been carrying in your heart that made you do this.' Her voice grew louder, and her hand trembled and shut, as if it grasped something. "'I take it back, back from God, the promise I gave you there by the fall.' Then looking up, her voice grew low again, though still distinct. I take that promise back forever, O oh God. Her hand dropped. The cruel light died slowly out of her eyes, and she turned and knelt by the prostrate man, and began pulling open his coat. Frail took one step toward her. Cass, he said with shaking voice, I'll help you. Her hands clenched into David's coat as she held it. Go back. Don't you touch even his least finger, she cried, looking up at him from where she knelt, like a creature hurt to the heart, defending its own. You've done your work. Take your face where I never can see it again. He stood still and looked down on her. 
she turned again to David, and thrusting her hand into his bosom, drew it forth with blood upon it. I say to you, Frale, she cried, holding it toward him, quivering with the ferocity she could no longer restrain. Leave here, or with this blood on my hand, I'll call all hell to curse you. Frale turned with bowed head and left her there. End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the mountain girl this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mary herndon bell the mountain girl by payne erskine chapter 18 in which david thring awakes thring lay in hope Baloo's cabin not in the one great living room where were the fireplace and the large bed and the tiny cradle but in the smaller addition at the side entered only from the porch which extended along the front of both parts he still lay on the litter upon which he had been placed to carry him down the mountain an improvised thing made by stretching quilts across two poles of slender green pines the litter was placed on low trestles to raise it from the floor and close to the open door to give him air. David had not regained consciousness since his hurt, but lay like one dead, with closed eyes and blanched lips, yet they knew him to be living. Cassandra sat beside him alone. All night long she had been there, unsleeping, hollow-eyed, and worn with tearless grief. She had done all she knew how to do. Before going for help she had removed his clothing and bound about his body strips torn from her dress to stop the bleeding of his shoulders where the silver bullet had torn across them. How the ball had missed giving a mortal wound was like a miracle. Hulk Baloo had tried to arouse him, but had failed. At intervals during the night Cassandra had managed to drop a little whiskey between his lips with a spoon, and she had bathed him with a stimulant over heart and lungs, and chafed his hands, and had tried to warm his feet by rubbing them and wrapping them up between jugs of hot water. She had bathed his bruised head and cut away the soft curling hair from the spot where his head had struck the rock. What more she could do she knew not, and now she sat at his side while chafing his hands and waiting for Hoke Baloo's return. Hoke had gone to the station to telegraph for Bishop Towers. Fortunately, as the hotel was so soon to be open, and the busy summer life to begin, the operator was already there. Azalea, in the great room, was preparing dinner, stopping now and then to touch her baby's cradle, or to stoop a moment over the treasure therein. Aunt Sally sat in the doorway smoking her cob pipe, and telling gruesome tales of how she had seen people herded that away and never come out in it. Sally had ridden over to give help and sympathy, but Cassandra had said she would watch alone. She had eaten nothing since the day before, only sipping the coffee Azalea had brought her. It was one of those breathless hours before a rain, when not a leaf stirs. Even the birds were silent. Cassandra tried once more to give David a few drops of the whiskey, and this time it seemed as if he swallowed a little. She thought she saw his eyelids quiver and her heart pounded suffocatingly in her breast. She dropped beside him on her knees, and once again tried to give him the only stimulant they had. This time she was sure he took it, and still kneeling there, she bowed her head and pressed her lips upon the hand she had been chafing. Did it move or not? She could not tell, and again she sat gazing in the still, white face. Oh, the suspense! Oh, the joy that was agony! If this were truly the awakening, and meant life! In her intensity of longing for some further signs, she drew slowly nearer and nearer, until at last her lips touched his. Then in shame she hid her face in the quilt at his side, and weak with the exhaustion of her long anguish in fasting and watching, she wept the first tears. Tears of hope, 
she was not strong enough to bear. As she thus knelt, weeping softly, his fluttering eyelids lifted, and he saw her there, and felt the quivering hand beneath his head. Not understanding how or why this should be, he waited perfectly still, trying to gather his thoughts. A great peace was in his heart, a peace and content so sweet he did not wish to move. Lingering beneath this content, he held a dim memory of a great anger, a horror of anger, when he saw red and hungered for blood. Vaguely, it seemed to him now that all was as he wished it to be with Cassandra near. He liked to feel her hand beneath his head, and her other hand upon his own, and her heavy bronze hair so close, and he closed his eyes once more to shut out all else, for the room was strange to him, this raftered place all whitewashed from ceiling to floor. He had forgotten what had happened, but Cassandra was there, and he was content. Something had touched his lips and brought him back, he was sure of that, and his weakly beating heart stirred to more vigorous action. He turned his head a little, a very little, toward her, and his fingers closed about her hand to hold it there. She lifted her head then, and they looked into each other's eyes, a long, deep look. Later, when Azalea entered, she found them both sleeping, Cassandra's hand still beneath his head, his face pressed to her soft hair, and his free arm flung about her. Azalea stole away and hurried with the news to old Sally who also crept in and looked on them and stole away. Yes, she sure have saved his life, said Sally. Heap of times they never do come out in that thar kind of sleep. I done seen such before. If he have come to hisself, you reckon I better wake him up and give him a little hot milk? She ain't eat nothing since yesterday. Nah, leave him be. Nobody never ain't starved in his sleep yet, I reckon. He ain't eat nothing neither. He sure have been bad herded. The two women sat in the large room and talked in low tones, while at intervals Azalea crept to the door and looked in on them. At last the baby wailed out with lusty cry, which sounded through the stillness of the house and roused Cassandra. But as she lifted her head, David clung to her and drew her cheek to his lips. "'Are you hurt?' he murmured. In some strange way he had confused matters, and thought it was she who had been shot. "'It's not me that's hurt,' she said tenderly. Azalea hurried away and returned with the warm milk she had prepared for Cassandra, who took it and held it to David's lips. "'Drink it, doctor. She won't touch anything till you do.' Then he obeyed, slowly drinking it all, his eyes fixed on Cassandra's as a child looks up to his mother. As she rose, he held her with his free hand. What is it? How long? His voice sounded thin and weak. Strange. I can't lift this arm at all. Tell me. Seems like I can't. When you are strong again, I will. Feebly he tried to raise himself. Don't, oh, don't, Dr. Thring. If you bleed again, you'll die, she wailed. Sit near me. She drew a low chair and sat near him, as she had through the slow and anxious hours, and again he drowsed off, only to open his eyes from time to time, as if to assure himself that she was still there. Again Azalea brought her milk and white beaten biscuit, hot and sweet, and Cassandra ate. When David opened his eyes to look at her, she smiled on him, and would not let him talk to her. Nevertheless, his mind was busy trying to understand why he was lying thus, and dimly the events of the last few days came back to him, shadowy and confused. When he looked up and saw her smile, his heart was satisfied, but when he closed his eyes again, a strange sense of tragedy settled down upon him. But what or why, he knew not. Suddenly he called to her, as if from his sleep. "'Have I killed someone?' And there was horror in his voice. "'No, no, Dr. Thring. You been nigh about killed yourself. Oh, why didn't I send for a doctor who could do you right? 
Bishop Towers won't know anything about this. What have you done? I sent for Bishop Towers. Who did me up like this? She was silent, and rising quickly stepped out on the porch, her cheeks flaming crimson. Yesterday, in her terror and frenzy, she could have done anything, but now, with his eyes fixed on her face so intently, she could not reply nor tell how alone she had stripped him to the waist and bound him about with the homespun cotton of her dress to stanch the bleeding before hurrying down the mountain for help. Instinctively, she had done the right thing, and had done it well, but now she could not talk about it. David tried to call after her, but she had gone around into the next room and taken the baby from his cradle where he was wailing his demands for attention. Azalea had gone out for a moment, and Aunt Sally loud there weren't no use spiling him by taking him up every time he fretted for it. It would do him good to holler a stretch. So she sat still and smoked. Cassandra walked up and down the porch, comforted by the feeling of the child in her arms. The small head bobbed this way and that until she pressed it against her cheek and held him close, and he gradually settled down on her bosom, his face tucked softly in the curve of her neck, and slept. She heard David speaking her name and went to him, but he only looked up at her and smiled. I'm sorry I left you alone, she said tenderly. I'll call Aunt Sally. No, wait. I only want to look at you. She stood swaying her lithe body to rock the sleeping child. David thought he had never seen anything lovelier. How serious his wounds were, he did not know. But one thing he knew well, and to that one thing he clung. He wanted Cassandra where he could see her all the time. He wished she would talk to him, and not let him lose consciousness, relapsing into the horror of a strange dream that continued to haunt him. Do you love that baby? he asked, his voice faint and high. He's a right nice baby. I say, do you love him? Why, I reckon I do. Don't try to move that way, doctor. You may not be done right, and you'll bleed again. Oh, we don't know. We are so ignorant, Azalea and me. He smiled. Nothing matters now, he said. They heard voices, and she looked out from the doorway. It's Hoke. They've sent old Dr. Bartlett. I'm so glad. Ain't Sally. I reckon they'll need hot water. Get some ready, will you? Cassandra. Cassandra, called David almost irritably. She came back to him. Where are they? Down the road a piece. I'm glad. You'll be done right now. Stoop to me. She obeyed, and the free arm caught and held her, then, as the voices drew near, released her with glowing eyes and burning cheeks. She stepped out on the porch to meet them, half hiding her face behind the babe in her arms, and old Dr. Bartlett, as he looked on her with less prejudiced and more experienced eyes, thought he, too, never had seen anything lovelier. "'He's awake,' said Cassandra quietly to Hoke and the two men went to David. She carried the child back and asked Aunt Sally to wait on them while she sat down in the low splint rocker, clinging to the little one and listening with throbbing nerves to the voices in the room beyond. When Hoke came out to them a moment later, Azalea began eagerly to question him, but Cassandra was silent. Doctor says we better tote him over to his own place today. Ain't Sally allows she can bide there for a while and see him well again. You ain't going to allow that, be you, Hoke? It might look like we weren't willing for him to bide along of us. It ain't what looks like. It's what's best for him, said Hoke sagely. Whatever doctor says, we'll do. Then Hoke laughed quietly. He done told Dr. Bartlett that he reckoned somebody must have took him from some sort of wild critter and shot him by mistake. I guess Frail's safe enough from him if the fool boy only knowed it. Frail, he's plumb crazy, the way he been a-actin', says Azalea. And Bishop Towers, he telegraphed that he'd send this here doctor, and he'd come up tomorrow with Miss Towers to stop over with you, 
"'so I reckon your ma wants you down there, Cass.' "'Cassandra rose quickly "'and placed the sleeping child gently in his cradle-box. "'I'll go,' she said. "'There's no need for me here now. "'Hoke, you've been right good.' "'She stopped abruptly and turned to his wife. "'I must wear your dress off, Azalee, "'but I'll send it back by Hoke as soon as it's been washed.' "'She went out the door, almost as if she were eager to escape. "'Hain't you going to wait for your horse?' said Hoke, laughing. Set a minute till I fetch him. I clean forgot, she said, and when he had left, she turned to her friend. Azalee, don't say anything to Hoke about me, us. Did Aunt Sally see? You know I didn't know myself until I woke and found myself there. I'd been trying to make him take a little whiskey, and I must have gone asleep like I was. And he woke up, and must have felt like he had to kiss somebody. He was that glad to be alive. Never you fret, child. Azalee smiled a quiet smile. I'm not one to talk. Anyway, I reckon Dr. Thring's about right. He sure have been good to me. The widow sat on her little stoop, waiting and watching as her daughter rode to the door and wearily alighted. Cassandra Berlin, for the Lord's sake, what all is up now? Hoyle, where is that boy? Hoyle, come here and take the horse for sister. Be you most dead, honey? I reckon you be. You look like it. Cassandra kissed her mother and passed on into the house. I couldn't send you word last night. Anyway, I reckon you'd rest better if you didn't know, for we all thought Dr. Thring was sure killed. Did Hope tell you this morning? I allowed you was stopping with Azalee. That baby was sick or something. When Hoyle came up to the cabin and said doctor weren't there. Frail sure have done for hissel. I reckon you're a clear shed of him now, and I glad you be since he took to the idea of marrying with you. What all have he done the doctor this away for? There weren't nothing twixt him and the doctor. Poor fool boy he. I'll be glad for your sake, Cass, if he'll quit these here mountains. Oh, mother, mother. Don't talk about me. Don't think of me. The doctor's nigh about killed, let alone the sin Frail has on him now. Wearied beyond further endurance, she flung herself on her bed and broke into uncontrollable sobbing while Hoyle stood in the middle of the room and gazed with wide-eyed wonder. Be the doctor dead, Ma? he asked in an awed whisper. No, child, no. You fetch a little light and chips, and we'll make her some coffee. Sister's that tired, poor child. Have you been up all night, Cass? She nodded her head and still sobbed on. He's getting on all right now, be he? Again she nodded, but did not take her hands from her face. Then you'd ought to be glad. It ain't like Frail had a killed him. Farwell, he had many a time such as this with one and another, and he never come to no harm from it. I reckon Frail will be safe. Be a crying for him, Cass. Poor child. I never did think you cared for Frail that way. Then Cassandra burst forth with impetuous fire. Oh, mother, mother, never say that name to me again. Mother, I saw them. I saw them fighting, and all the time the doctor was bleeding, bleeding and dying where Frail had shot him. I don't know how long they'd been fighting, but I came there and I saw them. I saw him slip, and how Frail crushed him down, down, and how his head struck the rock. I saw, and I almost cursed Frail. I hope I didn't. Oh, I hope not. But mother, mother, don't ask me anything more now. Oh, I want to cry. I want to cry and never stop. While she lay thus weeping, the soft rain that had been threatening all day began pattering down, blessed and soothing, the rain to the earth and the tears to the girl. In spite of the rain, Thring was carried home that afternoon, according to the physician's orders, and placed in his cabin with Aunt Sally to stand guard over him and provide for his wants. A bed was improvised for her on the floor of the cabin, while David lay in his own bed in his canvas room, 
bandaged about both body and head, and with all moderately comfortable, sufficiently himself to realize what had occurred, and overjoyed because of the reward his wounds had brought him. Dr. Bartlett came down to the fall place, and was given the bed in the loom shed as David had been, and had the pleasure of again seeing Cassandra, who, her tears dried and her manner composed, looked after his needs as if no storms had ever shaken her soul. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Nineteen, in which David sends Hoke below on a commission, and Cassandra makes a confession. Early one morning, Hoke Bellew put his hand at the door of Thring's cabin, where Aunt Sally was squatted before the fireplace, preparing breakfast for the patient. "'How's Doc?' he asked. "'He's right far. He mount be worse, and he mount be better. "'You reckon I mount go in yonder war he's at? "'Ye can look and see he's awake. I'm getting his hot bread and coffee.' You better buy and have a little, she said, with ever ready hospitality. He crossed the floor with careful steps and paused in the doorway of the canvas room, big and smiling. That you, Hoke? Come in, said David cheerfully. He extended a hand, which Hoke took in his and held awkwardly, shocked at the white face before him. You do look puny he said at last, but we uns sure be glad you're livin. You told me to come early, so I come. It's awfully good of you. Bring a chair and sit near so we can talk a bit. Now, Hoke, laid up here as I am, I need your help. I want to send you to Farrington or Lone Pine, somewhere. I don't know where such things are to be had, but, Hoke, you've been married and know all about what's needed here. Ye want me to get ye a license, I reckon, said Hoke, grinning. And ye mont send me a errant. I'd like a heap worse, that's so. But what good will it be to ye now? You can't stand on your feet. I can put it under my pillow and keep it to get well on. See here, Hoke, I don't even know if she'll marry me. She has not said so, but I'll be ready. You keep this quiet for me, Hoke because it would trouble her if the whole mountainside should know what I have done before she does. Yet a girl like Cassandra is worth winning if you have to go to the edge of the grave to do it, so whenever she will have me, I want to be ready. They talked in low tones, Hoke leaning forward close to David, his elbows on his knees. I reckon you're a-thinking to bide on here long a weans and not carry her off nowhere else, he asked gravely. David's paleness left him for a moment, as the warm tide swept up from his heart. My home is not in this country, and wherever a man goes he expects to take his wife with him. Don't you people here in the mountains do the same? I reckon so, but it would nigh about kill Zaley if she were to lose Cass. They've been friends ever since they were little uns. Hoke, if you were to find it necessary to go away anywhere, would you leave your wife behind to please Cassandra Merlin? The man was silent, and David continued. Before you were married, if you had known there was another man, and a criminal at that, hanging around determined to get her, wouldn't you have married her out of hand as soon as you could get her consent? It's my opinion, knowing the sort of man you are, that you would. I sure would. Then you can understand why I wish to have a marriage license under my pillow. I reckon so. But you, you all hain't our kind. 
not being kin to none of us you understand me sir we uns are a proud people here and we think a heap o our women it will be right hard should you get sort o' tired o cassandry when you come to get her amongst your people being she ain't like none o your folks understand and cassandry she sort o hard hit just now she don't rightly know what all she do think me and azaley we be speakin right smart together and well we do sure think a heap o you doc and it ain't no disrespect to you uns neither have you said anything to her ma not a word when i learned another man was before me i stood one side as an honorable man should and gave him his chance but when it comes to being attacked by the other man and shot in the back by heaven no power on earth will hold me from trying to win her as for the other matter never you fear be my friend hoke well i reckon you'll have your own way and i mount as well get it for ye but i did promise azaley at i'd speak that word to ye said the young man rising with an air of relief tell your wife that you are both of you quite right and that i am right also just hunt up my trousers will you i want my pocket-book if i have to sign anything before anybody bring em here i don't care what you do so you get it there on that card you have it all my full name and all that you know david tried to eat what sally prepared for him using his unbound hand but his egg was hard his coffee thick and boiled he could not drink it very well for his head was too low and he could not raise himself so he lay silent and uncomfortable watching her move about his rooms wearing her great black sunbonnet she appeared kindly and pleasant when he could see her face which was thin and very much lined but motherly and good he fell in the way of calling her aunt sally as others did and this seemed to please her she treated him as if he were a big boy who did not know what was good for himself she called all the green blossoming things with which cassandra had adorned the cabin thrash and asked who had toted hit thar waiting and listening sure cassandra would not leave him all day without coming to him even though aunt sally had taken him in charge david's mind was full of her if he closed his eyes he saw her if he opened them and watched sally's meagre form and black sunbonnet moving about he thought what it might be to see cassandra there he could not and would not look at the future the picture hope blue had summoned up when he had suggested the taking of cassandra away among people alien to her he put from him he would not see it or think of it the present was his and it was all he had perhaps all he ever would have and now he would not allow one little joy of it to escape him he would be greedy of it and have all the gladness of the moments as they came he could see her down below making ready for their visitors and he knew she would not come until the last task was done but meantime his patience was wearing away aunt sally finished her work and david could see her from where he lay seated in the doorway with her pipe looking out on the gently falling rain without all was very peaceful only within himself was turmoil and impatience but he knew that to remain calm and unmoved was to keep back his fever and hasten recuperation so he closed his eyes and tried to live for the moment in the remembrance of that awakening when he had found her kneeling at his side thus he dropped to sleep and again when he awoke he found cassandra there as if in answer to his silent call she was seated quietly sewing as if it were no unusual thing for her to visit him thus and when his earnest gaze caused her to look up she only smiled without perturbation and came to him 
I sent Aunt Sally down to see Mother while I could stay by you and do for you a little, she said. Calm and restful she seemed, yet when he extended his free hand and took hers, he felt a tremor in her touch that delighted his heart. He brought it to his lips. I've been needing you all morning. Aunt Sally has done everything all she could. If I should let you have this hand again, would you go so far away from me that I could not reach you? Not if you want me near. Then put away your sewing and bring your chair close to me, and let us talk together while we may. She obeyed and sat, looking away from him, out through the open door. Were her eyes searching for the mountain top? You have thoughts, sweet, big thoughts, dear girl. Put them in words for me now, while we are so blessedly alone. I can't say rightly what I think. Seems like if I had some other way, something besides words to tell my thoughts with, I could do better. But words are all we have, and seems like when I want them most they won't come. That's the way with all of us. Don't you see you are still beyond my reach? Come, if you can't tell your thoughts in words, give them by the touch of your hands as you did a moment ago. She did as he bade her, leaning forward, took his hand in both her own. That's right. I'll teach you how to tell your thoughts without words. Now, how came you to find us the other day? I don't know myself. It was a strange way. First, I rode down to Teasley's mill to, to try to persuade them, Giles Teasley, to allow him to go free. She paused and put her hand to her throat, as was her way. I think, Dr. Thring, I'd better build up the fire and get you some hot milk. Dr. Bartlett said you must have it often, and to keep you very quiet. Not until you tell me now, this moment, what I ask you. You went to the mill to try to help Frail out of his trouble. Cassandra, have you loved that boy? Her face assumed its old look of mask-like impassivity. I reckoned he might hold himself steady and do right, would they only leave him be and give him the chance. Cassandra, answer me. Was it for love of him that you gave him your promise? Her face grew white, and for a moment she bowed her head on his hand. Please, Dr. Thring, let me tell you the strange part first. Then you can answer that question in your own way. She lifted her head and looked steadily in his eyes. You remember that day we went to Kate Irwin's, when we came to the place where we can see far, far over the mountains? I laughed with something glad in my heart. It was the same this time when I got to that far open place. All at once it seemed like I was so free free from the heavy burden, and all in a kind of light that was only the same gladness in my heart. I stopped there and waited and thought how you said that time, it's good just to be alive, and I thought if you were there with me and should put your hand on my bridle as you did that night in the rain, and if you should lead me away off, even into the valley of the shadow of death, into those deep shadows below us I would go and never say a word. All at once it seemed as if you were doing that, and I forgot frail and kept on and on, and wherever it seemed like you were leading me, I went. It seemed like I was dreaming, or feeling like a hand was on my heart, a hand I could not see, pulling me and making me feel this way. This way, I must go this way. I never had been where my horse took me before. I didn't think how I could ever get back again. I didn't seem to see anything around me, 
only to go on, 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 and at last it seemed I couldn't go fast enough, until all at once I came to your horse tied there, and I heard strange trampling sounds a little farther on where my horse could not go, and I got off and ran. I fell and got up and ran again, and it seemed as if my feet wouldn't leave the ground, but only held me back. It seemed like they hadn't any more power to run, and then I came there and I saw. She paused, covering her face with her hand as if to shut out the sight, and slipped to her knees beside him. Oh, I saw your faces, all terrible. He put his arm about her and drew her close. I saw you fall, and your face when it seemed like you were dying as you fought. I saw. Her sobs shook her, and she could not go on. My beautiful priestess of good and holy things, he said. She leaned to him then, placing her arms about him, ever mindful of his hurt. She lifted his head to her shoulder. The floodgates of her reserve once lifted, the full tide of her intense nature swept over him and enveloped him. It was as light to his soul and healing to his body. How often it had seemed, as if he saw her with that halo of light about her, and now it was as if he had been drawn within its charmed radius, as surely he had. And then, dear, what did you do? I thought you were killed, and almost, almost I cursed him. I hope now I wasn't so wicked, but I... I called back from God the promise I had given him. And then? Tell me all the blessed truth, and then? You were bleeding, bleeding, and I took off your clothes, and I saw where you were bleeding your life away, and I tied my dress around you. I tore it in pieces and wound it all around you as well as I could, and then I put your coat back on you, and still you didn't waken. It seemed as if you had stopped breathing. And then I saw the bruise on your head, and I thought maybe you were only stunned. I brought water from the branch and put your head on the wet cloth and bound it all around, but still you looked like he had killed you. And then he stirred in her arms to feel their clasp. And then then I went for help, she said, in so low a tone it seemed hardly spoken. First you did something you have not told me. She waited in a sweet shame he recognized and gloried in, but he wanted the confession from her lips. And then you said you would teach me to say things without words, she said tremulously. Not now. Later. Put everything you did in words. And then? I thought you were dying. She drew in a long, sighing breath. And you kissed me. I have a right to know, for I missed them all. I did. I did, she cried vehemently. A hundred times I kissed you. I had called my promise back from God, and I dared it. I wasn't ashamed. I would have done it if all the mountainside had been there to see. But afterwards, when that strange doctor from Farrington came, and I knew he must uncover you and find my torn dress around you, somehow then I felt I didn't want for him to look at me, and I was glad to go away. Do you want to know what he said when he saw it? Whoever did this kept you alive, young man. So you see how you are my beautiful bringer of good. You are, oh, I have only one arm now. I am at a disadvantage. When I can stand on my feet, I will pay them all back those kisses you threw away on me then. 
we shan't need words then dearest i'll teach you the sweetest lesson your arms tremble they're tired dear could you let your head rest here and sleep as you did the other day to think how i woke and found you beside me sleeping let me go now i have things i ought to do for you not yet i have things i must say to you please dr thring my name is david you must call me by it please dr david let me go why to warm some milk i brought it up for you pity we must eat to live then if i let you take your arms away will you come back to me yes i'll bring the milk there go i'm giving you your own way because i know i will recover the sooner the strength i have lost a man flat on his back but with one arm free is no good but you don't let me go listen cassandra you brought me back to life do you know what for what did your father tell you that one should be sent for you it is i dearest from away over on the other side of the earth i have come for you we fought like beasts frail and i i had given you up you cassandra had said in my heart i will go away and leave her to the one she has chosen if that be right and even at that moment frail shot me and sprang upon me and i fought i was glad the chance was given me there in the wilderness in that old and primitive way to settle it and win you i put all the force and strength of my body into it and more all the strength of my love for you it was with that in my heart we clinched i said i will fight to the death for her she shall be mine whether i live or die stop crying sweet be glad as i am give thanks that it was to the life and not to the death listen once more while i can feel and know give way to your great heart of love and treat me as you did after you had bound up my wounds learn the sweet lesson i said i would teach you late that evening hope bellew ran up to the door of david's cabin and called aunt sally out to speak with him how's doc he's doing right well he's asleep now won't ye light and come in i reckon not azalie she's been alone all day and i guess she'll be some feared will you put that thar under doc's pillow whar he can find it in the morning it's a paper he sent me for tell him i reckon it's all straight he can see them people cassandra was expectin from farrington did they come by to-day yas they come they're down to miss farewell's will you tell doc at azalie and me we'll be here long levin in the mornin hoke rode off under the winking stars for the clouds after the long day of rain had lifted and in the still night were rolling away over the mountain tops aunt sally slipped quietly back into the cabin and softly closed the door of the canvas room lest the rustling of paper should waken her charge for she meant to examine that paper quite innocently since she could neither read nor write but out of sheer childish curiosity she need not have feared waking david however for all his physical discomfort forgotten dominated by the supreme happiness that possessed him yet weak in body to the point of exhaustion he slept profoundly and calmly on even when she came stealthily and slipped the paper beneath his pillow as hoke had requested end of chapter 19
Chapter Number Twenty of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Twenty, in which the bishop and his wife pass an eventful day at the fall place do you know james said betty towers as she walked at her husband's side in the sweet morning slowly climbing up to david's cabin from the fall place i feel almost vexed with you for never bringing me here before why my dear yes i do to think of all this loveliness and for six years you've been here many times and never once told me you knew a place hardly two hours away as entrancing as heaven even now james if it hadn't been for cassandra i wouldn't have come why it's the loveliest spot on earth stand still a minute james and listen that's a thrush oh something smells so sweet it's a locust and that's a redbird's note there he is like a red blossom in those bushes there no there you will look in the wrong direction james and now he's gone you remember what david thring wrote it's good just to be alive he's always saying that and now i understand in such a place as this oh just breathe the air james i certainly can't help doing that dear the bishop was puffing a little over the climb his slight young wife took so easily I don't care. Here I've lived in the cities all my life, while you have lived down here, and it has lost its charm to you. Only think of all this gorgeous display of nature just for these mountain people, and what it is to them. To them it's the natural order of things, just as you implied in regard to me. Hark, James, now that's a catbird. And not a thrush? The other was a thrush. I know the difference wise little woman come there's that young man getting up a fever by fretting we said i said we would come early james i'm going to stay up here and let you go to that stupid wedding down in farrington without me perhaps we have something interesting up here if you'll hurry a little what is it james i can't really say dear she took his hand and they walked on wouldn't this be an ideal spot to spend a honeymoon? Hear that fall away down below us? How cool it sounds. Why don't you pay attention to me? What are you thinking about, James? I'm making a little poem for you, dear. Listen. Chatter, chatter, little tongue. What a wonder how you're hung. Up above the epiglottis. Tied on with a little nodus. Only geniuses may be silly, James, but perhaps you can't help it. I think married people ought to establish the custom of sabbatical honeymoons to counteract the divorce habit. Suppose we set the example. Now we have arrived at just the right time for one. And spend ours here. Anything you say, dear. Being an absent-minded man, the bishop had fallen in the way of saying that, when— had he paused to think, he would have admitted that everything was made to bend to his will or wish by the spirited little being at his side. Moreover, being an absent-minded man, he drew her to him and kissed her. Aunt Sally, watching them from the cabin door, wondered if the bishop were going away on a journey to leave his wife behind, for why else should he kiss her thus? "'Will you sit there on the rock and enjoy the mountains while I see how he is?' said the bishop. So they parted at the door, and Aunt Sally brought her a chair and stood beside her, giving her every detail of the affair as far as she knew it. She sat bareheaded in the sun, to Sally's amazement, for she had her hat in her lap and could have worn it. 
the wind blew wisps of her fine straight hair across her pink cheeks and in her eyes as she gazed out upon the blue mountains and listened to sally's tale of how it all come about for sally went back into the family history of the teasleys and the caswells and the merlins and the farewells until betty forgot the flight of time and the bishop called her then she went in to see david he had worked his right hand free from its bandages and was able to lift it a little she took it in hers and looked brightly down at him dr thring you look better than when you were in farrington doesn't he james aunt sally gave me to understand you were nearly dead david laughed happily i was but i'm very much alive now i'm to be married mrs towers our wedding is to be quite come il faut. It is to be at high noon, and the ceremony performed by a bishop. James! Betty dropped into a chair and looked helplessly at her husband. You haven't your vestments here. I have all I need, dear. You know, doctor, from Mr. Below's telegram, we were led to expect. A death instead of a wedding, David finished. Betty turned to him. Why didn't you tell us when you were down? You never gave the slightest hint of your state of mind. And there I was with my heart aching for Cassandra, when you, you stood ready to save her. I'm so glad for Cassandra. I could hug you, Dr. Thring. Suddenly she turned on her husband, James. Have you thought of everything, all the consequences? What will his mother and the family over in England say? James threw up his hand and laughed. Don't laugh, James. Have you thought this all out, doctor? Are you sure you can make them understand over there? Won't they think this is awfully irregular? Will they ever be reconciled? I know how they are. My father was English they never need be reconciled it's our affair and there's nothing to call me back there to live what i do or whom i make my wife is nothing to them i may visit my mother of course but for the rest they gave me up years ago when i had no use for the life they mapped out for me i have nothing to inherit there it would go to my older brother anyway i may follow my own inclination thank god and as for its being irregular, on the contrary, we are distinguished enough to have a bishop perform the ceremony. That will be considered a great thing at home, when they do come to hear of it. But it is very sudden, doctor. I suppose that's why I said irregular. Betty Towers paused a moment with a little frown, then laughed outright. Does Cassandra know she is to be married today? She learned the fact yesterday, incidentally, bless her, and her only objection was a most feminine one. She had no proper dress. She said she was wearing her best when she found me, but I told her the trousseau was to come later. Betty rose with impulsive importance. Well, James, we've so little time, I must go and help her prepare. And you'll rest now, won't you, doctor? You stay up here with him, James, and I'll find some way of sending your things up. Thar's Hoyle. He can help a piece. He can ride the mule and tote anything ye like. And Slarthy, I reckon ye can get her up here on my horse. It's thar at her place, said Sally, who had been standing in the doorway, keenly interested. When they were alone, she said to David, it's a right queer way o' doin' things, gettin' married in bed. But if Bishop does do it, it sure must be all right, lestways Cassandra'll think so. David took the superintendence of the arrangement of his cabin upon himself, and Hoke Ballou, with the bishop's aid, carried out his directions. One side of his canvas room was rolled to the top, leaving the place open to the hills, and the beauty without. His bed was placed so that he might face the open space, and that Cassandra could kneel at his right side, his writing-table 
draped with a white cloth and covered with green hemlock boughs formed the altar it was all very quickly and simply done and then david lay quiet with closed eyes listening to his musicians in the treetops fluting their own gladness while hoke below went down below and the bishop sat out on the rock and meditated cassandra came up to the cabin alone and sat with david while the bishop donned his priestly vestments and the wedding procession wound slowly up the trail from the fall place decorously and gravely clad in their best azalea and betty came side by side the mother rode sally's speckled white horse and little hoyle ran on ahead hoke carried his baby in his arms behind them all rode uncle jerry carew full of the liveliest interest and curiosity said david this is may day i know what they're doing at home now if the weather will let them they're having gay times with out-of-door feats the country girls are wearing their prettiest gowns and the men are wearing sprigs of may in their buttonholes where did you get your roses azalee brought them who put them in your hair? Mrs. Toas did that. Do you like me this way? You are the loveliest being my eyes ever rested on. This was my best dress last year. I did it up and mended it this morning. It's home woven like the one I... like the other one you said you liked. David smiled, looking up into the gray eyes with the green lights and blue depths in them. How serene and poised her manner was, on the verge of the momentous step she was about to take, while his own heart was beating high. He wondered if she really comprehended the change it was to make in her life, that she showed no apprehension or fear. Cassandra, do you realize in fifteen minutes you will be my wife it will be a great change for you dearest in spite of all i can do you may be sad sometimes and i may ask of you things you don't want to do i've been sad already in my life and done things i didn't want to do i don't guess you could change that only god could and you don't feel in the least disturbed your heart doesn't beat any harder nor breath come quicker tell me how you feel she smiled and drew a long breath i don't know how it is everything is right peaceful and sweet outside the sky and the hills and all the birds even the wind is still in the trees like everything was waiting for something good to happen in your heart is it sweet and peaceful too and waiting for something good to happen yes david god forgive me if i ever fail you he said drawing her down to him god make me worthy of you then the bishop entered and the little procession followed and gathered about while the solemn words of the service were uttered Cassandra knelt at David's side, as together they partook of the bread and wine, and with the worn circlet of gold which had been tied to her father's little green books, they were pronounced man and wife. Then, rising from her knees, she bent and kissed David, the long, first kiss of the wedded pair and turned her gravely happy face to the bishop, who admitted to Betty afterward that he had never kissed a bride other than his own with such unalloyed satisfaction. It was all over quickly, and Cassandra was standing in a new world. Her eyes shone with the love light no longer held back and veiled. She accompanied them all to the door and parted from them, even her mother and little Hoyle, as a hostess parting from her guests she would not allow 
any one to stay behind, for the wedding feast had been spread in her mother's house, and thither they repaired to eat, and talk everything over. Mother felt right bad to leave us alone. She meant to bring everything up and all eat together here, but I thought it would be better, just we two, and me to set things out for you. Lie quiet and close your eyes, David, and make out like you're sleeping while I do it. With perfect contentment, he obeyed and lay watching her through half-closed lids. It was always the same vision. She moved between him and a halo of light that seemed to be part of her and go with her, now at his bedside, now bending before the fireplace. At last the small pine table, which had served as an altar, was set with their first meal. The home was established. He opened his eyes and looked at the feast she had set before him. The pink rose was still in her hair, and one at her throat, and two perfect ones were in a glass near his plate. The table was drawn close to his bedside, and strawberries were upon it, and a glass pitcher of cream. There were white beaten biscuit and tea, as he had made it for her so long ago on her first and only visit to his cabin when he was at home, so she had made it for him now. There were chicken and green peas also. How quickly everything has happened! How perfect it all is! How did you get all these things together? So she told him where everything came from. Mother turned the butter to have it right fresh, and she left it without salt for you, like you said you used to have it in England. Uncle Jerry brought the peas from his garden and shelled them himself. I made the biscuit this morning, and Aunt Sally fried the chicken when she came down, and Azalee prepared the peas, and we all kept them hot in the fireplace. Theirs down there and ours up here. Cassandra laughed merrily. I reckon it looked funny. Everyone carried something when they came up. Hoyle had the peas in a tin pail, and Mother rode Aunt Sally's speckle and carried the biscuit in a pan in front. Shut your eyes and you can see them come that way, David, while I sit here with you, talking and feeling that happy. Don't try to use your right hand that way. I can see it hurts you. Let me go on feeding you like I am. Don't I do it right? Perfectly. But I want you to bring that cushion over here and put it under my pillow so I won't have to lift my head. That's right. Now I want to see you eat. You can't feed me and yourself at the same time. You won't? Then we'll take it turnabout. How have you managed these days? Did Aunt Sally feed you? Oh, I don't believe you ate anything. You couldn't, could you? She spoke so sadly he laughed. It's a lucky thing you sent for the bishop instead of the doctor, or I would have no wife and would have starved to death. I couldn't have survived another day. Again she laughed out, as she seemed so suddenly to have learned to do. And I would have stayed away and let you starve to death? You must open your mouth, David, and not try to talk now. Ah, no, that's enough. We've a thousand things to say and plans to make. You eat while I talk. When I am up, we must find someone to stay with your mother. She should not be left alone. Cassandra paled a little. He was watching her face. You will be staying up here with me, you know, all the time. Yes, I know. Her throat seemed to tighten, and she looked off towards the hills as was her way. Don't you like the thought of staying up here with me? Make your confession, dearest one. He drew her down to look in his eyes. It's done. We are man and wife. Her eyes swam with tears, but her lips smiled. I do. I do want to bide with you all the way before me now looks like a long path of light, like what I've dreamed, sometimes when the moon shines long, the mists at night. Only one place I can't quite see. It is shadow or not. 
Perhaps it's only the thought of mother down there alone. She spoke dreamily, and with the same look of seeing things beyond, except that now she fixed her eyes, not on the mountain top, but on his own. Is it in my eyes you see the long path of light? Are we together in it? I see you always with the light about you. I saw you so first in your own home before the blazing fire, such a hearth fire as I have never seen before. You have appeared to me in my dreams, with light about you ever since, and in my visions, when I have been riding over these hills alone. What are you seeing now? You, as you helped me that first time there in the snow. You looked so ill, but your way was strong, and I thought, all at once in a flash, like it came from... Goon. Like it came from my father. One will come for you. She hid her face in his bosom, and her words came smothered and brokenly. All the ride home, I put them away, but they would come back, his words. On the mountain top, one will come for you. But we were in such trouble. I thought it was just the thought of my father. It's always strongest when trouble comes, like he would comfort me. Don't you have it also when happiness comes to you, as on this morning while we waited together? No great happiness like this ever came before. I have been glad, like when Mother said I might go to Farrington to school, and when I knelt and was confirmed, I was glad then. The first gladness I can remember was when my father used to carry me in his arms up and down his path and repeat strange poetry to me. When you are well, we will go there, won't we? Yes, dearest. But didn't that remembrance come to you just now, when you saw the long path of light before us? I think no, David. I'm afraid I forgot everyone but you then, when you asked what I like to bide here with you. And the long path of light was our love, for it reaches up to heaven, doesn't it, David? It reaches to heaven, Cassandra. They were silent for there was no more to say. End of chapter 20 Recording by Sandra Estenson Chapter number 21 of The Mountain Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter 21. In Which the Summer Passes. Midsummer arrived, and David, healed of his wounds, pronounced himself as strong as a cricketer. What he meant by that, Hoyle could only conjecture, and, after much pondering, decided that his strength was now so great that should he desire to do so, he could leap into the air or jump long distances after the manner of crickets. You reckon you could jump as fur in one jump now as from here to other side the water trough yonder? he asked one day, as they sat on the porch steps together. No, I don't reckon so, said David, laughing. Well, could you jump over this here house and the loom shed in one jump? I don't reckon so. Be sensible, honey son. You mustn't allow him to ask ye fool questions, doctor. You knows they ain't nobody can do such as that, Hoyle, called his mother from within. He has some idea in his head. What is it, Brother Hoyle? I heard you telling Cass that you was getting strong as one of those there cricket bugs, and I had one t'other day. He could jump as fur as Clare across the porch, and he was only about an inch long or less, less than an inch. I thought if Brother David was that strong, 
he could jump a heap david had comforted hoyle for the loss of cassandra from the home by explaining that they were now become brothers for the rest of their lives and in order to give this assurance appreciable significance he had taken the small chap to the circus and had treated him to pink lemonade and a toy balloon they had remained over until the next day and dr bartlett and david examined him all over at the old physician's office and then had gone into a little room by themselves and stayed a long time leaving him outside then to compensate for such gross neglect david had taken him to a clothing store and bought him a complete suit of store clothing very neat and pretty hoyle would have been in the seventh heaven over all this were it not alas that there the child for the first time in his life looked into a mirror that revealed him to himself from head to foot little wry neck hunched back and all david not realizing this was a revelation to the little man wondered as they walked away that all his enthusiasm and exuberance of spirits had left him and that he walked at his side wearily and sadly silent his pathetic little legs spindled down from the smart new trousers and his hands dangled weakly from his thin wrists all but his fingers clung tightly to his toy balloon we're going back to the bishop's now and we'll have a good dinner and then you'll have a whole hour to play with dorothy before we leave for home said david cheeringly the child made no response other than to slip his hand into david's what are you thinking about brother hoyle just nothing i were a wanderin oh there's a difference what were you wondering ma told me if you were that good to take me to a circus i mustn't bother you with a heap of questions that want no good that's all right i'm questioning you what were you and that old man feeling me all over for were you trying to make out how come my head is sot like this away reckon you really could set it straight and get this ere lump off my back don't worry about your head and your back you have a very good head that's more than some can say i never seen nary other boy like i be you reckon that little girl she thought i were queer what little girl miss towers lit girl she said turn round and when i done hit she said turn round again then she said why don't you hoy your head like i do what did you say didn't say nothing just asked her why and she hoy her head like i did and she said don't want to so i said don't want to he twisted his head about to look up at david's face and his lips smiled but in his eyes was a suspicion of tears his heart heavy for the child david praised him for a brave little chap comforting him as best he could you reckon she'll like me if i were to give her this here balloon no you take that home to sister the little girl can get one when the circus comes again but after dinner david did not send hoyle off to play the hour with dorothy he took her on his knee and entertained them both with tales and mimicry until he had them in gales of laughter and for the time being hoyle forgot his troubles as the days passed david became more and more interested in his patch of ground and the growing things in his garden never had he labored with his hands in this fashion and each night he lay down to sleep physically weary in contentment of spirit steadily he progressed toward the desired goal of health in his young wife also he found a rich satisfaction watching her unfold and blossom into the gracious wifehood and ladyhood he had dreamed of for her together they used to stroll to the little farm where she told him all she knew about the crops what was best for the animals and what would be needed for themselves long before david was able to oversee the work himself she had set elwine tims to sowing cowpeas and planting corn 
behold your heritage david said to her one morning as they strolled thus among the thrifty greenness and patches of vetch where the cow was contentedly feeding he laughed joyously and drew his wife's arm through his she looked up at him wistfully he thought she sighed and bent his head to listen what was that little sound i was only thinking We'll sit here where we sat that morning when we both put our hands to the plow, and you tell me what you were thinking. I ought not to stop now, David. I've left all for Mother to do. I was that busy at the cabin I didn't get down to her this morning. You can't keep two homes going with only your own two dear hands, Cassandra. It must be stopped. We'll find someone to live with your mother and take your place. She gave a little gasp, then sat silently, her hands dropped passively in her lap, and he thought she seemed sad. He took her face between his hands and made her look into his eyes. Don't be worried, sweetheart. We'll make a few changes. You're mine now, you know. Not only to serve me and labor for me as you've been doing all these weeks, but, but I like it, David. I like doing for you. I hope it may always be so I can do for you. Would you like me to become an invalid again so you can keep on in the way you began? Not that. But sometimes I think, what if you shouldn't really need me? She hid her face on his breast. I, I want you to need me, David. It was almost like a cry for help as she said it. Dear heart, dear heart, what are you thinking and fearing? Can't you understand? You are mine now to be cared for and loved and held very near and dear to my heart. We are no more twain. We are one. Yes, but, but David, I, I want you to need me. She sobbed, and he knew some thought was stirring in her heart, which she could not yet put into words. He comforted her and soothed her, explaining certain plans which later he put into execution, so that her duties at the fall place were brought to an end, and he could have her always with him. A daughter of Uncle Cotton, who had gone down into South Carolina to live, was induced to come and stay with the widow, and the girl's brother came with her and helped David on the farm. Then David made changes in and about his cabin. He built on another room, and put therein a cook-stove. He could not bear to see his young wife bending at the hearth, preparing their meals, and when she demurred, he explained that he wished to keep her as she was, and not see her growing old and wrinkled before her time, with the burning heat of the open fire in her face, like many of the mountain women. One evening, they had eaten their supper out under the trees. She proposed they should walk up to her father's path, as she called the spot, towards which she so often lifted her eyes, and David was well pleased to go with her. As they set out, she asked him to wait a moment, while she went back for something, and quickly returned, bringing his flute. I've often wished father could have heard you play on this, she said, as he took it from her hand. They crossed the little river that tumbled and rushed among great moss-covered boulders on its way to the fall, and followed its wayward course toward its head, where the way was untrodden and wild, as if no human foot had ever climbed along its banks. After a little, they turned off toward a tremendous rock of solid granite that had been cleft smoothly in twain by some gigantic force of nature and walking between the towering walls of stone came out on the farther side upon a small level space where immense ferns and flags grew thickly in the rich soil held in place and kept damp by the great cool masses of stone above this little dell the hill rose steeply and Cassandra led him to a narrow opening in the dense shrubbery surrounding the spot from which a beaten path wound upward, overarched 
with thickly interlacing branches of birchwood and hemlocks along this winding trail they climbed until they reached a cluster of enormous cedars which made the dark place on the mountain cassandra had pointed out to him from below here the path widened so they could walk side by side and continued along a level line at the foot of the dark mass of trees here father used to walk up and down reading in his little books seems like i can hear his voice now sometimes he would look off over the valley below us there and repeat parts by heart isn't it beautiful here david heavenly beautiful i'm glad we never came here before why dearest because she hesitated with parted lips and cheeks flushed from the climb david stood with bared head and felt as if he were in a cathedral and why because he asked again for now we bring just happiness with us we're not troubled or wondering about anything no sorrow comes with us in our hearts we are sure sure she paused again and lifted her eyes to his sure that all is right when we belong to each other this way yes sure oh david sure sure she threw her arms about his neck and drew his face down to hers it's even a greater happiness than when he used to carry me in his arms here there's no sorrow near us it's all far away thus sometimes she would throw off all the habitual reserve of her manner and open her heart to him following the rich impulses of her nature to their glorious revelation now david sit here and play play your flute as you did that first time when i learned who made the music that i thought must be the voices that time i climbed up to see they sat under the great cedars on a bank of moss and david took the flute from her hand smiling as he thought of that moment when he had stood among the blossoming laurel and watched her as she moved about his cabin the day before his hurt and how she had kissed it i used to sit here like this she bent forward and rested her head on his knee she had a way of putting her two hands together as a child is taught to hold them in prayer and placing them beneath her cheek and so she waited while david paused his hand on her hair and his eyes fixed on the sea of hilltops where they melted into the sky a mysterious undulating line of the faintest blue seen through the arching branches above and the swaying hemlocks on either side and over the tops of a hundred varieties of pines and deciduous trees beneath them all down the long slope up which they had climbed thus they waited until she lifted her head and looked into his eyes questioningly he bent forward and kissed her lips then lifted the flute to his own but again paused what are you thinking now david she asked so you really thought it was the voices what was their message cassandra i couldn't make it out then but i thought of this place and of father and it was all at once like as if he would make me know something and i prayed god would he lead me to understand was it a message or not so that was the way i kept on following until i you came to me dear yes and what did you think the interpretation was then yes it was you you david it was love and hope and gladness everything everything go on everything good and beautiful but sometimes it comes again what comes play david play 
I'll tell you another time and another place. Not here. No, no. So he played for her, until the dusk deepened around and below them, and they had to make their way back stumblingly. When they came to the wild, untrodden bank of the little river, David resigned the choosing of their path entirely to her, and followed close, holding her hand where she led. When at last they reached their cabin, they did not light candles, but sat long on the doorway conversing on the deep things of their souls. It still seemed to David as if she held something back from him, and now he begged her for a more perfect self-revealing. It is no longer as if we were separate, dearest. Can't you remember and feel that we are one? In a way I do. It is very sweet. You say in a way. In what way? Why, David? I want your point of view. I see. We're not really one until we see from each other's hilltop, are we? No. And you never take me into the secret places of your heart and let me look off from your own hilltop. Didn't I this very evening, David? We stood on the same spot of earth and looked off on the same distance. Yet in my soul, I know I did not see what you saw. Pictures come to me very suddenly and just float by, hardly understood by myself. I didn't want you to see all I saw, David. I don't know how comes it, but all the time, even in the midst of our great gladness, right when it is most beautiful, far before me, right across our way, is a place that is dim. It seems most like the shadows that fall on the hills when those great piles of clouds pass through the sky, when it is deep blue all around them and the sun shines everywhere else. Your soul is still an undiscovered country to me, Cassandra. I should think you'd like that. Don't men love to go discovering? And if you could get into the secret chambers, as you call them, you wouldn't find much. Then you'd be sorry. Cassandra, what are you covering and holding back? I don't know, David. It's like it was when I couldn't understand the message of the voices. When it comes clear and strong, I'll tell you. Then there is something. With a little sigh, she rose and entered the cabin. He sat in silence, as she had left him, but soon she returned. Standing behind him in the darkness, she put her interlaced fingers under his chin and drew his face backward until she could see it, white in the dusk, beneath her eyes. You have come back to explain? If I can, David. It's hard for me to put into words what is so dim what I see. It's all just love for you, David. The love burns and blazes up in me like the fire when it's fiercest on the hearth, when the day is cold outside. You've seen it so. In the little books my father used to read, there is a tale of a woman who had my name. She foretold the sorrows to come. Perhaps she saw, as I see, things in the dim pictures, only more clearly, and wisdom was given her to interpret them. Often and often I felt that in me, that strange seeing and knowing before, and I don't like it. Only once it made me feel glad, when it led me to you and frail that terrible moment, but it wasn't a picture that time. It was a feeling that pulled me and made me go. I would have gone that time if I had died for it. He took her two hands and covered them with kisses there in the darkness. I told you you were my priestess of all that is good. But I don't want to be always seeing the shadows and foreboding. I want to be all happy, happy the way you are. 
I believe you are one of the blessed ones of God who have the gift. But you are right to feel as you do. Your life will be more normal and wholesome, not to try to probe into the future. I'll not attempt to take my coarser humanity into your holy places, dear. He led her into their canvas sleeping chamber, and there she was soon calmly slumbering at his side. But he lay long, pondering, and trying to see his way out of a certain dilemma of unrest that had been creeping into his veins and prodding him forward ever since his re-established health had become an assured fact. He recognized it as no more than the proper impulse of his manhood not to stagnate and slumber in a lotus dream, even as delicious a dream as this. Ah, it was inevitable. His world must become her world. Herein lay the dilemma. This unsullied, beautiful being must enter that sordid old world that had so pressed upon him and broken him down. This idol might go on for perhaps a year longer, but not for always, not for always. He slept at last and dreamed that they were being driven along a dark, cold river, wide and swift, that they had entered it where it was only a narrow, rushing stream, sparkling and tumbling over rocks, and winding in intricate turnings on itself, that they had laughed as they followed it, splashing along the stones where she led him by the hand, until it grew wider and deeper and colder, and they were lifted from their feet and were tossed and swirled about, and she cried and clung to him, and even as he clasped her and held her, he knew her to be slipping from him. Then in terror he awoke, and reaching out in the darkness, drew her into his embrace, and slept again. End of chapter 21 Recording by Sandra Anderson Chapter number 22 of The Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter 22 In Which David Takes Little Hoyle to Canada. David said his wife next day as he came whistling up to his cabin from the farm below do you mind if i give mother a little help with the weaving mattie can't do it she's right nigh spoiled the counterpane we had on when she came and since mother's hurt she can't work the treadles so now the hotel's open miss mayhew may come and find them not half done do i mind why should i mind if you don't right nigh spoil your back and wear yourself out then i'll go down with you after dinner and see can i patch up mattie's mistakes it takes so much patience a loom does to understand it mattie was the cousin david had imported from the low country to relieve cassandra from the burden of the work in the home below although a disappointment to them she still did her work after her own fashion clumsily and slowly but her aunt Marthy was never at rest, prodding the dull nature forward, trying to make her take the interest Cassandra had done. David had wisely persuaded his wife to leave them to themselves, to work out the problem of adjustment to the new conditions as best they might, and his persuasions had been more of a peremptory nature than he realized. To Cassandra they had been as commands. But now, when the weaving on which the widow had counted so much was likely to be ruined by Mattie's unskilled hands, the old mother had declared she could not bear to see her niece around and should pack her off where she come from. 
therefore cassandra had made her timid request the first evidence of shrinking from her husband she had ever given why was it he asked himself what had he ever said or done to make her prefer a request in that way but it was over in an instant and her own poised manner returned as they ate and chatted together little hoyle came running up to eat with them he had conceived a dislike to the home below since the incumbent had come to take his sister's place and evaded thus as often as possible his mother's vigilance david did not mind the intrusion but suffered the adoring little chap to sit at his side ever twisting his small body about to fix his great eyes on david's face while he plied him with questions and hung on his words too intent to attend to his own eating unless admonished thereto by his sister if you don't eat son i'll send you back to mother she threatened i won't go he rebelled joyously i'll just set here alongside brother david no you won't young man you'll do whatever sister says that's what i do he put his hand on the boy's tousled head and turned him about to his plate well filled with food still untouched but he noticed that the child ate listlessly more as an act of obedience than from a normal desire he glanced up at his wife and saw that she also noticed hoyle's languor they finished the meal in silence only broken by hoyle's questions and david's replies now serious now teasing and bantering you are so full of interrogation points you have no room for your dinner here drink this milk slowly don't gulp it i know what they be they go this away the boy set down his glass to illustrate with his slender little hand the form of a question mark then he laughed out gaily you know how come i got filled up with them things i done swallowed that thar catechism cast been teachin me sundays no i'm thinking you just are one yourself cause i'm crooked like this away he twisted about and looked up at david gravely no no son doctor didn't mean that said his sister finish your milk said david we'll have some fun with the microscope and once again the child essayed to eat and drink a little but the languor and pallor grew in spite of all david could do for him and as the weeks passed his large eyes burned more brilliantly and his thin form grew more meagre cassandra got in the way of keeping him up at the cabin with her and when she went down to weave he went also and used to lie on the bundles of cotton poring over the books which david procured for him from time to time what he gets in that way won't hurt him it's not like having set tasks to learn he's not burdened with any ought or ought not about it let him vegetate until cooler weather then if he doesn't improve we'll see what can be done something radical i imagine the fall arrived in a splendor that was truly oriental in its gorgeousness the changing colors of the foliage surpassed in brilliancy anything david had ever seen or imagined possible the mantle of deepest green which had clothed the mountain sides all summer became transmuted until all the world was glorified and glowing as if the heat of the summer sun had stored up during the drowsy days to burst forth thus in warmest reds and golds the hills look as if they had clothed themselves in turkish rugs ancient and fine said david one evening as he sat on his rock watching them burn in the afterglow of the setting sun how much there is for me to learn and know cassandra replied in a low voice i never saw a turkish rug you often speak of things i know nothing about david laughed and turned upon her happy eyes why so sad for that did you think i loved and married you for your worldly knowledge she smiled back at him and was silent presently he continued 
now while hoyle is not here i wish to talk to you a little about him yes david her heart fluttered with a nameless fear but she betrayed no sign of emotion you've seen of course it's not necessary to tell you no david only does it mean death she put her hand out to him and he took it in his and stroked it not surely we'll make a fight for him won't we dear oh david what can we do she moaned there's a thing to do that i've been reserving as a last resort i think the time has come to try it this curvature presses on some vital part and the action of his heart is uncertain he needs the tonic of the cold the ice and snow would you trust him to me dear i'll take him to dr hoyle you know very well everything kindness and skill can do will be done for him there yes yes david you are so good to him always would would you go alone with him she drew closer to him her head on his shoulder and her hand on his but he could not see her face you mean without you dearest yes that may be as you say would you prefer to go with us she drew a long breath slowly like an indrawn sigh and something trembled to pass her heart but suddenly the old habit of reserve sealed her lips and she remained silent what do you say he urged tell me first do you want me to go he was silent and they sat waiting for each other then he said i do want you to go and yet i don't want you to go yet sometime of course we must go where i may find wider scope for my activities he felt her quiver of anxiety not until you are quite ready yourself dear always remember that still she was silent and he continued i can't say that i'm quite ready myself i would prefer one more year here but hoyle must be removed without delay we may have waited too long as it is will your mother consent she must if she cares to see him live oh david go go take him and go to-morrow leave me here and go but come back to me david soon very soon i i shall need you i can you leave hoyle there and come back david or must you bide there too suddenly she bowed her face in her hands oh, i'm so wicked and selfish to think of leaving him there without you or me or mother one david what can we do he might die there and you you must come back for the winter what would save him might kill you oh david take me with you and leave me there with him and you come back dr hoyle will take care of him of us once we are there now 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 hold your dear heart in peace why i'm well to stay another winter would only be to establish myself in a more rugged condition of body not that i must do so we'll talk with your mother to-morrow it may be hard to persuade her but he found the mother most reasonable and practical he even tried to abate her perfect trust in him and his ability to bring the child back to her quite well and strong this isn't a trouble that is ever really cured you know when taken young enough it may be helped and i've known people who have lived long and useful lives in spite of it that's all we may hope for Wall i allow you can't get him no younger than he be now and he's that pert i reckon he's worth it lest ways to wins of course he's worth it you are right good to care for him like you have i'd do a heap for you if i could all i have is just this here farm and it's for you and cass only if you'd allow me and leetle hoyle to bide on here whilst we live david was touched do you realize i've found here 
the two greatest things in the world love and health all i want is for you to know and remember that if i can't succeed in doing all i would like for the boy at least i tried my very best i may not succeed you know but this is the only thing to do now the only thing david parted from his young wife leaving her standing in the door of their cabin clad in her white homespun frock smiling yet tearful and pale he was to walk down to the fall place where jerry carew waited with the wagon in which he had arrived and where his baggage had been brought the day before when he came to the steepest part of the descent he looked back and saw cassandra still standing as if in a trance gazing after him he felt his heart lean towards her and turning sharply walked swiftly to her and took her once more in his arms and looked down into those deep springs her sweet gray eyes thus for a long moment he held her to his heart with never a word then she entered the little home and he walked away looking back no more end of chapter twenty two recording by sandra estenson Chapter Twenty Three of The Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Twenty Three, in which Doctor Hoyle speaks his mind. Doctor Hoyle sat in his office, staring straight before him, not as if he were looking at David Thring, who sat in range of his vision but as if seeing beyond him into some other time and place. David had been speaking, but now they both were silent, and the young man wondered if his old friend had really been paying attention to his words or not. "'Well, doctor,' said he at last. "'Well, David?' "'You don't seem satisfied. Is it with my condition?' "'Your condition?' "'No, no, no, it's not your condition.' Yes, yes, fine, fine. I never saw such a marvelous change in my life, never. David smiled over the old doctor's stammer of enthusiasm. It was as if his thoughts, fertile and vehement, and the feelings of his great warm heart welled up within him, and trying to burst forth all at once, tumbled over themselves, unable to secure words rapidly enough in which to give them utterance. Then why so silent and dubious? Why... Why, young man, I wasn't thinking anything about you just then. And again David laughed, while his wiry old friend jumped up and walked rapidly and restlessly about the small apartment and laughed in sympathy. It's not, not... I know, David grew instantly sober again. Of course, the little chap's case is serious. Very. Or I would not have brought him to you. Oh, no, no, I'm not thinking of Adam. Bless you, no. The doctor always called his little namesake Adam. I'm thinking of her, the little girl you left behind you. Yes, yes, of her. She's not so little now, doctor. She's tall, tall enough to be beautiful. I remember her. Slight, slight little creature. All eyes and hair, all soul and mind. Now what are you going to do with her, eh? What is she going to do with me, rather? I'll go back to her as soon as I dare leave the boy. But man alive, what? What are... You can't live down there all your days. It's to be life and work for you, sir. And what are you going to do with her, I say? I'll bring her here with me. She'll come. Of course you'll bring her here with you. And you, you'll have plenty of friends. Maybe they'll appreciate her, and maybe they won't. Maybe they won't, I say. Understand? And she'll come. Oh, yes, she'll come. She'll do whatever you say, and presently she'll break her heart and die for you. She'll never say a word, but that's what she'll do. Why, doctor, cried David appalled. 
I love her as my own life, my very soul. Of, of course. That goes without saying. We all do, we men, but we... Damn it all, do you suppose I've lived all these years and not seen? Why, we think of ourselves first every time. D don't we, though? Rather? But selfish as we are, we can love. A man can, if he sets himself to it honestly. Love a woman and make her happy, even without the appreciation of others, in spite of environment, everything. It's the destiny of women to love us, thank God. She would have been doomed surely to die if she had married the one who wanted her first, or to live a life for her worse than death. Oh, Lord bless you, boy, yes. It's a woman's destiny. I'm an old fool. There, there's my own little girl. She's m married and gone, gone to live in England. They will do it, the women will. Come, we'll go see Adam. The doctor sprang up brushed his hand across his eyes, and caught up a battered silk hat. He turned it about and looked at it ruefully, with a quizzical smile playing about the corners of his eyes. Remember that hat? he asked. Well do I remember it. You've driven many a mile and many a rainstorm by my side under that hat. When you're done with it, leave it to me on your will. I have a fancy for it. Will you? Here, take it. Take it. I'm done with it. Mary scolds me every day about it. No p peace in life because of it. Here's a new one I bought the other day. Good one. Good enough. He lifted a box which had fallen from his cluttered office table and took from it a new hat which had evidently not been unpacked before. He tried it on his head, turned it about and about, took it off and gazed at it within and without, then hastily tossed it aside and, snatching his old one from David, put it on his head, and they started off. Hoyle had been placed in a small ward where were only two other little beds, both occupied, with one nurse to attend on the three patients. One of them had broken his leg and had to lie in a cast, and the other was convalescing from a fever, but both were well enough to be companionable with the lonely little southerner. Hoyle's face beamed upon David as he bent over him. I can make pictures whilst I'm a layin' here, he cried ecstatically. That thar lady, she allows me to make em. She allows mine are good uns. David glanced at the young woman indicated. She was pleasant-faced and rosy, and looked practical and good. He's such an odd little chap, she said. What be that odd? Does hit mean this er lump on my back? He pulled David down and whispered the question in his ear. No, no, she only means that you're a dear, queer little chap. What be I queer for? What are all these drawings? Tell us what they mean. This un hits the ocean, and that thar hits a steamship sailing on the ocean, like you done told me about. And this un hits our house, and here's where old Pete bides at. And this un's old Pete kicking out like he hated something, like he does when we give Frail's colt his corn first. The other small boys from their beds laughed out merrily and strained their necks to see. These are theirn. I made this and for him and this and for him. He tossed the pictures feebly towards them and they fluttered to the floor. David gathered them up and gave them to their respective owners. The old doctor stood beside the cot and looked down on the little artist. His lips twitched and his eyes twinkled. Which one is yours? he asked. I keep this in with a C. And here, I made this in for you. He paused and selected carefully among the pile of papers under his hand. You reckon you can tell what tis? The doctor took the paper and regarded it gravely a moment, then lifted his eyebrows and made grimaces of wonderment until the three patients in the three little beds were in gales of laughter. At last, he said, it's a pile of sausages. It ain't no sausages. It's just a straight, clar picture of a house, and hits your house, too, where brother David lives at. See, there's the winder, and the other winder hits on the t'other side where you can't see it. The doctor turned the paper over and regarded it a moment. Show me the window. I, 
I see no window on the other side. Again the three little invalids laughed uproariously at their visitor. David smilingly looked on. How often had he seen the delightful old man amuse himself thus with the children? He would contort his mobile face into all the varying expressions of wonder and dismay, of terror or stupefaction, and his entrance to the children's ward was always greeted with outcries of delight when the little ones were well enough to allow of such freedom. "'Haven't you one to send to your sister?' asked David, stooping low to the child and speaking quietly. The boy's face lighted with a radiant smile that caused the old man to stand regarding him more intently. "'Well, send her this end of the sea. You reckon it looks like the ocean, while the ships go a sailing to the other side of the world?' He held it in his slender fingers and eyed it critically. "'How did you come to try to make a picture of the sea when you never saw it?' "'Dunno. I feel like I done see the ocean when I'm sitting there on the rock. And them white big clouds go a sailing far, far like they're going to another world, and I ain't quite touching this in. I wondered why you had your ship so high above the sea. I don't guess it's a very good un, said the child, ruefully, clinging to the scrap of paper with a reluctant grasp. You reckon she'd care for this un? I reckon she'd care for anything you made. Give it to me, and I'll send it to her. She told me the sea hit war blue, and I can't make it right blue and soft like she said. That thar blue pencil hits too slick. I can't make it stay on the paper. What are these mounds here on either side of the sea? Them's mountains. But why did you put mountains in the sea? The boy looked with wide eyes dreamily past the two men, so attentively regarding him. Ah. Uh, I reckon I just put em thar for to look like the sea hit her on the world. I don't guess they'd be no ocean, nor no world, that there were mountains for to hold everything where it belongs at. I shall bring you a box of paints tomorrow, if the nurse will allow you to have them. I'll provide an oilcloth to spread around so he won't throw paint over your nice clean bed, he said to the pleasant-faced young woman. That's all right, doctor she said. Then you can make the blue stay on, and you can make the ocean with real water and real blue for the sky and the sea. The child's eyes glowed. He pulled David down and held him with his arm about his neck, and whispered in his ear, and what he said was, When they're a-pullin' on me to get my haid straight and my back right, I just think about the far, far away sea with the ships a sailin' and how it look, and it don't hurt so much. I can bar it a heap better. When you comin' back, Brother David? Does it hurt you very much, Hoyle? I reckon it have to hurt, said the child, with fatalistic resignation. I don't guess he'd hurt me thought he had to. He released David slowly, then pulled him down again. Don't tell him I load it hurt me. I reckon he'd rather hurt hisself if he could do me right that away. You guess I, I'm gonna get shed o' the misery some day. That's what we're trying for, my brave little brother. And the two physicians bade the small patients goodbye, and walked out upon the street. End of chapter twenty three. Chapter 24 of The Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter 24 In Which David Thring Has News from England. As they passed down the street, David shivered and buttoned his light overcoat closer about him. Cold, said the older man. Your air is a bit keen here already. I hope it will be the needed tonic for that little chap. What were his secrets? David told him. He's an imaginative. Yes, yes, I really would rather hurt myself. He may come on, he may, 
I've known. I've known. Curious, but... Why? Hello? Hello? Why? Where? And Dr. Hoyle suddenly darted forward and shook hands with another old gentleman, who was alertly stepping toward them, also thin and wiry, but with a face as impassive as the doctor's was mobile and expressive. Mr. Stretton? Why? Why? David! Mr. Stretton! David Thring! Ah, Mr. Thring, I am most happy to find you here. Dr. Thring, over here on this side, you know. Ah, yes, I had really forgotten. But, speaking of titles, I must give this young man his correctly. Lord Thring, allow me to congratulate you, my lord. I fear you mistake me for my cousin, sir, said David, smiling. I hope you have no ill news from my good uncle. But I am not the David who inherits. I think he is in South Africa, or was by his latest letters home. Mr. Stretton did not reply directly, but continued smiling, as his manner was, and turned toward David's companion. Shall we go to my hotel? I have a great deal to talk over, business which concerns, ahem, ahem, your lordship, on behalf of your mother, having come expressly, he turned again to David, Ah, now, don't be at all alarmed, I beg of you. I see I have disturbed you. She is quite well, or was a week or more ago. Dr. Hoyle, you'll accompany us, at my request. Undoubtedly, you are interested in your young friend. Mechanically, David walked with the two older men, filled with a strange sinking of the heart, and at the same time with a vague elation. Was he called home by his mother to help her sustain a new calamity? Had the impossible happened? Mr. Stretton's manner continued to be mysteriously deferential toward him, and something in his air remental David of England and the atmosphere of his uncle's stately home. Had he ever seen the man before? He really did not know. They reached the hotel shortly and were conducted to Mr. Stretton's private apartment, where wine was ordered and promptly served. For years thereafter, David never heard the clinking of glasses and bottles borne on a tray without an instant sickening sinking of the heart, and the foreboding that seemed to drench him with dismay as the glasses were placed on the stand at Mr. Stretton's elbow. When that gentleman, after seeing the waiter disappear, and placing certain papers before him, began speaking, David sat dazedly listening. What was it all? What was it? The glasses seemed to quiver and shake throwing dancing flecks of light, and the wine in them. Why did it make him think of blood? Were they dead then? All three? His two cousins and his brother? Dead? Shot? Killed in a bloody and useless war? He was confounded, and bowing his head in his hands sat thus, his elbows on his knees, waiting, hearing, but not comprehending. He could think only of his mother. He saw her face, aged and grief-stricken. He knew how she loved the boy she had lost, above all, and now she must turn to himself. He sat thus while the lawyer read a lengthy document, and at the end personally addressed him. Then he lifted his head. What is this? My uncle? My uncle gone too? Do you mean dead? My uncle dead and I, I his heir? The lawyer replied formally, You are now the head of a most ancient and honorable house. You will have the dignity of the old name to maintain, and are called upon to return to your fatherland, and occupy the home of your ancestors. He took up one of the papers and adjusted his monocle. For a time David did not speak. At last he rose, and with head erect extended his hand to the lawyer. I thank you, sir, for your trouble. But now, doctor, shall we return to your house? I must take a little time to adjust my mind to these terrible events. It is like being overtaken with an avalanche at the moment when all is most smiling and perfect. The lawyer began a few congratulatory remarks, but David stopped him with uplifted hand. It is calamitous. It is too terrible he said sadly, and what it brings may be far more of a burden than a joy. But the name, my lord, 
the ancient and honorable lineage. That last was already mine, and for the title I have never coveted it, far less all that it entails. I must think it over. But, my lord, it is yours. You can't help yourself, you know. Uh, the, the position is yours, and you will, uh, fill it with dignity, and, uh, let me hope, will follow the conservative policy of your honored uncle. And I say I must think it over. May I not have a day, a single day, in which to mourn the loss of my splendid brother? Would God he had lived to fill this place, he said desperately. The lawyer bowed deferentially, and Dr. Hoyle took David's arm and led him away as if he were his son. Not a word was spoken by either of them until they were again in the doctor's office. There lay the new silk hat, as he had tossed it one side. He took it up and turned it about in his hand. You see, David, an old hat is like an old friend, and it takes some time to get wanted to a new one. He gravely laid the old one within easy reach of his arm, and restored the new one to its box. Then he sat himself near David, and placed his hand kindly on his knee. You, you have your work laid out for you, my young friend. It's the way in old England, the stability of our society, our national life demands it. I know. You must go to your mother. Yes, I must go to her. Of course, of course, and without delay. Well, I'll take care of the little chap. I know you will. Better than I could. David lifted his eyes to his old friends, then turned them away. I feel him to be a sacred trust. Again he paused. It would take a long time to go to her first. To her? For the instant the old man had forgotten Cassandra. Not so, David. My wife. It will be desperately hard for her. Yes, yes, but your uncle, you know, died of grief, and your mother— I know, so the lawyer said. Now at last we'll read mother's letter. He wondered, I suppose, that I didn't look at it when he gave it to me, but I felt conscience-stricken. I've been so filled with my life down there, the peace, the blessed peace and happiness, that I have neglected her, my own mother. I couldn't open and read it with that man's eyes on me. No, no, stay here, I beg of you, stay. You are different. I want you. He opened his mother's letter, and slowly read it, then passed it to his friend, and, rising, walked to the window and stood gazing down into the square. Autumn leaves were being tossed and swirled into dancing flights, like flocks of brown and yellow birds along the street. The sky was overcast, with thin, hurrying clouds, and the feeling of autumn was in the air. But David's eyes were blurred, and he saw nothing before him. The doctor's voice broke the silence with sudden impulse. In this she speaks as if she knew nothing about your marriage. I told you I had neglected her, cried David contritely. But man alive! Why, why in the name of all the gods? All England is filled with fools, cried the younger man desperately. I could never in the world make them understand me or my motives. I gave it up long ago. I have not told my mother to save her from a needless sorrow that would be inflicted on her by her friends. They would all flock to her and pester her with their outcry of, How very extraordinary! I can hear them and see them now. I tell you, if a man steps out of the beaten track over there, if he attempts to order his own life, marry to please himself, or cut his coat after any pattern other than the ordinary conventional lines, even the boys on the street will fling stones at him. Her patronizing friends would, at the very least, politely raise their eyebrows. She is proud and sensitive, and any fling at her son's is a blow to her. But what— I say I couldn't tell her. I tell you, I have been drinking from the cup of happiness. I have drained it to the last drop. My wife is mine. She does not belong to those people over there, to be talked over and dined over and all her beauty and fineness overlooked through their monocles. 
brutes! My mountain flower in her homespun dress. Only poets could understand and appreciate her. But what were you going to do about it? Do about it? I meant to keep her to myself until the right time came. Perhaps in another year bring her here and begin life in a modest way, and let my mother visit us and see for herself. I was planning it out, slowly, but this... You see, Doctor, their ideas are all warped over there. They accept all that custom decrees, and have but the one point of view. The true values of life are lost sight of. They have no hilltops like Cassandra's. Only the poets have. A quizzical smile played about the old man's mouth. He came and laid his arm across David's shoulders, and the act softened the slight sting of his words. And you call yourself a poet? Not that, said the young man humbly, but I have been learning. I would have scorned to be called a poet until I learned of this girl and her father. I thought I had ideals, and felt my superiority in consequence, until I came down to the beginnings of things with them. Her, her father? Why, he's dead, he... And yet through her I have learned of him. I believe he was a man who walked with God, and at Cassandra's side I have trod in his secret places. That's right. I'm satisfied now about her. You're all right, but... but... your mother... David turned and walked to the table, and sat with his head bowed on his arms. Had he been alone, he would have wept. As it was, he spoke brokenly of his old home, and the responsibilities now so ruthlessly thrust upon him, of his mother's grief and his own, and of the inheritance that he had never dreamed would be his, and therefore had never desired, now given him by so cruel a blow. He would not shrink from whatever duty or obligation might rest upon him, how could he adjust his changed circumstances to the conditions he had made for himself by his sudden marriage? At last it was decided that he should sail for England without delay, taking the passage already provisionally engaged for him by Mr. Stretton. I can write to Cassandra. She will understand more easily than my mother. She sees into the heart of things. Her thoughts go to the truth like arrows of light. She will see that I must go. But she must never know. I must save her from it if I have to do so at the expense of my own soul. That the reason I cannot take her with me now is that our great friends over there are too small to understand her nature and might despise her. I must go to my mother first and feel my way, see what can be done. Neither of them must be made to suffer. That's right, perfectly, but don't wait too long. Just have it out with your mother, all of them. The sooner the simpler. The sooner the simpler. End of chapter 24this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter 25 In Which David Thring Visits His Mother. How wise was the advice of the old doctor to make short work of the confession to his mother, and to face the matter of his marriage bravely with his august friends and connections, David little knew. If his marriage had been rash in its haste, nothing in the future should be done rashly. Possibly he might be obliged to return to America before he made a full revelation that a wife awaited him in that far and but dimly appreciated land. In his mind the matter resolved itself into a question of time and careful adjustment. Slowly as the boat ploughed through the never-resting waters, 
slowly as the western land with its dreams and realities drifted farther into the vapors that blended the line of the land and the sea, so slowly the future unveiled itself and drew him on into its new dreams, revealing, with the inevitable progression of the hours, a life heretofore shrouded and only vaguely imagined as a glowing reality filled with opportunity and power. He felt his whole nature expand and become imbued with intoxicating ambitions, as if hereafter he would be swept onward to ride through life triumphant, even as the boat was riding the sea, surmounting its mysterious depths and taking its unerring way in spite of buffeting of winds and beating of waves. Still young, with renewed vitality, his hopes turned to the future, recognizing the tremendous scope for his energies which his own particular prospects presented. Often he stood alone in the prow, among the coils of rope, and watched the distance unroll before him, while the salt breeze played with his clustering hair and filled his lungs. He loved the long sweep of the prow, as it divided the water and cast it foaming on either side, in opalin and turquoise tints, shifting and falling into the indigo depths of the vastness around. In thought he spanned the wide spaces and leaped still toward the future. Before him the gray-haired mother who trembled to hold him once more in her arms, behind him the young wife waiting for his return, enclosing him serenely and adoringly in her heart. Each day while on shipboard David wrote to Cassandra, voluminously. He found it a pleasant way of passing the hours. He described his surroundings and unfolded such of his anticipations as he felt she could best understand, and with which she could sympathize trying to explain to her what the years to come might hold for them both, and telling her always to wait with patience for his return. This could not be known definitely until he had looked into the state of his uncle's affairs, which would hereafter be his own. Sometimes his letter contained only a review of some of the happiest hours they had spent together, as if he were placing his thoughts of those blessed days on paper that they might be for their mutual communing. Sometimes he discoursed of the calamity he had suffered, the uselessness of his brother's death, and the cruelty and wastefulness of war. At such times he was minded to write her of the opportunity now given him to serve his country, and the power he might some day attain to promote peace and avert rash legislation. Never once did he allow an inadvertent word to slip from his pen, whereby she could suspect that she, as his wife, might be a cause of embarrassment to him, or a clog in the wheel of the chariot which from now on was to bear him triumphantly among his social friends or political enemies. Never would he disturb the sweet serenity that encompassed her. Yet well he knew what an incongruity she would appear should he present her now, as she had stood by her loom or in the ploughed field at his side, to the company he would find in his mother's home. Simple and direct as she was, she would walk over their conventions and proprieties and never know it. How strange many of those customs of theirs would appear to her, and how unnecessary! He feared for her most in her utter ignorance of everything pertaining to the daily existence of the over-civilized circle to which the changed conditions of his life would bring her. Much he knew would pass unseen by her, but soon she would begin to understand, and to wince under their exclamations of, How extraordinary! The mask-like expression would steal over her face. Her pride would encase her spirit in the deep reserve he himself had found so hard to penetrate, and he could see her withdrawing more and more from all, until at last, ah, it must not be. He must manage very carefully, lest Dr. Hoyle's prophecy indeed be fulfilled. At last the lifting of the veil to the eastward revealed the bold promontory of Land's End, and soon beyond, the fair green slopes of his own beautiful old England. For all of the captious criticism he had fallen in the way of bestowing upon her, how he loved her! He felt as if he must throw up his arms and shout for joy. Suddenly she had become his, with a sense of possession new to him, and sweet to feel. The orderliness and stereotyped lines of her social system against which he had rebelled, and the iron bars of her customs which his soul had abhorred in the past, against which his spirit had bruised and beaten itself. 
now lured him on as a security for things stable and fine. In subtle ways as yet unrealized, he was being drawn back into the cage from which he had fled for freedom and life. How quickly he had become accustomed to the air of deference in Mr. Stretton's continual use of his newly acquired title, My Lord. Why not? It was his right. The same laws which had held him subservient before now gave him this, and he who a few months earlier had been proudly ploughing his first furrows in his little leased farm on a mountain meadow, now walked with lifted head, to the manor born, along the platform, and entered the first-class compartment with Mr. Stretton, where a few rich Americans had already installed themselves. David noticed, with inward amusement, their surreptitious glances when the lawyer addressed him, how they plumed themselves, yet tried to appear nonchalant and indifferent to the fact that they were riding in the same compartment with a lord. In time he would cease to notice even such incongruities as this tacit homage from a professedly title-scorning people. David's mother had moved into the townhouse, whither his uncle had sent for her, when, stricken with grief, he had lain down for his last brief illness. The old servants had all been retained, and David was ushered to his mother's own sitting-room by the same household dignitary who was wont to preside there when, as a lad, he had been allowed rare visits to his cousins in the city. How well he remembered his fine, punctilious old uncle, and the feeling of awe tempered by anticipation with which he used to enter those halls. He was overwhelmed with a sense of loss and disaster as he glanced up the great stairway where his cousins were wont to come bounding down to him, handsome, hardy, romping lads. It had been a man's household, for his aunt had been dead many years, a man's household characterized by a man's sense of heavy order without the many touches of feminine occupation and arrangement which tend to soften a man's half-military reign. As he was being led through the halls, he noticed a subtle change which warmed his quick senses. Was it the presence of his mother and Laura? His entrance interrupted an animated conversation which was being held between the two as the manservant announced his name, and then another instant his mother was in his arms. Dear little mother, dear little mother! But she was not small. She was tall and dignified, and David had to stoop but little to bring his eyes level with hers. David, I'm here too. A hand was laid on his arm, and he released his mother to turn and look into two warm brown eyes. And so the little sister is grown up, he said, embracing her, then holding her off at arm's length. Five years. When I look at you, mother, they don't seem so long. But Laura here. You didn't expect me to stay a little girl all my life, did you, David? No, no. He took her by the shoulder and shook her a little and pinched her cheeks. What roses! Why, sis, I say, you know I'm proud of you. What have you been up to, anyway? He flung himself on the sofa and pulled her down beside him. Give an account of yourself. I've gone in for athletics. Right. And, oh, lots of things. You give an account of yourself. David glanced at his mother. She was seated opposite them, regarding him with brimming eyes. No, he could not give an account of himself yet. He would wait until he and his mother were alone. He lifted Laura's heavy hair, which, confined only by a great bow of black ribbon, hung streaming down her back in a dark mass that gave her a tussled, unkempt look, and which, taken together with her dead black dress and her dark tanned skin, roughened by exposure to wind and sun, greatly marred her beauty, in spite of her roses and the warmth of her large dark eyes. As David surveyed his sister, he thought of Cassandra, and was minded then and there to describe her, to attempt to unveil the events of the past year, and make them see and know, as far as possible, what his life had been. He held this thought a moment, poised ready for utterance, a moment of hesitation as to how to begin, and then forever lost as his mother began speaking. Laura hasn't come out yet. As events have turned, it is just as well, for her chances naturally will be much better now than they would have been if we had had her coming out last year. I don't see how, Mama, with all this heavy black. 
I can't come out until I leave it off, and it will be so long to wait. Laura pouted a little, discontentedly, then flushed a disfiguring flush of shame under her dark skin as she caught the look in her brother's eyes. Not but what I shall keep on mourning for Bob as long as I live. He was such a dear, she added, her eyes filling with quick, impulsive tears. But how you make out my chances will be better now, Mama. I can't see, really. I look such a fright. Chances for what? asked David dryly. For matrimony, naturally, his sister flung out defiantly, half smiling through her tears. Don't you know that's all a girl of my age lives for, matrimony and a kennel? I mean to have one. Now we will have our own preserves. It will be ripping, you know. Certainly our own preserves, said David, still dryly, thinking how Cassandra would wonder what preserves were, and what she would say if told that in preserves wild harmless animals were kept from being killed by the common people for food, in order that those of his own class might chase them down and kill them for their amusement. Oh, David, I remember how you used to be always putting on a look like that and thinking a lot of nasty things under your breath. I hoped you would come home vastly improved. Was it what I said about matrimony? Mama knows it's true. Hardly as you put it, my child. There is much besides for a girl to think about. You said chances yourself, Mama. Certainly, but that is for me to consider. You must remember that it was you who refused to have your coming out last year. I didn't want my good times cut short then, Mama, and have to take up proprieties, or at least I would have had to be dreadfully proper for a while anyway. And now, why, well, I have to be naturally, and here I am unable to come out for another year yet, and my hair streaming down my back all the time. I'm sure I can't see how my chances are in the least improved by it all, and by that time I shall be so old. Oh, you will be quite young enough, said David. You occupy a far different position now, child. To make your debut as Lady Laura will give you quite another place in the world. Your headstrong postponement, fortunately, will do no harm. It will make your introduction to the circle where you are eventually to move much simpler. Laura lifted her eyebrows and glanced from her mother to her brother. Very well, Mama. But one thing you might as well know now. I shan't drop some of my friends if being Lady Laura lifts me above them as high as the moon. I like them and I don't care. She whistled, and a beautiful silken haired setter crept from under the sofa whereon she had been sitting and wriggled about after the manner of guilty dogs. Laura, dear. Yes, Mamma, I've been hiding him with my skirts by sitting there. He was bad and followed me in. We've been out riding together. She stroked his silken coat with her riding crop. Mamma won't allow him in here, and he jolly well knows it. Bad zip, bad sir. Look at him. Isn't he clever? I must go and dress for dinner. Mamma wants you to herself, I know, and Mr. Stretton will be here soon. You can't think, David, how glad I am we have you back. You couldn't think it from my way, but I am, rather. It's been awful here, simply awful, since the boys all left. Again her eyes filled with quick tears, and she dashed out with the dog bounding about her and leaping up to thrust his great tongue in her face. "'You are too big for the house, Zip. Down, sir.' In an instant she was back, putting her tussled head in at the door. "'David, when Mama is finished with you, come out and see my dogs. I have five already, and Nancy is going to litter soon. Calkins is to take them into the country tomorrow, for they are just cooped up here.' She withdrew, and David heard her heavy-soled shoes clatter down the long halls. He and his mother smiled as they listened, looking into each other's eyes. She is a dear child, but life means only a good time to her as yet. Well, let it. She has splendid stuff in her, and is bound to make a splendid woman. She's right, David. It has been awful since your brother left. David sat beside her and placed his hand on hers. Again it was in his mind to tell her of Cassandra, and again he was stopped by the tenor of her next remark. "'You see how it is, my son. Laura can't understand, but you will.' "'I'm not sure that I do. Open your heart to me, mother. Tell me what you mean.' "'My dear son, I don't like to begin with worries. 
It is so sweet to have you back in the home. May you always stay with us. I don't mind the worries, mother, he said tenderly. I am here to help you. What is it? It is only that, although we have inherited the title and estates, we are not there. We will be received, of course, but at first only by those who have axes to grind. There are so many such, and it is hard to protect oneself from them. For instance, there is Lady Willisbeck. Her own set have cut her completely for certain reasons. There is no need to retail unpleasant gossip. But she was one of the first to call. Her daughter, Lady Isabel, gave Laura that dog, but all the more because Laura and Lady Isabel were in school together and were on the same hockey team. They will have that excuse for clinging to us like burrs. Lady Willisbeck would like very much now, for her daughter's sake, to win back her place in society, although she did not seem to value it for herself. Long before her mother's life became common talk, because she was infatuated with your cousin, Lyon, Lady Isabel chose Laura for her chum, and the two have worked up a very romantic situation out of the affair. You see, I have cause for anxiety, David. Since the title is only mine and Laura's by courtesy, we must not presume upon it. He still held her hand, looking kindly in her face. "'Is Lady Isabel the right sort?' he asked. "'What do you mean by the right sort, David? She isn't like her mother, naturally, or I would have been more decided. But she is not the right sort for us. Lady Willisbeck is ostracized, and it is a grave matter. Her daughter will be ostracized with her, unless she can find a chaperone of quality to champion her to—' to, well, you understand that Laura can't afford to make her debut handicapped with such a friendship. Not now. I fail to see until I know more of her friend. But, David, we can't be visionary now. We must be practical and face the difficulties of our situation. We are honorably entitled to all that the inheritance implies, but it is another thing to avail ourselves of it. Your uncle led a most secluded life. He had no visitors, and was known only among men, and politically as a close conservative. His seat in the house meant only that. So now we enter a circle in which we never moved before, and we are not of it. For the present, our deep mourning is prohibitory, but it is also Laura's protection, although she does not know it. His mother paused. She was not regarding him. She seemed to be looking into the future, and a little line— which had formed during the years of David's absence, deepened in her forehead. Be a little more explicit, mother. Protection from what? From undesirable people, dear. We are very conspicuous. To be frank, we are new. My own family connections are all good, but they will not be the slightest help to Laura in maintaining her position. We have always lived in the country and know no one. You have refinement and good taste, mother. I know it that in this inheritance and the title. Isn't that protection enough? I really fail to see. Whatever would please you would be right. You may have what friendships you— Not at all, David. Everything is iron-bound. They are simply watching lest we bring a lot of common people in our train. Things grow worse and worse in that way. There are so many rich tradespeople who are struggling to get in, and clinging desperately to the skirts of the poorer nobility. Of course, it all goes to show what a tremendous thing good birth is, and the iron laws of custom are, after all, a proper safeguard and should be respected. Nevertheless, we, who are so new, must not allow ourselves to become stepping-stones. It is perfectly right. That is why I said this period of mourning is Laura's protection. She will have time to know what friendships are best, and an opportunity to avoid undesirable ones. You have been away so long, David— where the class lines are not so rigidly drawn that you forget or never knew. It is my duty, without any foolish sentiment, to guard Laura and see to it that her coming out is what it should be. For one thing, she is so very plain. If she were a beauty, it would help, but her plainness must be compensated for in other ways. She will have a large settlement, Mr. Stretton thinks, if your uncle's interests are not too much jeopardized in South Africa by this terrible war. That is something you will have to look into before you take your seat in the house. Oh, mother, mother, I can't. My dear boy, your brother died for his country, and you cannot give a little of your life for it? 
I can rely on you to be practically inclined, now that you are placed at the head of such a family. I'm glad now you never cared for Muriel Hunt. She could never have filled the position as her ladyship your uncle's wife did. She was Lady Thomasina Harcourt Glendon of Wales. Beside her, Muriel would appear silly. It is most fortunate you have no such entanglement now. Mother, mother, I am astounded. I never dreamed my dear, beautiful mother could descend to such worldliness. You are changed, mother. There is something fundamentally wrong in all this. She looked up at him, aghast at his vehemence. My son, my son, let us have only love between us, only love. I am not changed. I was content as I was, nor ever tried to enter a sphere above me. Now that this comes to me, forced on me by right of English law, I take it thankfully with all it brings. I will fill the place as it should be filled, and Laura shall do the same, and you also, my son. As for Muriel Hunt, I will make concessions if, if your happiness demands it. David groaned inwardly. No, mother, no. It goes deeper than Muriel. It goes deeper. They had both risen. She placed her hands on his shoulders and looked levelly in his eyes, and her own lightened, through tears, held bravely back. It may well go deeper than Muriel and still not go very deep. And yet the time was when Muriel Hunt was thought quite deep enough, he said sadly, still looking in his mother's eyes, but she only continued. Never doubt for a moment, dear, that Laura's welfare and yours are dearer to me than life. You are very weary, I see it in your eyes. Have you been to your apartment? Clark will show you. She kissed his brow and departed. End of chapter 25 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter Twenty Six of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Twenty Six. In which David Thring adjusts his life to new conditions. David stood where his mother had left him, dazed, hurt, sad. He was desperately minded to leave all and flee back to the hills, back to the life he had left in Canada. He saw the clear, true look of Cassandra's eyes meeting his. His heart called for her. His soul cried out within him. He felt like one launched on an irresistible current which was sweeping him ever nearer to a maelstrom wherein he was inevitably to be swallowed up. He perceived that to his mother the established order of things there in her little island was sacred, an arrangement to be still further upheld and solidified. She had suddenly become a part of a great system, entrusted with a care for its maintenance and stability as one of its guardians. Before, it had mattered little to her, for she was not of it. Now it was very different. Slowly David followed Clark to his own apartments. He had been given those of the old lord, his uncle. Everything about him was dark, massive, and rich, but without grace. His bags and boxes had been unpacked, and his dinner suit laid in readiness, and Clark stood stiffly awaiting orders. "'Will you have a shave, my lord?' The man's manner jarred on him. It was obsequious, and he hated it. Yet it was only the custom. Clark was simple-hearted and kindly, filling his little place in the upholding of the system of which he was a part. Had his manner been different, a shade more familiar, David would have resented it and ordered him out. But of this David was not conscious. In spite of his scruples, he was born and bred an aristocrat. No, uh, I'll shave myself. 
Still the man waited, and taking up David's coat, flicked a particle of dust from the collar. I don't want anything. You may go. Thank you, Clark melted quietly out of the apartment. Thanks me for being rude to him, thought David irritably. I shall take pleasure in being rude to him. My God, what a farce life is over here. The whole thing is a farce. He shaved himself and cut his chin, and when he appeared later with a patch of court plaster thereon, Clark commented to himself on his lordship's inability to do the shaving properly. As David thought over his mother's words, her outlook on life, his sister's idle aims, the companionship she must have, and the kind of talk to which she must listen, he grew more and more annoyed. He contrasted it all with the past. His mother, who had been so noble and fine, seemed to have lost individuality, to have become only a segment of a circle which was henceforth to be her highest care to keep intact. Laura must become a part of the same sacred ring, and he, too, must join hands with those who formed it and make it his duty to keep others out. There were also other circles guarded and protected by this one, circles within circles, each smaller and more exclusive than the last. The object of the huge game of life over here seemed to be to keep the great mass of those whom they regarded as commonality out of any one of the circles, while striving individually, each to climb into the next one above, and more contracted. The most maddening thing of all was to find his grave, dignified mother drawn in and made a partaker in this meaningless strife. Still essentially an outsider, David could look with larger vision, the far-seeing vision of the western land, the hilltops and the dividing sea, and to him now the circles seemed verily concentric rings of the maelstrom into which events were hurrying him. Would he be able to rise from the swirling flotsam and ride free? The deeper philosophy underlying it all he as yet but vaguely understood. That the highest good for all could only be maintained by stability in the commonwealth, as the tremendous rock foundations of the earth are a support for the growth thereon of all perfection, all grace and beauty that the concentric rings when rightly understood should become a means of purification of reward for true worth of power for noblest service and not for personal ambition and the unmolested gratification of vicious tastes david did not as yet know that his clear-seeing wife could help him to the attainment of his greatest possibilities right here where he feared to bring her the wife of whom he dare not tell his mother blinded by the world's estimates which he still had sense enough to despise he did not know that the key to its deepest secrets lay in her heart nor that of the two her heritage of the large spirit and the inward seeing eye direct to the creator's meanings was the greater heritage lady thring found it possible to have a few words with the lawyer before david appeared and impressed upon him the necessity of interesting her son in this new field by showing him avenues for power and work. "'I don't quite understand the boy,' she said. "'After seeing the world and going his own way, I really thought he would outgrow that sort of moody sentimentalism, but it seems to be returning. He is quixotic enough to turn away from everything here and go back to Canada, unless you can awaken his interest.' i see i see said the lawyer mere personal ambition will not satisfy him added his mother proudly he must see opportunities for service he must understand that he is needed i see i understand he must be dealt with along the line of his nobler impulses ahem, ahem. and david appeared 
His mother rose and took his arm to walk out to dinner, while Laura, who should have gone with Mr. Stretton, did not see his proffered arm, but provokingly indifferent, strolled out by herself. David, absorbed in his own thoughts, did not notice his sister's careless mien, but the mother observed the independent and boyish swing of her daughter's shoulders, and resented it with a slightly reproving glance after they were seated. Laura lifted her eyebrows and one shoulder, with an irritating half-shrug. "'What is it, mamma? she asked. But Lady Thring allowed the question to go unheeded, and turned her attention to the two gentlemen during the rest of the meal. All through dinner David was haunted by Cassandra's talk with him, the night he dreamed she was being swept out of his arms forever by a swift, cold current, which from a little purling stream high up on a mountain top had become a dark, relentless flood, overwhelming them utterly. What was she doing now? Did she know she was in that terrible flood? Was she really being swept from him? Ah, never, never. He would not allow it if he must break all hearts but hers. The meal progressed somberly and heavily, with much ceremony, although they were so few. Was his mother practicing for the future that she kept such rigid state? He suspected as much, and that Laura was being trained to the right way of carrying herself, but that and the real sorrow of the family over their bereavement made a most oppressive atmosphere. Might this be the shadow Cassandra had seen lying across their future? Only a passing cloud, a vapor. It must be only that. Laura and her mother withdrew early, leaving David and the lawyer together, when Mr. Stretton immediately launched into talk of David's prospects and resources. In spite of himself, the gloom of the dinner hour slipped from him, and soon he was taking the liveliest interest in what might be possible for him here and now. Although not one to be easily turned from a chosen path by outside influence, David yet had that almost fatal gift of the imaginative mind of seeing things from many sides, until at times they took on a kaleidoscopic reversibility. Now this unlooked-for development of his life opened to him a vista, new, and yet old, old as England herself. While digging deep into the causes of his former discontent, he had come to strike his spade upon the rock foundations wherein all this complicated superstructure of English society and national life was builded. He saw that every nobleman inherited with his title and his lands a responsibility for the welfare of the whole people, from the poorest laborer in the ditch or the coal mine, to the head wearing the crown and that it was the blindness of individuals like himself or his uncle before him, their misuse or unscrupulous indifference to and abuse of power, which had brought about those conditions under which the masses were writhing and against which they were crying out. He saw that it was only by the earnest efforts of the few who did understand, the few who were not indifferent, that the stability of English government was still her glory. At last he rose and lifted his arms high above his head, then dropped them to his side. I see. He held up his head, and looked off as he had done when he stood on the prow of the steamship with the salt breeze tossing his hair. A little of this came to me as I crossed the ocean, when I saw the green slopes of England again. I knew I loved her, and the old feeling of impotence that hounded me in the past, when I could do nothing but rebel, slipped from me. I felt what it might be to have power, to become effective, instead of being obliged to chafe under the yoke of an imposed submission to things which are wrong, things which those who are in power might set right if they would. I believe, for a moment, Mr. Stretton, I felt it all. He paused and bowed his head. All at once, in the midst of his exaltation, he saw Cassandra, standing white and still, as he had seen her on the hilltop before their little cabin, looking after him when he bade her good-bye. And just as he then turned and went swiftly back to her, 
so now in his soul he turned to her yearningly and took her to his breast still penetrating the sweet white halo of this vision he heard the voice of mr stretton deferentially droning on and with your resources the wealth which with a little care and thought just now at this crucial moment will be yours still david stood with bowed head it is as if you were predestined my lord to step in at a crucial time of your country's need with brains education conscience and wealth with every obstacle swept away still before him stood cassandra white and silent he could see only her every obstacle swept away repeated the lawyer and cassandra god help her and me david slowly turned lifted a glass of wine from the table and drank it well so be it so be it he said aloud we'll join mother and laura at the door he paused you spoke of education the learning of a physician is but little in the line of statesmanship how soon will i be expected to take my seat if you ask my advice my lord i would say better wait a year it will be advisable for you to go yourself to south africa and look into your uncle's investments there as a private individual of course not as a public servant two-thirds of the receipts have fallen off since the war learn what may be saved from the wreckage or if there be a wreckage i am inclined to think not all for the investments were varied your uncle may have been a silent member but he was certainly a man of good business judgment mr stretton paused and coughed a little apologetically before adding not an inherited talent only uh cultivated cultivated you know good business judgment is not a trait inherent in our peerage as a rule david was amused and entered the drawing-room with a smile on his face his mother was pleased and rose instantly coming forward with both hands extended to take his he understood it as a welcome back to the family circle the quiet talks and the evening lamp less formal than the oppressive dinner had been he held her hands thus offered and kissed the little anxious line on her brow then playfully smoothed it with his finger we mustn't let it become permanent you know mother no david it will go now you are home he did not know that his mother and laura had been having a lively discussion apropos of the silent tilt at the dinner table his sister pleading for a return to the old ways and a release from such state and ceremony at least while we are by ourselves mamma anyway i know david will just hate it and i don't see what good a title is if we must become perfect slaves to it david crossed the room and sat down before the piano how strange this old place seems without the others bob and the cousins and uncle himself we weren't admitted often but shh shh said laura who had followed him and stood at his side don't remind mamma she remembers too much all the time play the king's hunting jig david remember how you used to play it for me every evening after dinner when i was a girl do i remember rather i have done nothing with the piano since then when you were a girl i'll play it for you now while you are a girl but i really am grown up now david it's quite absurd for me to go about like this it's only because mamma chooses to have it so she even keeps a governess for me still to her you are a child and to me you are still a girl and a mighty fine one it's so good to have you back david you haven't forgotten the jig where's your flute get it and i'll accompany you i can drum a little now after a fashion we'll let them talk so they amused themselves for the rest of the evening with music and lady thring's face lost the strained and harassed expression it had worn all during dinner and took on a look of contentment 
After this, the days were spent by David in going over his uncle's large mass of papers and correspondence, with the aid of Mr. Stretton and a secretary. A colossal task it proved to be. No one, even his lawyer, who had his confidence more than any one else, knew in what the old Lord Thring's wealth really consisted, although Mr. Stretton surmised much of his surplus income of late years had been placed in Africa. As his papers had not been set in order or tabulated for years, every note, land loan, mortgage, and rental had to be unearthed slowly and laboriously from among a mass of written matter and figures more or less worthless. For the old lord had a habit of saving every scrap of paper, the backs of notes and letters, for summing up accounts and jotting down memoranda and dates. Certain hours of each day David devoted to this labor, collecting his papers in a small room opening off from the law chambers of Mr. Stretton, where for years his uncle had kept a private safe. Conscientiously he toiled at the monotonous task, until weeks, then months, slipped by, hardly noticed, ignoring all social life. When his mother or Laura broached the subject, he would say, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, and this must be done first. He was not unmindful of his wife during this interval, but wrote frequently, and to guard against any danger of her being left without resources, should something unforeseen befall him, he placed in Bishop Tower's hands the residue of money remaining to him in Canada, for Cassandra. He wrote her to use it as occasion required, and not to spare it, that it was hers without restriction. He sent her the names of books he wished she would read, that she should write the publishers for them, he begged her to do no more weaving for money, but only for her own amusement, and above all, to trust and be happy, not to be sorrowful for this long delay, which he would cut as short as he could. Much of his occupation he could not explain to her, and oft-times it was hard to find matter for his letters. Then he would revert to reminiscence. These were the letters she loved best, and sometimes wept over, and these were the letters that often left him dreamy and sad, and sometimes made him distraught when his mother and Laura talked over their affairs, so utterly alien to his thoughts and longings. Cassandra's replies were for the most part short, but they were sent with unfailing regularity, and always they seemed to bring with them a breath from her own mountain top, naive, tender, absolutely trusting often quaintly worded, and telling of the simple, innocent things of her life. He could see that she held herself in reserve, even as her nature was. A psychologic something was held back. He could not dream what it might be, but reasoned with himself that it was only that she found it harder to unveil her thoughts by means of the pen than in speech. One day, as he rode alone in the park, he noticed that the leaf buds were swelling. What? Was spring upon them? A white fog was lifting, and every twig and stem held its tiny pearl of wetness. All the earth glistened and was clean, and looked as if greenness was returning. He regarded the artificial effects around him, the long lines of trees and set clumps of shrubbery, and was seized with a desire well-nigh irresistible for the wild roads and rugged steeps, the wandering streams and sound of falling waters. He saw it all again, the blossoming spring where Cassandra sat waiting for him, and he resolved to start without delay, to go to her and bring her back with him. All this sordid calculation of the amount of his fortune, his mother's and his sister's shares, the annuities of poor dependents, stocks to be bought, interest to be invested, the government, and his future part therein. Fah! It must wait. He would have his own. His heritage should not be his curse. He returned in haste that day, only to learn that certain facts had been unearthed which necessitated a journey into Wales, where interest of the former Lady Thring's estates were concerned. 
his uncle had inherited all from her with the exception of certain bequests to relatives with which he had been entrusted some of the records had been lost and whether the beneficiaries were dead or not none knew but now and then letters came pleading for a continuance of former favors and recalling obligations mr stretton had been ill for a week and now that the records were found david must go and go at once the lawyer had many subjects for investigation to deliver to david there was the deathbed request of an old nurse of his aunt who had an annuity that it be extended to her crippled granddaughter she lived among the cornish hills would he hunt the family up and learn if they were worthy or impostors his uncle had been endlessly plagued with such importunities and so on and so on yes certainly david would go he made a mental reservation that he would sail without returning to london and then make a clean breast of his affairs by letter to his mother she had improved in health during the winter and he thought his information would be received by her with more equanimity than it would have been earlier moreover she had broached the subject of marriage to him more than once but always in one of her most worldly moods when he shrank from hearing cassandra spoken of as he knew she would be when he could not hear her discussed nor reply with calmness to such questions as he knew must ensue david had little time to brood over his peculiar difficulty as his short journey was full of business interests and new experiences yet the cornish hills awoke in him a still greater eagerness for the mountains of his dreams and after securing his passage he went to his hotel to prepare the letter to his mother it is marvellous what trivial events alter destinies in this instance it was the yapping of a small dog which changed david's plans and finally sent him to south africa instead of america while paying his bill at the hotel a telegram was handed him which he tore open as the clerk was counting out his change he still held in his hand the letter to his mother which he was on the point of dropping in the letter-box at his elbow instead he thrust it in his pocket along with the crushed telegram and taking a cab hastened to the steamship offices to cancel his date for sailing the message read return with all speed to london mr stretton lying in the hospital with a fractured skull thus it was that lady treadwell's pet spaniel old and vicious yapping at the heels of mr stretton's restive horse while my lady's maid who should have been leading him out for an airing was absorbed in listening to the complaints of one of the park guards played so dire a part in the affairs of david thring End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter twenty seven. In which the old doctor and little Hoyle come back to the mountains. Cassandra, seated on the great hanging rock before her cabin, watched the sunrise, where David had so often stood and waited for the dawn during his winter there alone. This morning the mists obscured the valleys and the base of the mountains, while the sky and the whole earth glowed with warm rose color. Presently she rose and walked with lifted head into the cabin and prepared to light a fire on the hearth in the canvas room the bed was made smoothly as she had made it the morning david left no one had slept in it since although cassandra spent most of her days there everything he had used was carefully kept as he had left it his microscope covered with dust stood with the last specimen still under the lens a book they were reading together lay on the corner shelf 
with the mark still in the place where they had read last. After lighting the fire, she sat near it, watching the flames steal up from the small pile of fat pine chips underneath, sending up red tongues of fire until the great logs were wrapped in the hot embrace of the flames, trembling, quivering, and leaping high in their mad joy, transmuting all they touched. It's like love, she murmured and smiled, only it's quicker. It does in one hour what love takes a lifetime to do. Those logs might have lain on the ground and rotted if they'd been left alone, but now the fire just holds them and caresses them like, and they grow warm and glow like the sun, and give all they can while they last until they're almost too bright to look at. I reckon God has been right good to me not to let me lie and rot my life away. He sent David to set my heart on fire, and I guess I can wait for him to come back to me in God's own time. She rose and brought from the canvas room a basket of willow, woven in open-work pattern. It was a gift from Azalea, who had learned from her mother the art of basket-weaving. Some said Azalea's grandmother was half Indian, and that it was from her they had learned their quaint patterns and shapes, and that she and her Indian mother before her had been famous basket-weavers. This pretty basket was filled with very delicate work of fine muslin, much finer than anything Cassandra had ever worked upon before. Her hands no longer showed signs of having been employed in rough, coarse tasks. They were soft and white. She placed the basket of dainty sewing on the same table, which had served as an altar when she knelt beside David and was made his wife. It was serving as an altar still, bearing that basket of delicate work. She had become absorbed in a book, not one of those David had suggested. It was doubtful, had he been there, whether he would have really liked to see her reading this one, although it was written by Thackeray, dear to all English hearts. It is more than probable that he would have thought his young wife hardly need be enlightened upon just the sort of things with which Vanity Fair enriches the understanding. Be it how it may, Cassandra was reading Vanity Fair, which she found in the box of books David had opened so long before. While she read, she worked with her fingers incessantly at a piece of narrow lace with a shuttle and very fine thread. This she did so mechanically that she could easily read at the same time by propping the book open on the table before her. For a long time she sat thus growing more and more interested, until the fire burned low, and she rose to replenish it. The logs were piled beside the door of the small kitchen David had built for her, and where he had placed the cook stove. She had come up early this morning, because she was sad over his last letter, in which he had told her of his disappointment in having to cancel his passage to America. Hopeful and cheery though the letter was, it had struck dismay to her heart. It was her way, when sad and longing for her husband, to go up to her little cabin, her own home, and think it all over alone, and thus regain her equanimity. Here she read and thought things out by herself. What strange people they were over there! Or perhaps that was so long ago. They might have changed by this time. Surely they must have changed, or David would have said something about it. He never would become a lord, to be one of such people. Never, never. It was not at all like David. A figure appeared in the doorway. Cassandra, what are you doing in there all by yourself? It was Betty Towers. Cassandra ran joyfully forward and clasped the little woman in her arms. Almost carrying her in, she sat her by the pleasant open fire. Then seeing Betty's eyes regarding her questioningly, she suddenly dropped into her own chair by the table, leaned her head upon her arms, and began to weep silently. 
in an instant betty was kneeling by her side holding the lovely head to her breast dearest you shan't cry you shan't cry like that tell me all about it why on earth doesn't dr thring come home cassandra lifted her head and dried her tears he was coming the last letter but one said he was to sail next day then last night came another saying the only man who could look after very important business for him had been thrown from his horse and hurt so bad he may die and david had to give up his passage and go back to london he may have to go to africa he felt right bad but goodness me child why he has no business now more important than you what a chump cassandra stiffened proudly and drew away taking up her shuttle and beginning her work calmly as if nothing had happened to destroy her composure i've not written david anything to disturb him or make him hurry home oh cassandra cassandra you're not treating either him or yourself fairly for him i can't help it and for me i don't care other women have got along as best they could in these mountains and i can bear what they have borne but why on earth haven't you told him cassandra bent her head lower over her bit of lace and was silent betty drew her chair nearer and put her arms about the drooping girl can't you tell me all about it dear not if you're going to blame david i won't you lovely thing i can't since he doesn't know but why at first i couldn't speak i tried but i couldn't then he had to take hoyle north and i thought he would see for himself when he came back or i could tell him by that time then came that dreadful news you know four all dead his brother and his two cousins all killed and his uncle dying of grief and he had to go to his mother as she might die too and then he found so much to do now you know he has to be a she was going to say a lord but happening to glance down at her open book the name of lord stein caught her eye and it seemed to her a title of disgrace she must talk with david before she allowed him to be known as a lord so she ended hurriedly he has to be a different kind of a man now not a doctor he has a great many things to do and look after if i told him he would leave everything and come to me even if he ought not and if he couldn't come he would be troubled and unhappy why should i make him unhappy when he does come home he'll be glad oh so glad why need he know when the knowing will do no good and when he will come to me as soon as he can anyway you strange girl cassandra you brave old dear but he must come that's all it is his right to know and to come i can tell him let me no no please miss towers you must not he will come back as soon as he can and now now he will be too late since he he did not sail when he meant to betty rose with a set look about the mouth unless we cable him cassandra would there be time in that case come you must tell me no no wailed the girl and now he must not know until he comes it would be cruel i will not let you write him or cable him either then what will you do oh i don't know i'll think out a way you'll help me think but you must promise me not to write to david i send him a letter every day but i never tell him anything that would make him uneasy because he has very important business there for his mother and sister even more than for himself 
you see how bad i would be to write troubling things to him when he couldn't help me or come to me a light broke over betty tower's face i can think out a way dear of course i can just leave matters to me thus it was that dr hoyle received a letter in betty's own impassioned and impulsive style begging him for love's sake to leave all and come back to the mountains and his own little cabin where cassandra needed him never mind dr thring or anything surprising about his being absent just come if you possibly can and hear what cassandra has to say about it before you judge him she is quaint and queer and wholly lovely if you can bring little hoyle with you do so for i fear his mother is grieving to see him she wrote me a most peculiar and pathetic letter saying her daughter was so silent about her affairs that she herself were nigh about dead for worrying and would i please come and see could i make Cass talk a little so you may be sure there is need of you the winter is glorious in the mountains this year your appearance will set everything right at the fall place and cassandra will be safe old time the unfailing who always marches apace bringing with him changes for good or evil brought the dear old doctor back to the fall place brought the small adam hoyle with his queer little twisted neck and hunched back drawn by harness and plaster into a much improved condition although not straight yet brought many letters from david filled with postponements and regrets therefore and brought also a little son for cassandra to hold to her bosom and dream and pray over and the dreams and the prayers travelled far far to the sunny-haired englishman wrapped in the intricate affairs of a great estate how much money would accrue how should it be spent what improvements should be made in their country home when laura's coming out should be how many of her old companions might she retain how many might she call friends how many were to be hereafter thrust out is quite impossible should she be allowed a kennel or should her sporting tendencies be discouraged all these things were forced upon david's consideration how then could he return to his young wife especially when he could not yet bring himself to say to his world that he had a young wife impatient he might be nervous and even irritable but still what could he do while there in the far-away hills sat cassandra loving him brooding over him with serene and peaceful longing holding his baby to her white breast holding his baby's hand to her lips full of courage strong in her faith patient in spirit until as days and weeks passed she grew well and strong in body being sadly in need of rest the old doctor lingered on in the mountains until spring was well advanced slight of body but vigorous and wiry and as full of scientific enthusiasm as when he was thirty years younger he tramped the hills taking long walks and climbs alone or shorter ones with hoyle at his heels like a devoted dog shrilling questions as he ran to keep up these the good doctor answered according to his own code or passed over as beyond possibility of reply with quizzical counter-questionings they sat together one day eating their luncheon in the shelter of a great wall of rock and below them lay a pool of clear water which trickled from a spring higher up now and then a bullfrog would sound his deep bass note and all the time the high piping of the peepers made shrill accompaniment to their voices as they conversed the doctor had made an aquarium for hoyle using a great glass jar which he obtained from a druggist in farrington they had come to-day on a quest for snails to eat the green growth which had so covered the sides of the jar as to hide the interesting water world within from the boy's eyes many things had already occurred in that small world to set the boy thinking dr hoyle 
do you remember that there queer bunch of little sticks and stones you put in my aquarium first day you fixed it for me yes yes well there's a right queer thing with a big head come out in it and he done eat up some of the little black bugs i seed him jump quicker than lightning at that littlest fish only so long and try to bite a piece out in his fin his lowest fin what he do that for why why he was hungry he made his dinner of the little black bugs and he wanted the fin for his dessert i don't like that kind of a beast once he was a worm in a kind of a hole box and then he turned into a little beast critter and what'll he be next next why next he'll be a fly a a beautiful fly with four wings all blue and gold and green i seen them things flying around in the summer it's queer how things gets themselves changed that away into something else from a worm into that beast critter and then into one of these here devil flies you reckon it'll ever get changed into something different some kind of bird a bird no no when he becomes a f fly he's finished and done for perhaps there's some folks that away too you reckon that's what ails me you why why what ails you you reckon perhaps i mount get changed some way out in this here queer back i got so's i can hold my head like other folks just go to sleep and wake up straight like frail the old doctor turned and looked down a moment on the child sitting hunched at his side his mouth worked as he meditated a reply what would you do if you could carry your head straight like frail if you'd been like him you would be running a still pretty soon you never would have come to me to set you straight and so you would never never have seen all the pictures and the great cities you're going to be a man before you know it and and i'll do a heap of things when i'm a man too but i wished i wished these here snails we've been hunting you reckon they're done growed to their shells so they can't get out what did god make em that away for it's all in the order of things everything has its place in the world and its work to do they don't want to get out they like to carry their bones on the outside of their bodies they're made so yes yes all in the order of things they like it you reckon you can tell me how come god allowed me to have this here lump on my back it ain't in no order of things for humans to be like i be the skeptical old man looked down on the child quizzically yet sadly his flexible mouth twitched to reply but he was silent hoyle looked back into the old doctor's eyes with grave direct gaze and turned away you reckon why he done it see here suppose just suppose you were given your choice this minute to change places with frail lord knows where he is now or what he's doing or be as you are and live your own life which would you be think it over think it out if i had a been straight brother david would never a took me up to you no 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 you would have been a you mean if a magic man should come by here and just touch me so and change me into frail would i allow him to do it that's what i mean i don't guess frail he'd like to be done that away the loving little chap nestled closer to the doctor's side 
I like you a heap, Dr. Hoyle. Frale, he fit Brother David, and nigh about killed him. I reckon I'd rather be like I be, and bide nigh Cass and the baby, and have the aquarium, and see Ma, and go with you. You reckon I can go back with you? Go back? Of course go back. Be I a heap of trouble to you? You reckon God allowed me to have this here hump? So that I could get to go and, and bide where you were at like a done? A suspicious moisture gathered in the doctor's eyes, and he sprang up and went to examine earnestly a thorny shrub some paces away, while the child continued to pipe his questions, for the most part unanswerable. You reckon God just give my neck or twist so Brother David would take me to Canada to you, and so's Maud allowed me do it? You reckon if I'm right good, he'll allow me to make a picture of the ocean some day, like the one we seed in that big house. You reckon if I tried right hard, I could paint a picture of the mountains yonder, and the sea, and, and all, all the ships? The doctor laughed heartily and merrily. Come, come, we must go home now to Cassandra and the baby. Paint? Of course you could paint. You could paint pictures enough to fill a house. We don't want no magic man, do we, Dr. Hoyle? I cried a heap after I seen myself in the big looking glass down in Farrington, where Brother David took me. I cried when it were dark and Ma were sleeping. Next time, I reckon I better tell God, much obliged for twisting my head around, stead of crying and taking on like I've been doing. You reckon so, Dr. Hoyle? Yes. Yes, yes, I reckon so, said the doctor meditatively as they descended the trail. From that day, the child's strength increased. Sunny and buoyant, he shook off the thought of his deformity, and his beauty-loving soul ceased introspective brooding and found delight in searching out beauty and in his creative faculty. End of chapter 27「The Mountain Girl」This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine Chapter 28 In Which Frail Returns to the Mountains Dr. Hoyle lingered until the last of the laurel bloom was gone, and the widow had become so absorbed in her grandchild as to make the parting much easier. Then he took the small Adam and departed for the north. Never did the kind old man dream that his frail and twisted little namesake would one day be the pride of his life and the comfort of his declining years. Hoyle sure do look a heap better than when Dr. David took him off that day. It did seem like I'd never see him again. Don't you guess that he's beginning to grow some? Seems like he do. The widow was seated on her little porch with the doctor the evening before they left, and Cassandra, who since the birth of the heir had been living again in her own little cabin, had brought the baby down. He lay on his grandmother's lap, quietly sleeping, while his mother gathered Hoyle's treasures and packed his diminutive trunk. The boy followed her, chattering happily, as she worked. She also had noticed the change in him, and suggested that perhaps, as he had gained such a start toward health, he need not return, but would do quite well at home. "'He's a care to you, doctor, although you're that kind and patient.' I don't see how ever we can thank you enough for all you've done. Then Hoyle, to their utter astonishment, threw himself on the ground at the doctor's feet and burst into bitter weeping. 
Why, son, are you crying that away so so you can get to go off and leave Ma here alone? But he continued to weep, and at last explained to them that the Lord done crooked him up that away, so as he could get to go and learn to be a painter and make a house full of pictures, and that the doctor had said he might. Dr. Hoyle lifted him to his knees with many assurances that he would keep his word, but for a long time the child sobbed hysterically, his face pressed against the old man's sleeve. "'What's that you sayin', child, about the Lord twistin' your neck? Better lay such as that to the devil, more than likely.' At the mention of that sinister individual, the babe wakened and stretched out his plump bare arms with little pink fists tightly closed. He yawned a prodigious yawn for so small a countenance, and gazed vacantly in his grandmother's face. Then a look of intelligence crept into his eyes, and he smiled one of those sweet, evanescent smiles of infancy. "'Look at him now laughing at me that away. He be the prettiest I ever did see. Cass, she sure be mean not to tell his father that he have a son. She sure be.' Cassandra came and tenderly took the babe in her arms and held him to her breast. There, there. Sleep, honey son. Sleep again, she cooed, swaying her body to the rhythm of her speech. Sleep, honey son. Sleep again. Don't you reckon she be mean to Dr. David, never to let on at he had a son and he a growin' that fast? You are doing his father mean, Cassandra. Still Cassandra swayed and sang, Sleep, honey son, sleep again. He never will forgive you when he finds out how you have done him. I can't make out what all ails you know how. Hush, mother. I'm just leaving his heart in peace. He'll come when he can, and then he'll forgive me. As the doctor walked slowly at her side that evening, carrying the sleeping child back to her cabin, he also ventured a remonstrance, but without avail. It's hardly fair to his father, such a fine little chap. You, you have a monopoly of him this way, you know. She flushed at the implication of selfishness, but said nothing. How? How is that? Don't you think so? he persisted kindly. I reckon you can't feel what I feel, doctor. Why should I make his heart troubled when he must stay there? David knows I hate it to bide so long without him. He, he knows. If he could get to come back, don't you guess he'd come right quick anyway? Would he come any sooner for his son than for me? It was the doctor's turn for silence. She asked again, this time with a tremor in her voice. You reckon he would, doctor? No, of, of course not, he cried. Then what would be the use of telling him, only to trouble him? He, he might like to think about him, you know. Might like it. He said he must go to Africa in May, so now he must have started. And our wedding was on May Day. Now it's the last of May. He must be there. He might be obliged to bide in that country a whole month, maybe two. Oh, it's so far away, and his letters take so long to come. Doctor, are they fighting there now? Sometimes I wake in the night and think what if he should die away off there in that far place. No, no, that's done. Not fighting, thank God. Rest your heart in peace. Now, after I'm gone, don't stay up here alone too much. I'm a physician, and I know what's best for you. She took the now soundly sleeping child from the doctor's arms and laid him on the bed in the canvas room. The day had been warm, and the fire was out in the great fireplace. The evening wind, light and cool, laden with sweet odors, swept through the cabin. They talked late that night of Hoyle and his future, but never a word more of David. The old man thought he now understood her feeling and respected it. 
She certainly had a right to one small weakness, the strong, fair creature of the hills. Her husband must release himself from his absorbing cares and return simply for love of her, not at the call of his baby's wail. So the doctor, in his diminutive namesake, drove contentedly away next morning in the great covered wagon. And Cassandra, standing by her mother's door, smiled and lifted her baby for one last embrace from his loving little uncle. I'm going to grow a big man, and I'll teach him to make pictures. Big ones, he called back. Yes, you'll do a heap. You better watch out to be right and pert. That's what you better do. David, not unmindful of affairs on the faraway mountainside, made it quite worth the while of the two cousins to stay on with the widow and run the small farm under Cassandra's directions, and she found herself fully occupied. She wrote David all the details, when and where things were planted, how the vines he had set on the hill slope were growing, how the pink rose he had brought from Hoke Belew's and planted by their threshold had grown to the top of the door and had three sweet blossoms. She had shaken the petals of one between the pages of her letter on May Day and sent it to remind him, she said. Nearly a month later than he had intended to sail, David left England, overwhelmed with many small matters which seemed so great to his mother and sister and burdened with duties imposed upon him by the realization that he had come into the possession of enormous wealth, more than he could comprehendingly estimate, and that he was now setting out to secure and prevent the loss of possible double what he already possessed. People gathered about him and presented him with worthy and unworthy opportunities for its disposal. They flocked to him in herds, with importunities and flatteries, the tower which he had built up with his ideals, and in which he had entrenched himself, was in danger of being undermined and toppled into ruins, burying his soul beneath the debris. When seated on the deck, the rose petals dropped into his hand as he tore open Cassandra's letter. Some, ere he could catch them, were caught up and blown away into the sea. He held them and inhaled their sweetness, and everything seemed to find its true value and proportion and to fall into its right place. Again on the mountain top with Cassandra at his side, he viewed in a perspective of varying gradations his life, his aims, and his possessions. The personality of his young wife, of late a vague thing to him, distant and fair, and haloed about with sweet memories dimly discerned like a dream that is past, presented itself to him all at once vivid and clear, as if he held her in his arms with her head on his breast. He heard again her voice with its quaint inflections and lingering tones. Their love for each other loomed large and became for him at once the one truly vital thing in all his share of the universe. Had his body been endowed with the wings of his soul, he would have left all and gone to her but alas for the restrictions of matter. He was gliding rapidly away and away, farther from the immediate attainment. Yet was his tower strengthened, wherein he had entrenched himself with his ideals. The withered rose petals had brought him exaltation of purpose. In the mountains, July came with unusually sultry heat, Yet the rich pocket of soil, watered by its never-failing stream, suffered little from the drought. Weeds grew apace, and Cassandra had much ado to hold her cousin Cotton Caswell, easy-going and thriftless, to his task of keeping the small farm in order. For a long time now, Cassandra had avoided those moments of far-seeing and brooding. Had not David said he feared them for her? In these days of waiting, she dreaded, lest they show her something to which she would rather remain blind. In the evenings, looking over the hilltops from her rock, visions came to her out of the clinging mists, but she put them from her and calmed her breast with the babe on her bosom, and solaced her longing 
by keeping all in readiness for David's return. Perhaps at any moment, with wind-lifted hair and buoyant smile, he might come up the laurel path. For this reason she preferred living in her own cabin home, and that she might not be alone at night, Martha Caswell or her brother slept on a cot in the large cabin room, but Cassandra cared little for their company. They might come or not as they chose. She was never afraid now that she was strong again and the baby was well. One evening, sitting thus, her babe lying asleep on her knees, and her heart over the sea, something caused her to start from her reverie and look away from the blue distance toward the cabin. There, a few paces away, regarding her intently, stalwart and dark, handsome and eager, stood Frale. Much older he seemed, more reckless he appeared, yet still a youth in his undisciplined impulse. She sat pale as death, unable to move in breathless amazement. He smiled upon her out of the gathering dusk. For some minutes he had been regarding her, and the tumult within him had become riotous with long restraint. He came swiftly forward, and ere she could turn her head, his arms were about her, and his lips upon hers, and she felt herself pinioned in her chair. Nor, for guarding her baby unhurt by his vehemence, could she use her hands to hold him from her. Nor, for the suffocating beating of her heart, could she cry out. Neither would her cry have availed, for there were none near to hear her. Stop, Frale! I am not yours! Stop, Frale! she implored. Yes, you are mine, he said in his low drawl, lifting his head to gaze in her face. You gin me your promise. That doctor man, he done gone and left you all alone, and he ain't never going to come back to these here mountains. She snatched her hands from the child on her knees, and with sudden movement pushed him violently. But he only held her closer, and it was as if she struggled against muscles of iron. No, nah, you don't. I have you now, and I won't never leave you go again. He had not been drinking, yet he was like one drunken, so long had he brooded and waited. Rapidly she tried to think how she might gain control over him. When wakened by the struggle, the babe wailed out, and he started to his feet, his hands clutching into his hair as if he were struck with sudden fear. He had not noticed or given heed to what lay upon her knees, and the cry penetrated his heart like a knife. A child, his child, that doctor's child. He hated the thought of it, and the old impulse to strike down anything or any creature that stood in his way seized him. The impulse that unchecked had made him a murderer. He could kill, kill. Cassandra gathered the little body to her heart, and standing still before him, looked into his eyes. Instinctively, she knew that only calmness and faith in his right action would give her the mastery now, and with a prayer in her heart, she spoke quietly. How come you here, Frale? You wrote mother you'd gone to Texas. His figure relaxed, and his arms drooped, but still he bent forward and gazed eagerly into her eyes. I come back when I heard he were gone. I come back right soon. Kate Irwin's wife writ me at he were gone, and now she done told me he ain't never going to come back to these here mountains. Everybody on the mountains knows that. He just a fool you all that away, making out to marry you while he were in bed, like he couldn't stand on his feet, and then getting up and going off this away, and biding nigh onto a year. We don't allow our women to be done that away like they were poor white trash. I come back for you like I promised, and you done give me your promise, too. I reckon you won't go back on that now. He stepped nearer, and she clasped the babe closer, but did not flinch. Yes, Frale, you promised, and I, I promised to save you from yourself, to be a good man, but you broke yours. 
you didn't repent, and you went on drinking, and then you tried to kill an innocent man when he was alone and unarmed. Like a coward, you shot him. I called back my words from God. I gave them to the man I loved. Promise for promise, Frail. Yes, and curse for curse. You cursed me, Cass. He made one more step forward, but she stood her ground and lifted one hand above her head, the gesture he so well remembered. Keep back, Frail. I did not curse you. I let you go free, and no one followed you. Go back. Farther. Farther. Or I will do it now. Oh, God. He cowered his arm before his eyes, and moved backward. "'Don't, Cass!' he cried. For a moment she stood regally before him, her babe resting easily in the hollow of her arm. Then she slowly lowered her hand, and spoke again in quiet, distinct tones. "'Now for that lie they have told you, I am going to my husband. I start to-morrow. He has sent me money to come to him.' You tell that word all up and down the mountainside, wherever there bides one to hear. She lifted her baby, pressing his little face to her cheek, and turning, walked slowly toward the cabin door. Cass, he called. She paused. Well, Frail? Cass, you have cursed me. No, Frail, it is the curse of Cain that rests on your soul. You brought it on by your own hand. If you live right and repent, Christ will take it off. Will you ask him for me, Cass? I sure have lost you now forever, Cass. Yes, Frail. I'll ask him to cover up all this year out of your life. It has been full of mad badness. Be like you used to be, Frail, and leave off thinking on me this way. It is sin. Go marry somebody who can love you and care for you like you need, and come back here and do for mother like you used to. Giles Teasley can't pasture you. He's half dead with his badness, drinking his own liquor. She came to him, and taking his hand, led him toward the laurel path. Go down to mother now, Frail, and have supper, and sleep in your own bed like no evil had ever come into your heart, she pleaded. The good is in you, Frail. God sees it, and I see it. Heed to me, Frail. Good night. Slowly, with bent head, he walked away. Trembling, Cassandra laid her baby in the cradle Hope Baloo had made her, and kneeling beside the rude little bed, she bowed her head over it and wept scalding bitter tears. She felt herself shamed before the whole mountainside. Oh, why? Why need David have left her so long? So long? The first reproach against him entered her heart, and at the same time she reasoned with herself. He could not help it. Surely he could not. He was good and true, and they should all know it if she had to lie for it. When she had sobbed herself into a measure of calmness, she heard a step cross the cabin floor. Quickly drying her tears, she rose and stood in the doorway of the canvas room, with dilated eyes and indrawn breath, peering into the dusk, barring the way. It was only her mother. "'Why, mother!' she cried, relieved and overjoyed. "'Have you seen Frail?' "'Yes, mother. He was here. Sit down and get your breath. You've climbed too fast.' Her mother dropped into a chair and placed a small bundle on the table at her side. "'What all is this, Frail, say you've told him? Have David writ for you, like Frail say? What all have Frail been up to now? He come down creeping like he a half-dayed man, that soft and quiet. I'm going to David, mother. You know he sent me money to use any way I choose, and I'm going.' She caught her breath and faltered. The mother rose and took her in her arms, and drawing her head down to her wrinkled cheek, patted her softly. There, honey, there. I reckon your old ma knows a heap more than you think. 
You keep mighty still, but you can't fool her. Cassandra drew herself together. Why didn't Martha come up this evening? She were making ready in her trifling slow way, and then Frail come down and said that word, and I knew right quick as there were something behind. His way were that queer. So I told Marthy to set him out a good supper, and I'd stop up here myself this night. She were right glad to do it. Fool she be. I could see how she went plumb silly over Frail all to once. Mother, you know right well what they're saying about David and me. Is it true, that word Frail said, that everyone says he never will come back? The mother was silent. That's all right, mother. We'll pack up tonight, and I'll go down to Farrington tomorrow. Miss Towers will help me to start right. She lighted candles and began to lay out her baby's wardrobe. I haven't anything to put these in, but I can carry everything I need down there in baskets, and she will help me. They've always been that good to me, all my life. Cass, Cass, don't go, wailed her mother. I'm afraid something will happen to you if you go that far away. If you could leave baby with me, Cass, give it up. Be you feared or frail, honey? No, mother. The man doesn't live that I'm afraid of. She paused, holding the candle in her hand, lighting her face that shone whitely out of the darkness. Her eyes glowed, and she held her head high. Then she turned again to her work, gathering her few small treasures and placing them on one of the highest shelves of the chimney cupboard. As she worked, she tried to say comforting things to her mother. I'll write to you every day, like David does me, mother. See, I've kept all his letters. They're in this box. I don't want to burn them because I love them, and I don't want anyone else to read them, and I don't want to carry them with me because I'll have him there. Will you lock them in your box, mother? And if anything happens to me, will you sure, sure burn them? She laid them on the table at her mother's elbow. You promise, mother? Yes, Cass, yes. What's in that bundle, mother? With trembling fingers, the widow opened her parcel and displayed the silver teapot, from which the spout had been melted to be molded into silver bullets. Thar, she said, holding it up by the handle. It's yourn. Farwell. He done that one day whilst I were gone, and the last bullet were the one Frail used when he nigh killed your man. No, I reckon you never did see it before, for I kept it hid good. I knowed there were something to come out and hit one day. It do show your father come from some fine high family somewhere. I didn't show it to Dr. David, for I allowed he might know was it worth anything. But he seemed to set more by them two little books. He has them books yet, I reckon. Yes, he has them. When Frail told me you were going to David, I guessed that there were something that I'd ought to know, and I clumb up here right quick, for if he were a lying, I meant to find out the reason why. She looked keenly in her daughter's face, which remained passive under the scrutiny. Has Frail been a pestering you? He did some at first, but I sent him away. I reckon so. Now hark, you tell me straight. Did David send for ye, or didn't he? In silence, Cassandra turned to her work, until it seemed as if the room were filled with the suspense of the unanswered question. Then she tried evasion. Why do you ask in that way, mother? Because if he sent for you, I'll help you all I can. But if he didn't, I'll hinder ye, and ye'll bide right where ye be. You won't do that, mother. I sure will. If David haven't sent for you, and you go, you'll have to walk over me to get there, hear? The mother's voice was raised to a higher pitch than was her wont and the little silver pot shook in her hand. 
Cassandra took it and regarded it without interest, absorbed in other thoughts. Then throwing off her abstraction, she began questioning her mother about it, and why she had brought it to her now. The widow told all she knew, as she had told David, and pointed out the half-obliterated coat of arms on the side. I have heard your pa say that there were more pieces than this once, but this one comes straight to him from his grandpa, and now it's yourn. If he have sought for you, take it with you. It may be worth more than you think for now. I've been told they do think a heap of family over there, just like we do here in the mountains. Leastways, it's all we do have, some of us. My family were all good stock, capable and pert. And now hark to me, wherever you go, just you hold your hate up. They ain't nothing more despisable than a body that goes meeching round like some old sheep-stealing hound dog. Now, if he sure enough have sent for ye, go and I'll help you. But if ye haven't, bide where ye be. Cassandra drew in her breath sharply, no longer able to evade the question, with her mother's keen eyes searching her face. All her reasons for going flashed through her mind in a moment's space of time. The book she had been reading, what were English people really like? And David, her David, her boy's father, what shameful things were they saying of him all over the mountain that Frale should dare come to her as he had done? She could not stay now. She would not. Her cheeks flamed, and she walked silently into the canvas room and stood by her baby's cradle. Her mother began wrapping up the silver pot. I guess I'll take this back and lock it up again. You sure ain't to go if you can't give me that word. Cassandra went quickly and took it from her mother's hand. No, mother, give it to me. I told Frale David had sent for me, and I'm going. And he has sent for ye? Yes, mother. Her reply was low as she turned again to her work. Well, now, why couldn't you give me that word first off? It's his right to have ye, and, and I'll help you. You ought to go to him, if he can't come to you. Instantly up and alert, putting bravely aside her own feelings at the thought of parting, the mother began helping her daughter. But long after they were finished and settled for the night, she lay wakeful and dreading the coming day. Cassandra slept less, and lay quietly thinking, sorrowful that she must leave her home, and not a little anxious over what might be her future, and what might be her fate in that strange land. When at last she slept, she dreamed of the people she had met in Vanity Fair, with David strangely mixed up among them, and frail, ever alert and watchful, moving wherever she moved, silently lingering near, and never taking his eyes from her face. In the morning, mother and daughter were up betimes, but no word was spoken between them, to betoken hesitation or fear. Cassandra walked, in a sort of dumb wonder at herself, and smoldering deep beneath the surface was a fierce resentment against those who, having known her from childhood, and receiving many favors and kindnesses from her, should now presume to so speak against her husband, as to make Frale dare to approach her as he had. Oh, the burning shame of those kisses! the shame of the thought against David that pervaded her beloved mountains. For the sake of his good name, she would put away her pride and go to him. End of chapter 28《ハッピーバーサムタイムズ》この番組は、ポッドキャストの番組です。ポッドキャストの番組は、ポッドキャストの番組です。ポッドキャストの番組は、ポッドキャストの番組です。ポッドキャストの番組は、ポッドキャストの番組です。ポッドキャストの番組は、ポッドキャストの番組です。
in which Cassandra visits David Thring's ancestors. It was a pleasant morning in London, with as clear a sky as is ever permitted to that great city. Cassandra had placed her little son in the middle of a huge bed, which nearly filled the small room she had been given in a hotel, recommended to her by Betty Towers, as one where nice ladies traveling alone could stop. The child was dressed in a fresh white coat, and Cassandra had much ado to keep him clean. She heaped him about with pillows and bedclothing to make a nest for him, and gave him a spoon and a drinking cup for entertainment, while she arranged her own toilet before a cloudy mirror by a slant ray of daylight that managed to sift through the heavy draperies and lace curtains that obscured the one high, narrow window of her room. She had tried to put them one side that she might look out when she awoke, but she could see only chimney pots and grimy, irregularly tiled roofs. A narrow opening at the top of the window let in a little air. Still she felt smothered, and tried to raise the lower sash, but could not move it. She thought of the books she had read about great cities, and how some people had to live in places like this always, and her heart filled with a large pity for them. Here only a small triangle of blue sky could be seen, not a tree, not a bit of earth, and in the small room all those heavy furnishings closed around her, dark red, stuffy, and greasy with London smoke. She could not touch them without blackening her hands, nor let her baby sit on the floor, for the dirt he wiped up on his clothing as he rolled and kicked about. The room seemed to sway and tip as the ship had done, and there was a continuous sound as of thunder, a strange undercurrent that seemed to her strained nerves like the moaning of the lost souls of all the ages who had lived and toiled and smothered in this monstrous and terrible city. Ah, she must get out of it. She must hurry, hurry and find David. He would be glad to see his little son. He would take him in his arms. He would hold them both to his heart. She would see him smile again and look in his eyes, and all this foreboding would cease, and the woeful sounds die out of the air and become only the natural roar of the activities and traffic of a great city. She must get used to all this, and not expect to find all the world like her own sunny mountains. The bishop's careful little wife had tried to explain to her how to meet her new experiences. She was to go nowhere alone without taking a cab, and never start out on foot, carrying her baby in her arms as she might do at home. She had given her written instructions how to conduct herself under all ordinary circumstances, at her hotel or on the street, how to ring for a servant, order her meals, or call a cab. Now, standing before her mirror, Cassandra essayed to arrange her hair as she had seen other young women wear theirs, but she thought the new way looked untidy, and she took it all down and rearranged it as she was used to wearing it. David would not mind if she did not do her hair as others did. He would be so glad to see her and his little son. Ah, oh, the comfort of his little son! She leaned over the bed, half-dressed as she was, and murmured pretty cooing phrases, kissing and cuddling him to contented laughter. Betty Towers had procured clothing for her, a modest supply, using her own good taste, and not disguising Cassandra's natural grace and dignity by a too close adherence to the prevailing mode. There were a blue traveling gown and jacket, and a toque of the same color with a white wing, a soft clinging black silk, made with girlish simplicity which admirably became her, and a wide, flexible, brimmed hat, with a single heavy plume taken from Betty's own hat of the last winter. Cassandra stood a long moment before the two gowns. She desired to don the silk, but Betty had told her always to wear the blue in the morning, so at last she obeyed her kind adviser. While waiting with her baby in her arms for the hotel boy to call her cab, she observed another lady, young and graceful, enter a cab, and a maid following her wearing a pretty cap and carrying a child. Eager for David's sake to draw no adverse comment upon herself, she took note of everything. Ought she then to arrive attended by a maid, carrying her baby? But David would know she did not need one. Bringing him his little son in her own arms, what would he care for anything more? So the address was given the cabman, and they were rattled away over the rough, 
paving along a lonely ride through the wonderful city, so many miles of houses and splendid buildings of gardens and monuments. Strangely, the people of Vanity Fair leapt out of the book she had read and walked the streets or dashed by her in cabs all but in modern dress. The soldiers, the guardsmen, the livery lackeys, the errand boys, all were there, and the ladies in fine carriages. There were the nursemaids, the babies, the beggars, the ragged urchins, and the vendors of the street, with their raucous cries rending the air. Her brain whirled, and a new feeling to which she had hitherto been blessedly a stranger crept over her, a feeling of fear. As the great two-story coaches and trams thundered by, she clasped her baby closer until he looked up in her face with round-eyed wonder and put up his lip in pitiful protest. She soothed and comforted him until her panic passed, and when, at last, they stopped before a great house built in on either side by other houses, with wide steps of stone descending directly upon the street, she had re regained a measure of composure. She was assured by the cabman, leaning respectfully down to her with his cab in his hand, that this was the house, ma'am, and should he wait. "'Oh, yes, wait!' cried Cassandra. "'What if David were not there? And of course he might be out. Then they were swallowed up in the dark interior. She was admitted to a hall that seemed to her empty and vast by a little old man in livery. For a moment, bewildered, she could hardly understand what he was saying to her. "'Her ladyship's at her country home, and the house closed.' Although dazed and baffled, Cassandra betrayed no sign of the tumult within, and the little old man stood before her, hesitating. His curiosity peaked into a determination to discover her business and identity. Her gravity and silence gave her a poise and dignity that allayed suspicion. But he and his old wife liked diversion, and a spice of gossip lightened the monotony of their lives. So he waited, then coughed behind his hand. <coughs> "'Yes, sir, uh, ladyship, and Lady Laura are at their country home now, ma'am. "'Maybe you can come to see the house, ma'am.' "'No, it was not the house. It was—' "'Again she waited, not knowing how to introduce her husband's name. "'A mystery. A visitor at this hour, and seemingly a lady, "'yet with a baby in her arms and alone, and not to see the house. "'Again he coughed behind his hand.' Uh, many do come to see the house, ma'am, with a permit from his lordship, ma'am. He's not here now, but strangers are always welcome to the gallery, ma'am. Yes, I I'm a stranger. She caught at the word, seized by an inward terror of the small eyes fixed curiously on her. She intuitively shrank from betraying her identity, and the old servant had told her what she needed to know. Of course her husband was his lordship over here. I'm from America, and I would like to see the gallery. She must do so to give a pretext for having come to visit an empty house. David must not be compromised, be for the old servant, but a great lump filled her throat, and tears were burning unshed beneath her eyes. For all of the warm August sun shining without, a chill struck to her bones as they passed through the vast closed rooms. She held her now sleeping baby close to her breast as she followed the old man about from picture to picture. Yes, um, many do come here, especially artists, to see this gallery. They say as how his lordship wouldn't take a thousand pounds for this one, ma'am. We'll let in a little more light. A Van Dyke, and worth its weight in gold. Cassandra watched him cross the floor. His short bow legs reflected grotesquely in its shining surface as he walked, then turned and gazed again at the life-size, half-length portrait of a young man with sunny hair like David's and warm brown eyes. There, you see, it's more than a Van Dyke to the family, ma'am, for it's a ancestor, and my wife says it's like, it's as like as two peas to his young lordship, who has just come into the title, ma'am. And that's strange, isn't it? For I'm to look so like, being as he belonged to the younger branch, who haven't held the title for four generations. But come to dress him in velvet and gold lace and the likeness would be nice perfect as if he had stood for it.
Cassandra glazed so long silently at this picture that again the little man coughed, his deprecatory cough and essayed to lead her on. But she was seeing visions that did not heed him. When at last she turned, her gray eyes had deepened, and a clearly defined spot of delicate red burned on one pale cheek. She drew a deep breath and looked down the length of the long gallery. Everything was being oppressed upon her mind as upon sensitized paper. She followed slowly in the old man's wake, never opening her lips until they had made the circuit and were again standing before the portrait of the fair-haired youth. Then, roused suddenly by a direct question, she responded. The old servant was saying, "'You haven't happened to meet a Samuel Cutter in America, have you? He's our son. England was too slow for him. Young men aren't like old ones. They want adventure, and they get it. That's how so many of them joins the army and gets killed like his lordship's two sons and young Lord Dring's brother, as would have been his lordship if he had lived. You haven't happened to know Samuel Cutter over there. He went to Canada. And no, I never met anyone by that name. I lived a long way from Canada. About how far do you think, ma'am? Cassandra had no idea of the distance, but she knew how long David and Hoyle were journeying there, so she answered as best she could. It takes three or four days to get there from my home. The old man's eyes opened wide, and his jaw dropped. It's a big country, America is. England may be a small place, but she has tremendous big possessions. He felt it all belonged to England, and spoke with swelling pride as his short legs carried him toward the door. There again he paused. He had learned nothing of this young woman to tell his old wife, except that she came from America and had never met Samuel Cutter. The mystery was still unsolved. Yes, his young lordship do look amazing like that picture. If you'd ever seen him, you'd think he'd dressed up in velvet and lace and stood for it. He's lived in America five years, but if you never were in Canada and never met our Sammy, it's more likely you never saw him either. Is he at their country home also? Cassandra asked. She had seated herself in the hall, for her heart throbbed chokingly, and the lump was heavy in her throat. It was as she had dreamed sometimes, when her feet seemed to cling to the earth and would not lift her weight up some steep hill. His lordship is still in Africa, ma'am. He have been a great traveller, but he can't stay much longer now for Lady Laura is to have a grand coming out, and his lordship is to be married. Her lordship's heart the set on it, and on is marrying I, too. That's gossip, you know. Cassandra rose and stood suddenly poised for flight. She must get out of that house and hear no more. She had a silver shilling in her hand, for Betty Towers had told her all servants expected a tip, and this was intended for the cabman. Had she followed her impulse, she would have darted by with her fingers in her ears, but instead she dropped the shilling in the old man's hand and quietly turned toward the door. Thank you. His fingers closed over the shilling. Her pallor struck him then, even as the red spot on her cheek deepened, and he held out his arms for the child. Let me carry him for you, ma'am. Is it a boy? But her arms closed tighter about her baby. He is my little son. It was almost a cry she said it, but again she forced herself to calmness, and walking slowly out, added with a quiet smile, I always keep him myself. We do in America. In a moment she was gone. The warm sunlight burst in on them and flooded the cold hall as the old man stood in the doorway, looking after the retreating cab and down at the silver shilling. Darker, dingier, stuffier seemed the box of a room as she walked into it and laid her still sleeping babe on the bed. She felt herself moving in an unreal world. David, her David! She had not come to him after all. She had come to an empty place. She knelt and threw her arms about her little son, encircling his head and his feet. She neither wept nor prayed, and the red spot burned against the creamy whiteness of her skin. She was not thinking, only looking, seeing into the past and down the long vista of her future. Pictures came to her, pictures of her girlhood, her dim aspirations, her melancholy-eyed father, 
his hilltop, and beloved sunlit mountains. In the radiance of the spring she saw them, and in the glory of the autumn. She breathed the fragrance of the pines in winter, and heard the soft patter of summer rains on wide-spreading leaves. She saw David walking at her side, and heard his laugh, sun-bright and glorious he seemed, her Phoebus Apollo, the father of her little son. She saw the terrible sea which she had crossed to come to him, the white-crested waves with turquoise lights and indigo depths shifting and sliding unceasingly where all the world seemed swallowed in space, and the huge steamship so small a thing in the vast and perilous deep. And now, now she was here. What was she? What was life? She had tried to find him, her David, and had been shown the dead and the glory of the dead, all past and gone, her David's glory, shown that long, empty gallery resounding with those aged footsteps, and the pictures, pictures, pictures of men and women who had once been babes like her little son and David's, now dead and gone, not one soul among them all to greet her. Proud lords and dames in frames of gold, young men and maidens in costly silks and velvets of marvelous dyes, red-cheeked, red-lipped, and soullessly silent, and she, alone and undefended in their midst, holding in her arms their last descendant. All those painted fingers seemed lifted to point at her, those silent red lips parted to cry out at her, Look at this stranger claiming to be one of us! Send her away! And David, her David, was one of these. What they had felt, what they had thought and striven for, was it all intensified and concentrated in him? Oh, if her soul could only reach to him wherever he was and penetrate this impalpable veil that stretched between them. If her hands could only touch him, her eyes look into his and see what lay in their depths for her. Then her babe stirred and tossed up his pretty hands, waking her from her sad, vision-seeing trance. He opened his large, clear eyes, and suddenly it seemed that her wish was granted, that the veil was rent, and she was looking into David's eyes and seeing his soul free, no longer chained by invisible links to those dead and gone beings, and their traditions. This had been all a dream, a dream. She gathered the child in her arms, and held him with his sweet, warm lips pressed to her breast, and his soft little hand thrust in her bosom. David's little son! David's little son! Surely all was good and well with the world. Did not the old man say it was only gossip? Had not evil things been said of David even on her own mountain? It was the trail of the serpent of ill report. He had not confided his sacred secret to these people, and they had thought what they pleased. Surely he had told his mother about his wife. She would go to his mother and wait for her's return, and there she would bring her precious gift, David's little son. Quickly she packed her few belongings and rang for a messenger, and as she stood an instant waiting for an answer to her ring, the white-capped nurse she had noticed in the morning passed by with the baby in her arms. Yes, surely women of David's state did not travel about alone. Had she not read in Vanity Fair how Becky Sharp always had her maid? And now she was in Vanity Fair, and must be wise and not go to David's mother unattended. Then, too, if only she had someone with her to whom she could speak now and then, it would be better. Therefore, without further consideration, she walked swiftly down the corridor after the tidy nurse. "'Will you tell me, please, have you a sister?' she said. The young woman stood still in astonishment. "'Or any friend like yourself? I, I'm a stranger from America.' The look of surprise changed to one of curiosity. "'And it is right hard to go about alone with my baby, so I thought I would ask you if you have a sister.' "'Is it to the country you wish to go, ma'am?' The baby in her arms stirred, and the nurse swayed gently back and forth to hush it. Yes. I couldn't go with you myself, ma'am, but— Oh, no, I didn't mean you. I only thought if you had a sister, or a friend, maybe, who could help me for a little while. I saw you this morning, ma'am, as you went out. I'll see what I can do. What number is your room, and what name? 
I mustn't talk here. Mrs. Darling is very particular. Oh, never mind, then. Cassandra turned away in sudden shame lest she had not done the right thing. The nurse watched her return to her room as swiftly as she had left it, and took note of the number. How very old, said the young woman to herself. Cassandra felt more abashed under the round-eyed gaze of the maid than if she had encountered the queen. Her ring for a messenger had not been answered, and she did not know how to find her husband's country seat. She felt faint and weary, but did not think of hunger, nor that it was long past the dinner hour, and that she had eaten nothing since her early breakfast. She only thought that she must be brave and try, try to think how to reach David's people. Resolutely she closed her door and dressed her baby carefully. Then she arrayed herself in the soft silk gown and the wide hat with heavy plume. And then could David have seen her with her courageous eyes and lifted head and the faint color from excitement in her cheeks, he would no longer have feared take her by the hand and lead her to his mother and say, She is my wife and the loveliest lady in the land. People looked at her as she passed and turned to look again. Down wide carpeted stairs she went until she came to a broad landing with recessed windows where there were round polished tables and people seated, sipping tea and eating thin bread and butter and muffins. Then Cassandra knew that she was hungry and sat herself in one of the windows apart before a table. Presently a young man came and bent down to her as if listening. She looked up at him in bewilderment, but at the same instant, seeing another young man similarly dressed bearing a tray of muffins and tea to a lady and gentleman nearby, she said, I would like tea, please. What kind, ma'am? She did not care what kind, nor know what to ask, only to have something soon, so she said, I will take what they have. Yes, ma'am. Muffins, ma'am? Yes. She replied wearily and turned to gaze out the window. Cabs and carriages were rushing up and down the street below them. She placed her little son on the seat beside her and held him with sheltering arm while he watched the moving vehicles and looked from them to his mother's face. "'What a perfectly lovely child!' said a pleasant voice. "'Is it a boy? How old is he?' Cassandra looked up to see a rosy-cheeked girl, a little too stout and florid, with a great mop of dark hair tied with a wide black ribbon. A gray-haired lady followed and paused beside her. Yes, said Cassandra faintly, he's almost six months old. The girl reached over and patted his cheek. How perfectly dear! See him, Mama, isn't he, though? Babies are always dear, said the mother, with a smile. Come, Laura, we can't wait, you know. And they passed on. As Cassandra looked up in the mother's face, something stirred vaguely in her heart. Had she seen her before? Possibly so many had paused to speak to her in this casual way since she left home. Then her tea and crisp, hot muffins were brought. The young girl's pleasant words had warmed her heart, and the refreshment gave her more courage. She made her way to the office and inquired how she might find Lord Thring's country home. The clerk wrote the address promptly on a card, but the keen look of interest with which he handed it to her caused her to shrink inwardly. Why, what was it to him what place she asked for? She lifted her head proudly. She must not falter. I wish to go there. Will you tell me how, please? But the surprise of the clerk was quite natural, as she had signed the hotel register the evening before with her whole name, giving no thought to it. And now he wondered what relation she might be to the family so lately come into the title, since she bore the name, yet seemed to know so little about them. He explained to her courteously, almost differentially. "'Will you go to Daneshead Castle itself, ma'am, or stop in Queensderry?' As she had no idea what the question involved, she replied at hazard, "'I will stop in Queensderry.' And her bags were brought down and she was dispatched to the right station without more delay. End of chapter 29 Recording by Natalie Myers
Chapter Thirty of the Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Myers. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter Thirty, in which Cassandra goes to Queensderry and takes a drive in a pony carriage. Glad to be borne away from the city and out through fresh green fields and past pretty church-spired villages, alone in the compartment, Cassandra comforted herself with her baby, playing with him until he dropped to sleep, when she made a bed for him on the car seat with rugs, and taking out her purse, began to count her remaining resources. Her bill at the hotel had appalled her, so much to pay to stay only a night. What would David say? But he had told her to use the money as she liked, and now she was here. There was nothing else to do. Laboriously she computed the amount in English money, and, reckoned thus, her dollars and cents seemed to shrink and vanish. Still, more than half remained of what she had brought with her, and she viewed the matter calmly. The shadows fell long over the smooth greensward as she arrived in the village of Queensdury, and was driven to a small inn, the only house of entertainment in the place. She was given a pleasant room overlooking fields and orchards and bright gardens, and the sight rested her eyes, and still further calmed her troubled heart. She would rest tonight, and tomorrow all would be well. Never had food tasted better to her than the supper served in her pretty room, toast in a silver rack, and fresh butter, such as David loved, and curds and whey, and gingerbread, and a small jar of marmalade. She ate seated in the window, looking out over the sweet English landscape in the warm twilight, the breeze stirring the white curtains, her little son in her lap gurgling and smiling up at her, and her heart with David, wherever he might be. Slowly the dusk veiled all, and one star glimmered above the slender church spire. A pretty maid brought candles and a book in which she was asked to write her name. She was the landlady's daughter, and looked wholesome and bright. Cassandra glanced in her face as she set the candles down and took up the pen mechanically. "'Mother says, will you sign here, please?' "'Yes.' Cassandra turned the leaves slowly, and read other names and addresses, many of them. She wrote, Cassandra Merlin, and paused, then making a long dash, added simply, America, and handing back the book and pen, turned again to the window. Thank you. Is that toll? said the maid, lingering. Yes, said Cassandra again. Then she laid her baby on the bed and began taking his night-clothing from her bag. "'How pretty he is! Shan't I help you unpack, ma'am?' Cassandra paused, looking dreamily before her as if scarcely comprehending. Then she said, "'Not tonight, thank you. Perhaps tomorrow.' The maid deftly piled the supper dishes, and taking them and the book with her, departed with a pleasant, "'Good night, ma'am.' In spite of her calmness, Cassandra lay wakeful and patient, and when at last she did sleep, it seemed to her she stood with her husband on her father's path, looking out under overarching boughs, upon blue distances of heaped-up mountain tops, and David's flute notes, silvery sweet, were raining down upon her. She woke to discover day was breaking, and a pealing of bells from some distant church tower was announcing the fact. She gathered her babe to her throbbing heart and thought, today she was to go out and meet her husband's people. How should she go? How should she conduct herself? Should she go at once, or wait until the afternoon? Why had she not written her name fully in the traveler's book? What mysterious foreboding had caught her fingers and stayed them at her maiden name? Was she afraid? When she arose, she found herself trembling from head to foot, and called for her breakfast before bathing and dressing her little son. The same pretty maid brought it, and came again, while Cassandra bathed and nursed her baby to set the room to rights. "'Shan't I unpack your box for you now, ma'am?' 
and without waiting for a reply, she took out Cassandra's clothing, pausing now and then to admire and pet the lovely boy. Her simple friendliness pleased Cassandra, who was minded to ask some of the questions which were burdening her. "'When do people make visits here? In the morning or afternoon?' "'That depends, ma'am.' "'How do you mean? I'm a stranger in England, you know.' "'Yes, ma'am. If they make polite visits, they go about tea-time, ma'am. But if it's parish visits, or on business, or on people they know very well, they may go in the morning, ma'am.' "'And when is tea-time here?' "'Why, ma'am, everybody has their tea in the afternoon, along four or thereabouts, and sees their friends. "'Can I get a carriage here, do you know?' "'I can get a pony carriage, ma'am. We hires it when we needs it. "'Only we must speak for it early, or it may be taken. "'Oh, then will you please speak for it soon? I would like to have it.' "'Yes, ma'am. Will you drive yourself, ma'am, or shall I ask for a boy?' "'Oh, I don't know. I can drive, but they are gentle ponies, ma'am. Any one can drive them.' "'Yes, but I don't know the way. Yes, ma'am, where would you like to go, ma'am?' "'To Daneshead Castle.' The bright-cheeked maid opened her round eyes wider and looked at Cassandra with new interest. "'But, ma'am, that is quite far, though the ponies are smart, too. How far is it?' "'It's quite a bit away from here, ma'am. "'You'd have to start at two or thereabouts. "'I could take you myself, if mother would let me, "'and tell you all the interesting places, but—' "'The girl looked at her shrewdly, a quickly withdrawn glance. "'That depends on how well acquainted you are there, ma'am. "'Maybe you'd like better to have a man drive "'and just let me go along to mind the baby for you?' "'Yes, I would,' said Cassandra gladly. "'Thank you. I'll run for the ponies now, ma'am.' Cassandra heard her boots clatter rapidly down the wooden stairs at the back of the house, and presently saw her dashing across the inn yard, bareheaded and with her bare arms rolled in her apron. The girl's manner of receiving the statement that she wished to drive to the castle was not lost on Cassandra's sensitive spirit. She sat a moment, thoughtful and sad, then rose and set herself to prepare carefully for the visit. In the afternoon, then she might wear the silk gown and lovely hat. Once more she tried to arrange her hair as she saw other young women wear theirs, and again swept its heavy masses back loosely from her brow and coiled it low as her custom was. The landlady's daughter chattered happily as they drove. She held the baby on her knee, and he played with the blue bead she wore about her neck, while Cassandra sat with hands dropped passively in her lap, her body leaning a little forward, straight and poised, as if to move more rapidly along, her red lips parted as if listening and waiting, and her eyes courteously turning toward the places and objects pointed out to her, yet neither seeing nor hearing, except vaguely. Presently becoming aware that the chatter was about the family at Daneshead Castle, her interest suddenly awoke. About the old lord, how vast his possessions, how ancient the family, how neglected the castle had been ever since Lady Thring's death. Everything allowed to run down, even though they were so vastly rich. How different everything was now the parsimonious old lord was dead, and the new lord had come in, and there were once more ladies in the family. What a time since there had been a Lady Thring at Daneshead! How much Lady Laura was like her cousin Leon! How reckless she would be if her mother did not hold her with a firm hand! And so the chatter ran on. The girl enjoyed the distinction of knowing all about the great family, and enlightening this stranger from America, whose silent attention and occasional monosyllabic replies were sufficient to inspire her friendly efforts to entertain. Moreover, her curiosity concerning Cassandra and her errand, where she was evidently neither expected nor known, was piqued and lively, and she threw out many tentative remarks to probe, if possible, the stranger lady's thoughts. "'Have you ever seen Lord Thring? The new lord, I mean, ma'am?' "'Yes,' said Cassandra, simply, a chill striking to her heart to hear him mentioned thus. "'He's been out here directing the repairs himself "'and getting the place ready for his mother and Lady Laura, "'but I never saw him. 
They say he's perfectly stunning. Quite the lord. Is he so very handsome, do you think? Yes. Cassandra looked away from the girl's searching eyes. They say he never has married, and that is fortunate too, for he has lived so long in America, and never expecting to come into the title, he might have married somebody his own set over here never could have received, and that would have been bad, wouldn't it? Cassandra turned and looked gravely at the girl. She wished to stop her, but could not think how to do it. She could not bear to hear her husband talked over in this way. They are tremendous swells. Lady Thring looks high for him, and well she may, for mother says he's worthy of a princess. He's that rich and high-bred, too, for all that he was only a doctor over in America. Mother says it's very fortunate he never married some common sort over there. They say Lady Thring wants him to marry Lady Geraldine Temple's daughter. She is a great beauty and has a pretty fortune in her own right, too. They'll be rich enough to entertain the king, and they may do it too some day. Cassandra sat still and cold. She could not stop the girl now. Lady Laura's coming out is to be next week, so his lordship must be home soon. They say it will be a very grand affair, and I am to see it all, for mother says she will have a maid, and I may go out there to serve, and I shall see all the decorations and the fine dresses. That will be fine, won't it, baby? She untied the blue beads and dangled them before the baby's eyes, and he caught at them and gurgled in baby glee. Cassandra sat silent, rigid and cold, unheeding the child or the girl, only vaguely hearing the chatter. And that will be grand, won't it, baby? But he is a love, this boy. There is Daneshead Castle now, ma'am. You see it, through the trees? But the grounds are so large we have to drive a good bit before we are there. The driver turned the ponies' heads, and they scampered through a high stone gateway and along a smooth road which wound through a dense wood with green open spaces interspersed where deer were browsing. All was very beautiful and quiet and sweet, but Cassandra, sitting with wide open eyes, gravely beautiful, did not see it. To the girl, everything was delightful. She had not the slightest doubt that the American lady was very rich, that she traveled so simply and alone was nothing. They all did queer things, the Americans. She was obtusely unconscious that she had been speaking slightingly of them to one of themselves, and she talked on after the romantic manner of girls the world over, giving the gossip of the inn parlors as she listened to it evening after evening, where the affairs of the nobility were freely discussed and enlarged and commented upon with eager interest. What was spoken in her ladyship's chamber and Lady Laura's boudoir, their half-formed plans and aspirations, carelessly dropped words and unfinished sentences, quickly traveled to the housekeeper's parlor, to the servant's table, to the haunts of grooms and stable boys, to the farmer's daughters, and to the public rooms of the Queensdury Inn. Thus it was Cassandra heard tales of the brother and sister and mother of her David, and of him also. How it was said that once he was engaged to a rich tradesman's daughter, but had broken it off and gone to America against the wishes of all his family, and had become a common practitioner there to the disgust of all his relatives. And again Cassandra felt that she had left a sweet and lovely world behind her to step into Vanity Fair. She tried to hold fast her faith in goodness and high purpose. She was sure, sure David had been moved by noble motives. Why should she not trust him now? Did this girl know him better than she, his wife? Yet, in spite of her valiant spirit, two facts fell like leaden weights upon her heart. David had not told his people that he had a wife, and they would be offended that he had tied himself to a common sort over there. This David, whom she loved, was so high above her in the eyes of all his relatives and perhaps even in his own. What, oh, what could she do? Might she still hold him in her heart? She could not walk in upon them now and betray him. Never, never. Her lips grew pale, and her head swam, but she sat still, leaning a little forward in the moving phaeton, 
her hands tightly clasped in her lap, and her babe unheeded at her side, until the red returned to her lips, and again burned in a clearly defined spot against the pallor of her cheek. She did not know that a strange, unearthly beauty was hers. A carriage met them, filled with gay people. She did not notice them, but they gazed at her, and turned to look again as they passed. "'I say, you know,' said one of the men, as they whirled by. "'There, that was Lady Geraldine Temple in that carriage, "'and the young man who stared so hard is her son. "'They've been paying a visit, or maybe they've brought Lady Clara to stay a bit. "'They say both families are keen for the match. "'And why shouldn't they be? "'Oh, they'll entertain the king here some day, "'and then there'll be high times at Daneshead.' "'An automobile flashed by them, and then another. "'There must be a party here today.' Or likely it's visitors dropping in now it's getting towards tea time. It's all right, Mum, she added, as Cassandra stirred uneasily. It must be only visitors, or I would have heard of it. They're keeping open house now, though they don't go anywhere themselves yet. You see, it's a year since the deaths, so they could mourn them all at once, and not spin it too long. They had to wait a year before Lady Laura's coming out rightly. Let the ponies walk now, driver. I beg pardon, Mum. The girl had so taken possession of Cassandra, the baby, and the whole expedition that she gave the order unthinkingly. "'Yes, let them walk,' said Cassandra, and drew a long breath. She heard gay laughter, and caught sight through the trees of light dresses and wide plumed hats. Someone sat on the terrace at a table, wherein was shining silver. "'There, I said so! That's Lady Clara pouring tea!' I say, but she's a beauty, isn't she? No, no, go to the front, driver. American ladies don't call it the side. There's an automobile there, ma'am. Then wait a moment. Don't be a stupid. Thus aided by the innkeeper's clever daughter, Cassandra at last made her entrance properly and was guided to the presence of David's mother, who had not joined her guests, having but just closed an interview with Mr. Stretton. "'as she saw Cassandra standing in the drawing-room waiting her. "'Lady Thring came graciously forward. "'The lovely August weather had tempted everyone out of doors, "'and the great room was left empty, save for these two, "'David's mother and his wife. "'The beauty of otherworldliness which had infused Cassandra's whole being "'as she fought her silent battle during the long drive still enveloped her. If she could have followed her impulses, she would have held out both hands and cried, Take me and love me. I'm David's wife. But she would not. She must not. Her heritage of faith in goodness, both of God and man, kept her heart open and gave her power to think and act rightly in this her hour of terrible trial. Even as a little child, being behind the veil which separates the soul from God, may, in its innocent prattle, utter words of superhuman wisdom. "'I am sorry if I have interrupted you when you have company,' she said slowly. "'I am a stranger, an American.' "'Ah, you Americans are a happy lot, and may go where you please. Take this seat by the window. It is very warm. My son has been in America, but he tells us so little. We are none the wiser for that. About your part of the world.' I knew him in America. That is why I called. Yes, the mother bent forward and regarded her curiously, attentively. He lived very near us. He did a great deal of good among the poor. She put her hand to her slender white throat, then dropped it again in her lap. Then, looking in Lady Thring's eyes, she said, I have seen your picture. I should have known you from that, but you are more beautiful. "'Oh, that can hardly be, my dear. "'It was taken many years ago, you know.' "'Yes, he said so, his lordship. "'Only there we called him Dr. Thring.' "'A shadow flitted over the mother's face. "'He was a practitioner over there, never in England.' "'That is a pity. "'It is such noble work, "'but perhaps he has other things to do here. "'He has even more noble work than the practice of medicine.' "'What does he do here?' asked Cassandra, in a low voice. 
he must take part in the affairs of government very ordinary men may study and practice medicine but unless men who are wise and are nobly born and bred make it their business to care for the affairs of their country the nation would soon be wrecked that is what saves england and makes her great i see cassandra sat silent then and lady thring waited expectantly for her errand to be declared curious about this beautiful young creature who had stepped into her home unannounced from out of the unknown yet graciously kindly and unhurried i think i know with us men are too careless they think it isn't necessary i suppose again she paused with parted lips as if she would speak on but could not with you men are too busy making money i'm told it is necessary to have a leisure class like ours oh cassandra caught her breath and smiled she was thinking of the silver pot her mother had enjoined her to take with her and why but we do think a great deal of family even the simplest of us care for that although we have no leisure class only the loafers i'm afraid you think it very strange i should come to you in this way but i i thought i would like to see dr thring again and when i heard he was not in england i thought i would come to you and bring the messages from those who loved him when he was with us but i mustn't stop now and take your time i'll write them instead only that wouldn't be like seeing him he stayed a whole year at our place and you come from canada oh no a long way from there my home is in north carolina oh indeed how very interesting that must have been when he was so ill then noticing cassandra's extreme pallor she begged her most kindly to come out on the terrace and have tea but she would not she felt her fortitude giving way and knew she must hasten but you must you know the heat and your long ride have made you faint i i'm afraid so it won't last wait then you must take a little wine you need it roused to sympathy lady thring left her a moment and returned immediately with a glass of wine which she held to her lips with her own hand there you will soon be better here is a fan it really is very warm indeed you must have tea before you go she took her passive hand and led her out on the terrace unresisting and again cassandra was minded to throw her arms about the lovely woman's neck who was so sweet and kind and sob on her bosom and tell her all but david had his own reasons and she would not do you stay long in england i am going to-morrow oh she exclaimed as they stepped out and she saw the number of elaborately dressed guests moving about and gaily chatting and laughing i can't go out there i'm a stranger it was a low melancholy wail as she said it and long afterward lady thring remembered that moaning cry i'm a stranger no no you are an american and very beautiful one come they will be glad to meet you give me your name again thank you but i must must go back suddenly with a cry my baby he is mine she swept forward with long swinging steps toward a group who were bending over a rosy-cheeked girl who was seated on the steps of the terrace with a child in her arms she was comforting him and cuddling and petting him and those around her were exclaiming as young girls will isn't he a dear oh let me hold him a moment there he's going to cry again no wonder poor little chap oh look at his curls so cunning give him to me seeing his mother he put up his arms to her and smiled while two tears rolled down his round baby cheeks i found him in the pony carriage with hetty giles and he was crying so and such a darling i just took him away the love cried laura why we saw you yesterday at the victoria i could not pass him by you remember the baby one beaming smile nestled his face bashfully in his mother's neck and patted her cheek glancing sidewise at his admirers through brimming tears while cassandra her eyes large and pathetic turned now on laura now on her mother stood silent quivering like one of her own mountain creatures brought to bay 
but she was strengthened as she felt her baby again in her arms, and as she stood thus looking about her, every one became silent, and she was constrained to speak. She did not know that something in her manner and appearance had commanded silence, something tragic, despairing. It was but for an instant, then, she turned to Lady Laura. "'Thank you for comforting him. I ought not to have left him. I never did before with strangers.' She tried to bid Lady Thryng good-bye, but Laura again besought her to stop and have tea. "'Please do. I fairly adore Americans. I want to talk to you. I mean, to hear you talk.' Cassandra had mastered herself at last, and replied quietly, "'I, I don't guess I can stay. Thank you. You have been so kind.' Then she said to Lady Thryng, "'Good-bye,' and moved away. Laura walked by her side to the carriage. "'I hope you'll come again some time and let me know you. "'You are right kind to say that. I shall never forget.' Then, leaning down from the carriage seat and looking steadily in Laura's warm, dark eyes, she added, "'No, I shall never forget. May I kiss you?' "'You sweet thing!' said the girl, impulsively, and reaching up, they kissed. Cassandra said in her heart, For David, and was driven away. Laura found her mother standing where they had left her. She had been deeply stirred by the sight of Cassandra with the child in her arms. Not that beautiful mothers and lovely children were rare in England, but that except for the children of the poor, no little one like this had been in her own home, or so near her in all the years of her widowhood. It was the sight of that strong mother love, overpowering and sweeping all before it, recognizing no lesser call, the secret and holy power that lies in the Christ mother, for all periods and all peoples. She herself had felt it, and the cry that had burst from Cassandra's lips, My baby, he is mine! Tears stood in Lady Thring's eyes and yet it was such a simple little thing. Mothers and babies, why, they were everywhere. She moved like a tragic queen, said Lady Clara. What was the matter? Nothing, only her baby had been crying. But wasn't he a love, said Lady Laura. I say, he was a perfect dear, said one and another. I don't care much for babies, said Lady Clara. They ought to be trained to stay with their nurses and not cry after their mamas like that. Fancy having to take such a child around with one everywhere, even in making a formal call, you know. Isn't it absurd? American women spoil their children dreadfully, I have heard. End of chapter 30 Read and recorded by Natalie Myers. Chapter 31 of The Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Myers The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine Chapter 31 In Which David and His Mother Do Not Agree The day after Cassandra's flight from Queensdury, David returned. Although greatly prolonged, his African expedition had been successful, and he was pleased. He had improved his opportunities to learn political conditions and know what might best advance England's power in that remote portion of her possessions. Mr. Stretton had informed him that he might soon be called to a seat in the house, and he was glad to be in a measure prepared to hold opinions of his own on a few, at least, of the vital issues. Canada he already knew well, and to be conversant also with the state of affairs in South Africa gave him greater confidence. The first afternoon of his return he spent in looking over the changes which had been in progress at Dainsett during his absence. In spite of his weariness, he seemed buoyant and gay, more so, his mother thought, than at any time since his return from America. She said nothing about the episode of Cassandra's call. Possibly for the time it was forgotten, 
but as they parted for the night, when they were alone together, Lady Thring again broached to her son the subject of his marriage. "'We have had a visit from Lady Clara Temple,' she said. David lay upon a divan with his hands clasped beneath his head, and the light from a reading lamp streamed upon his sunny hair, which always looked as if some playful breeze had just lifted it. His whole frame had the sinewy appearance of energy and power. His mother's heart swelled with love and pride as she looked at his smiling, thoughtful face, and down upon his lean, strong body, that in its lassitude expressed the vigor of a splendid animal at rest. Still, more would she have given thanks for the restoration of this beloved son could she have been able to contrast his present state with his condition when, ill and discouraged, he had gone to the lonely log cabin in a wilderness, struggling to build up both body and spirit, far from the sympathy and fellowship of his own. Now she thrilled with the thought of what he might achieve if only he would, but her heart misgave her that he still held some strange notions of life. She thought the surest way to control his quixotic impulses was to provide him with a good, practical wife, one who would see the world as it is, and accept conditions that are stable, not trying to move mountains, yet with sufficient ambition for both her husband and herself. With a wife and children, a man could not afford to be erratic. What were you saying, mother? What were you thinking, David, that you did not hear me? I'm telling you, we have just had a very delightful visit from Lady Clara Temple, and Lady Temple and her son have called. David made no reply. He seemed to think the remark called for none. Well, David? Well, mother? And then, I think I will go to bed. I'm really tired, and bed is a place for me. He kissed his mother, then took hold of her chin and lifted her face to look in his eyes. "'What is it, little mother? What is it?' he asked gaily and obtusely. "'Aren't you a bit stupid, David, not to see? "'I wish, I do wish you could care for Lady Clara. "'She really is charming.' "'I do care for her, as Lady Clara Temple. "'She is charming, and, as you say of me, a bit stupid. "'What has Laura been doing these two months?' "'Preparing for her coming out after her own fashion.' We've been a good deal in town, but she has a reckless way of doing anything she pleases, quite regardless. She is a big-hearted fine lass, mother. Don't let her ways trouble you. She needs the right influence, and Lady Clara seems to exert it over her. At least I think she will in time. Ah, uh, very good, let her. I won't interfere. Good night, little mother. Sleep well. If I am late in the morning, don't be annoyed. I've had three wakeful nights. The sea was very rough. David! Lady Thring placed her hands on his shoulders and held him looking in his eyes. Mary Lady Clara, you are worthy of a princess, my son. You can afford to be ambitious. The day may come when you can entertain the king. Now really, mother, I'll entertain the king with pleasure. He's a fine old chap. A little gay, you know, but quite the right sort. But Lady Clara is a step too high. She'd rub it into me some day that I'd married above my station, you know. Good night. Dream of the king, mother, but not of Lady Clara. He sought his bed and was soon soundly sleeping, content with the thought that next week he would sail for America and have Laura's coming out postponed. The family festivity was following too closely on the year of mourning, at any rate. The announcement that he had already had a penniless American wife would naturally be a blow to them, all the more so if his mother was seriously cherishing such hopes as she had expressed. But he couldn't be a cad. His conscience smote him that his conduct already bordered closely on the caddish, but to be an out-and-out -out cad, no, no. When he awoke, late, as he had said, but refreshed and jubilant, the revelation he must make seemed to him less formidable, and he was minded to make it with no more delay as he tossed over his mail while breakfasting in his room. Ah, what is this? A letter in his wife's hand, bearing the Liverpool postmark. Was she on her way to him then? Good God! He tore off the cover hastily, but sat a moment with bowed head, his hand over his eyes before reading it. My dear David, my husband, forgive me. 
I've done wrong, but I meant to do right. They said words of you on our mountain, David, words I hated, and I lied to them and came to you. I told them you had sent for me. I did it to prove to them that what they were saying was not true. I took the money you gave me and came to England, and now God has punished me, and I'm going back. I know you will be surprised when I tell you how wrong I've been. I would not write to you I had borne you a little son, because I did not want you to come back to America for his sake, but for mine. My heart was that proud. Oh, David, forgive me. David's face grew pale, and the paper trembled in his hand, but he read eagerly on. My heart cries to you all the time. He is yours, David. Forgive me. He is very beautiful. He is like you. Your sister held him in her arms, and I kissed her for the love of you, but she did not know why. She did not guess the beautiful baby was yours, your very own. Your mother saw him, but she did not guess he was hers, her little grandson. I took him away quickly. They might have kept him if they knew. You will let me have him a little longer, won't you, David? When he is older, you will have him to take him home and educate him. But now, now, he is all I have of you. Soon the terrible ocean will be between us again. It will be just the same in your home now as if I had never come. I did not say I was your wife, for you had not, and I would not tell them. I want you to know this, so nothing will be changed by me. In London, before I knew, when I thought you were there, when I did not understand, I wrote my name in the hotel book, but in Queensderry something in my heart stopped me, and I only wrote my old name, Cassandra Merlin. I must have been beginning to understand. David paused and dashed the tears from his eyes. Poor little heart, poor little heart, he cried. He paced the room, then tried to read again. The letters, blurred by his tears, seemed to dance about and run together. Now I see it all clearly, David, and after a little God will help me to live on the happiness you brought me in our sweet year together. There was happiness for a lifetime in that year. Comfort your heart with that thought when you think of me, and do not be too sad. Oh, David, I did not know that to save me from marrying frail and living a life worse than death you sacrificed yourself. But you did not need to do it. After knowing you, and after doing what he did to you, I never could have married him. I only know you came to me and saved me from the terrible life I might have led, and I took you as from God. I have seen the beautiful lady you should have married, but I don't know what to do, nor how to give you back to yourself. I suppose there may be a way, but we have made our vows to each other before God, and we must do no sin. My heart is heavy. I would give you all. All, but I can't take back the love I gave you. I could die to set you free again, for in that way I could keep the blessed love which is part of my soul in heaven with me, only for our little son. My life is his now, too, and I have no right to die, not yet, even to set you free. Oh, David, David, this must be the shadow I saw clouding our long path of light. In some terrible way it has been laid on me to do you a wrong in the eyes of your family and all your world. Your mother told me you had work to do for your country, great and glorious work. I believe it, and you must do it and not let an ignorant mountain girl stand in your way. Oh, I can't think it out tonight. When I try to see a way, I can't. The visions are lost to my eyes and they may never come again. The windows of my soul are clouded and the clearest seeing is gone because, David, I know it is myself that comes between. I can only cry to you now to forgive me. Don't let me mar your great good life. Don't try to come back to me. Stay and live your life and do your work, and I will keep your little son safe for you and teach him to love you and call you father, and he shall be called David. He has no name yet. I was waiting for you. It will only be a little while before he will need you. Then you may take him. Your mother and sister will love him. He will be a great boy full of laughter and light like you, David. And then your mountain girl wife will be gone, and your sacrifice at an end, and your reward will come at last. I will go back and stay quietly where I belong. Don't send me any money. I have enough to take me home, and I can earn all we need after that. Earning will help me give by giving me something to do for our baby, and so for you. 
Sometimes I will send you word that all is well with him, but do not write to me any more. It will be easier for you so, and don't let your heart be too much troubled for me, David. It will interfere with your power and usefulness in your own world. Grieving is like fire set to a great tree. It burns the heart out of it first and leaves the rest. A man must not be like that. With a woman it is different. Be glad that you did save me and brought me all these months of sweet, sweet happiness. I will live on the remembrance. People have to bear the separation of death, and we will call the ocean that divides us death, for our two worlds are divided by it. I sail tomorrow. You took me into your heart to save me, and now, David, my love, I go out of your heart to save you and give you back to your own life. Some day the cords that bind us to each other, the cords our vows have made, will part and set you free. Goodbye, goodbye, David, my heart, David, my love, David, David, goodbye. Cassandra Merlin For a long instant, David sat with the letter crushed in his hand, then suddenly awoke to energetic action. Today? When does the boat leave? Good God, there may be time! He rang for a servant and began tossing his clothes together. Curses on me for a cad, a bore, a lout. Why did I leave my mail until this morning and then oversleep? Clark, he said as the man appeared, tell Hicks to bring the machine around immediately, then come for my bag. Beg pardon, but the machine's out of order, my lord, and a lady ship's just going out in the carriage. Why is it out of order? Hicks is a fool. Ask Lady Drink to wait. No, Pack my bag and send my boxes on after me as they are. I'll speak to her myself. He threw off his jacket, thrust his cap in his pocket, and dashed away, pulling on his coat as he went, holding the crushed pages of the letter in his hand. He overtook his mother as she was walking down the terrace. Mother, wait, he cried. I'm going with you. Where's Laura? She was coming. I can't think what is delaying her. David hurried on to the carriage. Get in, mother. I'll take her place. Get in, get in. We must be off. David, are you out of your head? Yes, mother. Drive on, drive on. I must catch the first train for Liverpool. I may catch it. Put the horses through, John. Make them sweat, he said, leaning out of the carriage window. Explain yourself, David. Are you in trouble? Yes, mother. Wait a little. She looked at her son and saw his mouth set his eyes stern and anguished, and she placed her hand gently on his as they were being whirled away. Your bags are not seen, David, if you are going a journey. Clark will follow with them, and I can wait in Liverpool if I can only catch this boat. David, explain. If you can't, then let me read this, she pleaded, touching the letter in his hand, but he clutched it the tighter. No one may read this, not even you. He pressed the crumpled sheets to his lips, then folded them carefully away. It's just that I've been a cad, a fiendish cad, and an idiot in one. I thought myself a man of high ideals. My God, I'm a cad. David, you sacrificed yourself to ideals. But you are still a boy and have much to learn. When men try to set new laws for themselves and get out of the ordinary, they are more than apt to make fools of themselves and may do positive harm. What is it now? Can't you get over the ground any faster, John? He cried, thrusting his head again out of the window. These horses are overfed and lazy like all the English people. Why was the machine out of order? Hicks is a fool, I say. He put his hand inside his collar and pulled and worked it loose. We are all hidebound here. Even our clothes choke us. David, tell me the truth. I am telling you the truth. I am a cad, I say. And you, you too are a part of the system that makes cads of us all. I am your mother, David, said Lady Thring reprovingly. You have reason to be proud of your son. Oh, curse me. I won't be more of a cad than I am now by laying the blame on you. I could have helped it, but you couldn't. We are born and bred that way over here. The petty lines of distinction our ancestors drew for us... We bow down and worship them, and say God drew them. Over here a man hides the sun with his own hand and then cries out, Where is it? I would comfort you if I could, but this sounds very much like ranting. I thought you had outlived that sort of thing, my son. Thank God, no. I've been very hard-pressed of late, but I've not outlived it. 
You will tell me this trouble now before you leave me. You must, dear boy. He took the hand she put out to him and held it in silence. Then, incoherently in a voice humbled and low, almost lost in the rumbling of the carriage, he told her. It was a revelation of the soul, and as the mother listened, she too suffered and wept, but did not relent. Cassandra's cry, I am a stranger, sounded in her ears. But her sorrow was for her son. Yes, she was a stranger, and had wisely taken herself back to her own place. What else could she do? Was it not in the nature of a providence that David had been delayed until after her departure? The duty now devolved upon herself to comfort him without further reproof, but nevertheless to make him see and do his duty in the position he had been called to fill. Of course she has charm, David, and evidently good sense as well. How do you mean? To perceive the inevitable and return without fuss or complaint to her own station in life. For an instant he sat stunned, and ere he could give utterance to his rage, she resumed. Naturally, marriage now in your own class can't be. You'll simply have to live as a bachelor, David groaned. Why, my son, many do have their own choice, and you have managed to be happy during this year. He glanced at his watch. Eleven o'clock. Cat, there's no use urging the horses so. We can't make it. We may, mother, we may. He half rose, as if he would leap from the vehicle. I could go fast on foot. There's a quarter of an hour yet before the Liverpool Express. John, can't we get on faster than this? No, my lord, one of the horses has picked up a stone. If you'll hold him, I'll dig it out. Naff a minute, my lord. David sprang out and took the reins. Where's the footman? he asked testily. You left him behind, my lord. He was up in Lady Laura, cut roses. David, this is useless. The last train from London went through an hour ago, and we haven't ten minutes for the next. Order him to return, and we'll consider calmly. David laughed bitterly, and only sprang into the coach and shut the door with a crash. Drive on, John, he shouted through the window, and again they were off at a mad gallop. His mother turned and looked at him, astounded. Let me read what she has written you, my son, she implored, half frightened at his frenzy. It's of no use for you to read it. We can't talk now, not rationally. Then tell him not to drive so furiously so we can hear each other. I would avoid useless discussion, mother, but you force it. An instant he paused, and his teeth ground together and his jaw set rigidly. Then he continued with a savage force that appalled her, throwing out short sentences like daggers. Lord H. brings home an American wife. His family are well pleased. She is everywhere received. Her father is a rich brewer. Her brother has turned out his millions from business of pork packing. The stench from his establishment pollutes miles of country but does not reach England. Why? because of the disinfected process of transmuting their greasy American dollars into golden English sovereigns. There's justice. Be reasonable, David. Their estates were involved to the last degree, and those sovereigns saved the family. Without them, they would have passed out of their possession utterly, and been divided among our rich tradespeople, and the family would have descended rapidly to the undergrades. It goes to show the value of birth, what is more, and how those Americans, who made a pretense long ago of scorning birth and title and casting it all off, are glad enough now to buy their way back again, if not for themselves, for their children. But, David, for a man to voluntarily degrade his family by marrying beneath him, with no such need as that of Lord H., of ultimately, by that very means, lifting it up is, is inexpressible. Why, in the case of Lord H., there was a certain nobility in marrying beneath him. Beneath him? For me, I married above me, over all of us, when I took my sweet, clean mountain girl. The nobility of Lord H. is unique. Lady H. made a poor bargain when she left the mingled stenches of brewing and butchering to step into the moral stench which depleted the Stonebreck estates. You are not like my son, David. You are violent. Your son must be a cad. 
Now he is a man and must either be violent or weep. He looked away from her out at the flying hedgerows, then took up the fruitless discussion again, striving with more patience to arouse in his mother a sense of the utter worldliness of her stand. She met him at every point with the obtuse and age-long arguments of her class. When at last he cried out, But what of my son, mother, my little son, and the heir to all this grandeur which means so much to you? Her eyelids quivered, and she looked down, merely saying, his mother has offered you a solution to that difficulty which seems to me the only wise one. You say she proposes to keep him a year or two and then send him to us. Ah, you are like steel, mother, David spoke pleadingly. You thought him a beautiful child? I did, and a wholesome one which goes to show that you may safely trust him with her for a time. Moreover, his mother has a right to him and the comfort she may find in him for a few years. You see, I would be quite just to her. I do not accuse her of being designing in marrying you. No doubt it was quite your own fault. It is a position you two young people rushed into romantically and most foolishly, and you must both suffer the consequences. It is sad, but it must be regarded in the light of hard common sense, and my ungrateful task seems to be to place it in that light for both your sakes. Still, David watched the hedgerows with averted face. You are listening, David. Yes, mother, yes. Common sense, you said. Can't you see that to bring her here, where she does not belong, where she never will be received as belonging, even though she is your wife, will only cause suffering to you both? Eventually misunderstandings will arise. Then will come alienation and unhappiness. Then again, yours must be in a measure of a public life, unless you mean to shirk responsibility. Has your country no claim on you? I have no thought of shirking my duty, and am prepared to think and act. Also, you wish it to be effective? Has it ever occurred to you how your avenues will be cut off if you marry a wife beneath your class? What in God's name will my wife have to do with England's African policy? Damn, David! Mother, I beg your pardon. She may have everything to do with it. No man can stand alone and voiced his ideas upon such a body of men without backing. Instead of hampering yourself with an ignorant mountain girl from America, you should have allied yourself to a strong family of position here, if you would be a power in England. What sort of a lady thring will your present wife make? What kind of a leader socially in your own class? You might better try to place a girl from the bogs of Ireland at the head of your table." Again, David's rage surged through him in a hot wave, but he controlled himself. You admitted Cassandra has both beauty and charm? Would my son have been attracted to her else? Nevertheless, what I say stands. As a help to you, you have done your duty, mother. I will say this for you, that for sophistry undiluted, a woman of the present day who stands where you do can out-Greek the ancients. How is it we see so indifferently? Is it that I am like my father? How did he see things? Your father was as much a nobleman as your uncle. Only by the accident of birth was he differently placed. Did I never tell you that but for his death he would have been created bishop of his diocese? So you see, I see, by dying he just escaped a bishopric. Did it make a difference in his reception up above, do you think? Oh, David, David! I'm sorry, mother. Never mind. We're nearly there, and I have something I must say to you before I leave you to end this discussion forever. There are two kinds of men in this world. One sort is made by his circumstances, and the other makes his circumstances. You would respect your son more if he belonged to the first variety, but I tell you no. I will make my own conditions. Before all else, I am a man. My lordship was thrust upon me. Don't interrupt. I beg. I know all you would say, but you do not know all I would say. My birth gave it to me, certainly, but a cruel and bloody war was the means by which it came to me. Very well. 
I will take it, and the responsibility which it entails, but the cruelty that brought me my title is ended, and in no form shall it be continued, social or otherwise. I hold to the rights of my manhood. I will bring to England whom I please as my wife, and my world shall recognize her, and you will receive her, because I bring her, and because she will stand head and soul above any one you have here to propose for me. Here we are, mother dear. One kiss... Thank you, thank you. Postpone Laura's coming out until I return, which will be when you know. He leapt from the carriage before it had time to halt and ran, but alas, baffled and enraged at his ill success, he stood on the platform and watched the train pull out. It was only a slow local puffing away there. Liverpool Express left five minutes ago, my lord, said the guard. His mother leaned out, watching him with sad yet eager eyes. Satisfied that it should be so, he might return now, and there was by no means an end to her opposition. End of chapter 31 Recording by Natalie Myers Chapter 32 of The Mountain Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Natalie Myers. The Mountain Girl by Payne Erskine. Chapter 32 in which Cassandra brings the heir of Daneshead Castle back to her hilltop, and the shadow lifts. "'Cassandra, Merlin, where did you drop from?' cried the widow Farwell, as she looked up from the supper she was preparing at the great fireplace, and saw her daughter in the doorway with her baby. Her old face radiated light and warmth and love as she took them both in her arms. "'Where's David?' Cassandra smiled wearily, returning her mother's kiss and yielding her the baby. "'You'll have to be satisfied with me and little son, mother. David was still in Africa, so I came home again.' She spoke as if a trip to England were a casual little matter, and this is all the explanation she gave that night. "'I got the hotel carriage to bring me up from the station.' The mother, with quaint simplicity, accepted it, asking no troublesome questions. If David was not there, why should not her daughter return? After their supper together, in the warm, starlit evening, each member of the family carrying something for the traveler's comfort, they all climbed up to Cassandra's cabin, and the old life began, as if it had suffered no interruption. Cassandra so filled the pauses with questions of all that had happened during her absence that it was only after her mother was in bed and dropping off to sleep she remembered questions of her own that had been unasked or left unanswered. The next day Cassandra pleaded weariness and stayed in her cabin, sending Martha down for her necessary supplies and quietly occupying herself with setting her simple home in its accustomed order. The day after she spent overlooking the little farm with Cotton and hearing from him all about the animals, the cows, two little calves, Frail's colt, and her own filly, and how some old hound dog had got into the sheep hen and killed the mother sheep, and Marthy had brought the twin lambs up by hand, and while Cassandra busied herself thus, the widow kept charge of the little grandson, warming her heart with his baby ways, petting him and solacing herself for his long absence. Thus the first days were lived through, and no further explanation made, for something held Cassandra silent in a strange waiting suspense. It was not hope, for she felt that she had taken a stand which was conclusive, and there was nothing more for which to hope. What else could she do, and what could David do? The conditions were made for them, each must bide in his own world, and she had named the ocean which divided them death. At night she did not weep, for weeping made her ill, and she must conserve her strength for her little son, so she lay staring out at the stars. Sometimes she found herself holding her breath and listening, half lifting her head from her pillow, 
But listening for what? Then she would lean over her baby's cradle and hear his soft breathing, trying to make herself think she was listening for that and not for David's step. Then she would lie back and try again to sleep, and her heart would cry to God to give her peace and let her rest. So the long nights passed, tearlessly and sleeplessly. On the boat she had slept, lulled by its rocking and swaying, but here in her home, in her accustomed routine, sleep had fled, and old thoughts and dreams came like the dead to haunt her. The paleness which had come upon her in London, and which the sea breeze had supplanted with fleeting roses returned, and she moved about looking as if only her wrath had come back to its old haunts. On the third day after Cassandra's return, David found himself climbing the laurel path a far different man from the one who, two years before, had slowly and wearily toiled up to the little house of logs which was to be his shelter. With strong, free step and heart uplifted and glad, he now climbed that winding path. He had conquered the ills of his body, and his spirit had lived and loved, and he had learned to know happiness from its counterfeit. He had gone out and seen men chasing phantoms and shadows, thinking therein to find joy, joy the need of the world, one in a coronet, one in a crown, and the beggar in a golden sovereign, while he, he had found it in his own heart and in Cassandra's eyes. David had passed the fall place, seeing no one, for the widow had ridden over to spend the day with Sally Carew. Her niece was in the spring house skimming cream, while Cotton was dawdling in the corn patch, whistling and pulling the ripened ears from the stalks. A cool breeze had dispelled the heat of the September afternoon, and the hills were already beginning to don their gorgeous apparel after the summer's drought. Their wonderful beauty struck him anew, and steeped his senses with their charm. If only all was well with his wife, his wife and his little son! His heart beat so madly as he neared the thicket of laurel where once he had stood to watch her moving about his cabin that he was forced to pause, and again he saw her, standing in her homespun dress, strongly relieved against the whiteness of the canvas room beyond, but this time not alone, ah, not alone, holding his little son in her arms, her body swaying with rhythmic motion, lulling him to drowsiness and sleep, she stooped to lay him in the rude little cradle box. David trembled as he watched and dashed the tears from his eyes, but could not move to break too soon this breathless, poignant spell of gladness. Suddenly he could wait no longer, but his feet clung to the earth when he would move, and his mouth went dry. Ah, could he never reach her? He stood, holding out his arms, when, oh, wonder of wonders, she raised herself and stood as if listening, then, moving swiftly, walked from the cabin and came to him as if she had heard him call. Although he had made no sound, her arms outstretched to him, as were his to her. She did not cry out but with parted lips and radiant glowing face, fled to him and was clasped to his heart. She could feel its beating against her breast, and his silence spoke to her through his eyes, which saw not her face, but her soul. His lips brought the roses to her cheeks, as the sea breezes had done, roses that came and fled and came again, until at last it was Cassandra who spoke first. I want you to see him, David. Yes. Yes, my wife, was all he said, his eyes on hers, but he did not move. I want you to see our little son, David. A strange pang shot through his heart. Still he stood, holding her and marveling at himself. What was it that this young usurper had stolen into his place? Love is selfish, dear. Let me recover from one joy before you overwhelm me with another. First... I must have my own, and know that it is all mine. I don't understand, David. I can't wait. Oh, David, David. You turn my name to music with your tones lingering over it. I had forgotten how sweet it was. But I don't understand, David. Come and see him. And as she drew him forward, they moved as one being, not two. No, you don't understand, thank God. But I will teach you something you never knew. Love is not only blind, dearest. He is a greedy, selfish little god. 
Then she laughed happily, holding him at arm's length and looking in his eyes. I know it. I know it. I found it out all by myself. Didn't I tell you in my letter? Oh, David, so was I. She drew him to her again and nestled her face in his bosom. I was jealous of our little son. I wanted you, David. Oh, I wanted you. At last came the tears, the blessed human tears which she had held back so long. But now they did no harm except to drench her husband's gray tie, and they brought a lovely flush to her face. I can't stop, David. I can't stop. I haven't cried for so long, and now I can't stop. Sweetheart, don't try to stop. Cry it all out. Wash the stains from me of the cruel old world where I have been. Cleanse me so that I may see as clearly as you see. But you would have to cry forever to do that, wouldn't you, sweet? And soon you must laugh again. He clasped and comforted her, as she was used to comforting her baby, soothing her and drying her eyes with his own handkerchief. Yours isn't large enough for such a flood, is it, sweet? No, I, I, and I, I can't, can't find mine, she sobbed. I, I left it tucked under my baby's chin, and now I've spoiled your pretty great tie. Bless you, they are my tears, and it is my tie. David, he is crying. Hark, helping his mother, is he? Come then. His father will comfort him. Hear him. Isn't it a sweet little cry, David? She smiled at him from under tear-wet lashes. Why, bless you again, yours was a sweet little cry. They went in, and he bent over the odd little cradle and lifted the child tenderly from its soft nest. The wailing ceased, and the father had awoken him and laughed with joy as he held the warm little body to his heart, where now he knew lay the key of life, the complete and rounded love, God's gift to man, to be cherished when found, and fought for, and held in the holy of holies of his own soul. He isn't afraid. You see, David, how he stares at you. Does he feel it in his own little heart that you are his father? I have whispered it to him a thousand, thousand times. Sit here with him, David, and I'll make you some tea. She busied herself with the tea things, the old life beginning anew, with a new interest. I always make it just as you taught me that first day when I came up here so choked with trouble I couldn't speak. You always brought me good, David. He saw as he watched her that some new and subtle charm had been added to her personality. Was it motherhood that had given it to her, or the long year of patient waiting and trusting, or had she passed through depths of which he as yet knew nothing to cause this evanescent breath of pathos? He felt and knew it was all of these. What must she have endured as she wrote that letter? David fell easily and happily into his life on the mountain again. Not the English lord, but the vital human being, the man in splendid possession of himself and his impulses, holding sacred his rights as a man, not to be coerced by custom or bound by any chains save those he himself had forged to bind his heart before God. For a time he would not allow himself to think of the future, preferring to live thus with the world completely shut away. Buoyantly, jubilantly, he tramped the hills and visited the homes where he had been wont to bring help and often comforts, and found himself therein lauded and idolized, as few of his station ever are. Again he was Dr. Thrang, and the love that accompanied the title in the hearts of those mountain people was regal. He enjoyed his little farm, and the gathering of his first crap, counting his bundles of fodder and his bushels of corn. Sometimes he rode with Cassandra, visiting the old haunts. At such times David insisted that the boy be left with the grandmother, or that Martha should come up to mind him, that he might have his wife free and quite to himself as in their first days. But all this time, although silent about it, Cassandra kept in her heart the thought of David's real state. She felt he was playing a part to bring her joy and was grateful, 
but she knew he must return to his own world and live his own life. Therefore she existed in a state of breathless suspense, to enjoy these moments to the fullest, not to miss or mar an instant of the blessed time while it lasted. The days were flying, flying so rapidly she dared not think, and here was splendid October trailing her wonderful draperies over the hills like a lavish princess. When would David speak? But perhaps he was waiting for her to speak first? If so, how long ought she to remain silent? Often he caught the wistful look in her eyes, and half divined the meaning. One day, when they had wandered up her father's path, and the wind came in warm, soft gusts sweeping over the miles of splendor from the sea, David drew her to him, determined to win from her a full expression. "'What is it, Cassandra? Open your heart. Don't shut anything away from me. What have you been dreaming lately?' "'You have never said a word of fault with me yet, David, for what I did, "'going away off there and not waiting quietly until you could come back, as you wrote me to do. "'That was the bravest, finest thing you ever did but one.' "'He was thinking of her renunciation. "'You are so good to forgive me, David. "'In one way it was better that I went, "'because it made me understand, as I never could have done otherwise. "'You would never have told me, but now I know.' unfold a little of this wisdom so i may judge of its value can you david i'm afraid not you have a way of bewildering me so i can't see the rights and wrongs of things myself but there it is just part of the difference why even the nursemaids over there and hetty giles the landlady's daughter are wiser than i i came to see at every instant the difference between you and me between our two worlds "'David, how did you ever dare marry me?' "'He only laughed happily and kissed her. "'Tell it all,' he said tenderly. "'I felt it first when I went to the townhouse. "'It was hard to find the address. "'I only had Mr. Stretton's.' "'David set his teeth grimly in anger at himself "'at giving her only his lawyer's address "'in stupid fear lest her letters betray him to his mother and sister. "'Now do not hide one thing from me.' "'Not one,' he said sternly, and she continued, with the conscientious fear of disobedience to open her heart. "'I saw by the look in the old man's eyes that I had not done the right thing, coming in that way with the baby in my arms like a beggar. I saw he was very curious, and I was that proud I didn't know what to tell him I'd come for when I found you were not there. So when he said artists often come to see the gallery, I said I'd come to see the gallery. And David, I didn't even know what a gallery was. I thought it was a high piazza around a house, and I found it was a great room full of pictures. I was that ignorant. I felt like I was some wild creature that had got lost in that splendid palace and didn't know where to run to get away. And they all fixed their eyes on me, as if they were saying, How does she dare come here? She isn't one of us. And one was a boy who looked like you. The old man kept saying how like it was to the new Lord Thring, and it made me cold to hear it. So cold that after I'd escaped from there and was out in the sun, my teeth chattered. David sat silent and humbled. At last he said, Go on, Cassandra. Don't cover up anything. When I got back to the hotel, everything seemed so splendid and stuffy and horrid, and every way I turned it seemed as if those dead ancestors of yours were there staring at me still. And I thought, what right had they over the living that they dare stand between you and me? And I was angry. She stirred in his arms and pressed closer to him. David, forgive me. I can't tell it over. It hurts me. Go on, he said hoarsely. The old man told me what was expected of you because of them, how your mother wished you to marry a great lady, and I knew they could never have heard of me, and I forgot to eat my dinner and stayed in my room and fought and fought with myself. I'm sorry I felt that way, David. Don't mind. I understand now. She put up her hand and touched his cheek, and he took it in his and kissed it. Then she laughed, a sad little laugh. Remember that funny little old silver teapot? Mother brought it to me before I left, and I took it with me. 
She is so proud of our family, although she has only that poor little pot to show for it, with its nose all melted off to make silver bullets sure to kill. Did you know it was one of those bullets Frail tried to kill you with? Oh, David, David! And yet your mother's right, dear. That little wrecked bit of silver helps to interpret you, indicates your ancestors, how you came to be you, just as you are. How could I ever have loved you if you had been different from what you are? For a long moment she lay still, scarcely breathing. Then she lifted her head and looked in his eyes. One of her silences was on her, and while her lips trembled as if to speak, she said no word. He tried to draw her to him again, but she held him off. Then tell me what it is, he said gently. But she only shook her head and rose to walk away from him. He did not try to call her back to him, respecting her silence, and she moved on up the path with long, swift steps. When she returned, he held out his arms to her, but she stood before him, looking down into his eyes. I couldn't tell you sitting there with your arms around me, David, and what I have to say must be said now. I may never be strong enough to say it another time, and it must be said. Then she told him all that had occurred while she was in Queensbury, from the moment she came, going down into her heart and revealing the hidden thoughts never before expressed even to herself while he gazed back into her eyes, fascinated by her spiritual beauty which was her power. She told of the chatter of Hetty Giles and how she had pointed out the beautiful lady his mother wished him to marry and how slowly everything had dawned upon her the real differences of the guests she had seen on the Dainsted Terrace, and how they wore such lovely dresses and moved so easily and laughed and talked all at once as if they were used to it all, and perhaps wore such charming things for every day, the wonderful colors and wide, beautiful hats with plumes, and how even the servants wore pretty clothes and went about it as if they all knew how to do things, passing cups and plates. Then she told of her talk with his mother, and how carefully she had guarded her tongue, lest a word escape her, he would rather not have had her speak. I had wronged you in not telling you you had a son, and I meant to leave him with your mother so he could be raised right. She paused, and put her hand to her throat, then went bravely on. Your mother was kind. She gave me wine. She brought it to me herself. I knew what I ought to do, but I wasn't strong enough. It seemed as if something here, in my breast, was bleeding, and my baby would die if I did it. When I came out, he was in your sister's arms and had been crying, and it seemed as if all I had planned had happened, and I took him and carried him away quickly. I couldn't go fast enough, and I left the inn that night. The world seemed all like Vanity Fair. David rose and stood before her, looking down into her eyes. He could not control his voice in speaking, and she felt his hands quiver as they rested on her shoulders. "'When did you read that book, Cassandra? Where did you find it?' he asked in dismay. "'Among your books, in the cabin. I felt at first that it must be a kind of disgrace to be a lord, as if everyone who had a title or education must be mean and low, and all the rest of the world over there must be fools. But because of you, David, I knew better than to believe that. Your mother is not like those women, either. She was kind and beautiful, and I loved her. But all the more I saw the difference. But now you have come to me and made me strong. I can do it. Everything has grown clear to me again, and I see how you gave yourself to me, to save me, when you did not dream of what was to be for you in the future. And out of your giving has come the little son, and he is yours. Wait, don't take me in your arms. She placed her hands on his breast and held him from her. So it was just now, when you spoke as if people would understand me better because of that little silver pot, showing I had somewhere in the past a name and a family like theirs over there, I thought of Vanity Fair, and I hated it. I wish you had never seen it. There is, nor has been, nothing on earth to make me possible for you. Now your inheritance has come to you. I have a pride too, David, a different kind of pride from theirs. You loved me first, I know, as I was, 
just me. It was a foolish love for you to have, David, dear, but I know it is true. You could not have given yourself to save me else, and I like to keep that thought of you in my heart, big and noble and true, that you did love just me. She faltered, but still held him from her. Do you think I would not do all I can to keep from spoiling your life over there? Stop, stop. It is enough, he cried in spite of himself. He took her hands in his and drew her to him in penitent tenderness. I'm no great lord with wide distances between me and your mountain world here, Cassandra. Never think it. I'm tremendously near to the soul of things, and the man of the wilderness is strong in me. One thing you have not touched upon. Tell me, what did Frail say or do to you so trouble you and send you off? She stirred in his arms and waited, then murmured, He pestered me. Explain. Did he come often? Oh, no. He, uh, he came one evening up to our cabin and I sent him off and started next day. But explain, dearest. How did he act? What was it? She was silent, but drew her husband's head down and hid her face in his neck. There, never mind, love. You needn't tell me if you don't wish. He kissed me and held me in his arms like they were iron bands, and I hated it. He said you had gone away, never to come back, and that the whole mountainside knew it, and that he had a right to come and claim my promise to him. Oh, David, David, this is the last. I've kept nothing back from you now, nothing. My heart cried out for you, like I heard you call, and I went to to prove to them all that word was a lie. I knew nothing they said here could touch you, but I couldn't bear that the meanest hound living should dare think wrong of you. Seems like I would have done it if I had to crawl on my knees and swim the ocean. My fingers tingle to grasp the throat of that young man. I fought him for you once, and if it hadn't been for a rolling stone under my foot, it would have been death for one of us. As it was, I won, with you to save me. Bless you. But now, David— Ah, but now what? Are you happy? That isn't what I mean. You have your future. I have my now. It is all we ever have. The past is gone and lives only in our memories, and the future exists only in anticipation. But now, now is all we have or can have. Live in it and love in it and be happy. But we must be wise. We've got to face it sometime. Let me help you now while I have the strength, she pleaded earnestly. But David only laughed out joyously and looked at his wife until she turned her face away from him. Look at me, he cried. Dear troubled eyes, tears, tears in them. Love, you have kept nothing back this time, and now it is my turn. But I shall keep something back from you. I'm not going to reprove your idolatry by turning iconoclast and throwing your miserable old idol down from his pedestal all at once. I tell you what it is, though. If I could feel that I was worthy of your smallest finger, that I deserved only one of those big tears. There, 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 listen, dearest. I'll come to the point. Who is it now making so much of the estimates of the world? Somehow our viewpoints have got mixed. Sacrifice myself? Why, Cassandra, if I were to lose you out of my life, I should be a broken-hearted man. What did I sacrifice? Phantoms, vanities, emptiness. Oh, Cassandra, Cassandra, my priestess of all that is good, open your eyes, love, and see as I see, as you have taught me to see. Much that we strive for and reckon is gain is really worthless. Why, sweet, I would far, far rather have you at your loom for the mother of my son than Lady Clara at her piano. Your heritage of the great nature, the far-seeing, the trusting spirit, harboring no evil, and construing all things to righteousness, 
going out into the world and finding among all the dust and dross even of centuries only the pure gold the eye that sees into a man's soul searching out the true and lovely qualities there and transmuting all the rest into pure metal my own soul's alchemist your heritage is the secret of power don't believe i understand all you are saying david i only see that i have a very hard task before me and now i know it is hard for you too your mother made it clear to me that your true place is not living here as a doctor even though you do so much good among us i saw all at once that men are born each to fill a place in the world and i think each man's measure should be the height of his own power and ability nothing lower than that and i see it your power will be there not here where it must be limited by our limits and ignorance that is your own country over there it claims you and i i there is the difference you know think of your mother and then of mine david i must not oh david you must be unhampered free what can i what can we do we can just go down the mountain sane beings to our own little cabin belonging to each other first of all he took her hand and led her along the path carpeted with pine needles and fallen leaves and then when you are ready and willing not before love we will go home to my home just like this together she caught her breath listen for i am seeing visions too now as you have taught me i will lead you through those halls and show you to all those dead ancestors and i will dress you in a silken gown the color of the evening star we used to watch together from our cabin door and around your neck i will hang the yellow pearls that have been worn by all those great ladies who stared at you from out their frames of gold the day you came alone and unrecognized bearing your priceless gift in your arms you shall wear the rich old lace of the family on your bosom and the jeweled coronet on your head and no one will see the silk and the jewels and the lace for looking at you and at the gift you bring no don't speak it is my turn now to see the pictures all will be yours whatever you see and touch in those stately homes for you will be the lady thring and being the lady thring you will be no more wonderful or beautiful than you were when you climbed to me following my flute notes or when you bent between me and the fire preparing my supper or when you were weaving at your loom or when you came to me from our cabin door with your arms outstretched in the light of all the stars of heaven in your eyes then they were silent a long silence until seated together in their cabin before a bright log fire as she held their baby to her breast Cassandra broke the stillness. Now I see it better, David. As you came here and lived my life and loved me just as I was, so to be truly one, I must go with you and live your life. I must not fail you there. You have been tried as by fire and have not failed, nor are you the kind of woman who ever fails. Then she smiled up at him one of those rare and fleeting smiles that always touched david with poignant pleasure and said i think i understand now god meant us to feel this way when he married us to each other end of chapter thirty two and the conclusion of the mountain girl by Payne erskine recorded by natalie myers